हेलो गुड मॉर्निंग हेलो शुभंकर या गुड मॉर्निंग कोकी गुड मॉर्निंग सो गुड आफ्टरनून फॉर अस गुड आफ्टरनून फॉर यू सॉरी हाउ आर यू गुड या फाइन थैंक यू ओके गुड या 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 टू स्टार्ट जस्ट लेट मी सो योर माइक्रोफोन एंड वीडियो आर वर्किंग फाइन लेट मी जस्ट टेस्ट टाकेसी टाकेसी कुड यू कम इन प्लीज हेलो कैन यू हियर मी यस How are you? Yeah, fine. How are you? Oh, uh, fine. Thank you. Finally, this is the third one, and we are meeting online. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, it's working. Uh, let me check with our nicer director, uh, Professor Panda. Could you kindly come in? Hello, I'm here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. So it's working. Um, so mohan ji is not here let me call him he said he will join in time um pushpendra could you please make uh, professor uh, director nice uh, professor takesh seki and professor koki takane as yes, co host and you can make me as host Just please give me one second.
Hello. This is a desktop. So. So uh, I have just uh, muted everyone uh, and when the Tom comes, I will request uh, because sometimes people just accidentally switch on the uh, microphone. So um, I will request and then that time you can unmute. Uh, so I think it's uh, 10 o'clock. Uh, we can start now. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, um, or yeah, good evening, good not. Uh, Maybe some people from US are there. So um, good, good evening, wherever you are. It's uh, really my great pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, third series of Indo-Japan WhatsApp. Um, uh, so uh, the first one was held in 2015, I think January, in the NICER Transit Campus in the Institute of Physics Campus in Bhubaneswar, where uh, several uh, colleagues from Japan um, visited us at NICER and it was a very vibrant and nice conference and we really uh, enjoyed that conference. The name of the conference was Indo-Japan WhatsApp at the magnetism uh, for, uh, on magnetism at the nanoscale, IJWMN. Then we had the second, uh, second conference of that series in um, Institute of Material Research at Tohoku University in Japan, organized by Professor Takanasi and Professor Seki, where uh, <laughs> We were the co-conveners. And uh, um, yeah, so in the beginning, Professor Anjan Barman was, <clears throat> uh, uh, he was part of the team and now also he's part of the team. Um, and uh, then third one, <clears throat> this conference uh, is called Indo-Japan WhatsApp on uh, Spinterface Phenomena for, spinter, uh, for Spintronics. It's a very focused topic. As we all know, Spintronics is a, really like an ocean and we have chosen actually a bucket of water this time to focus and uh, deliberate on that. Although this conference was supposed to be held in uh, 2020, but due to the COVID pandemic, uh, it was shifted and we were anticipating that finally we can host it at NICER Bhubaneswar where again, uh, about 15 professors from Japan would have visited us. Uh, but unfortunately due to the COVID pandemic, uh, um, so it was not possible and uh, um, I have to also mention that this conference is supported by the Department of Science Technology India and the Japanese Science Pro uh, Pro uh, Promotional Science JSPS of Japan and the funding organizations and I have to acknowledge the uh, great support by our um, Department of Atomic Energy and NICER and Tokyo University. So. Uh, DST and JSPS kind of insisted that we must uh, host this uh, conference by online mode uh, by end of this March, basically that's the financial year. So that's the reason we are meeting online, although now the situation is getting better. I hope soon we can again meet either in uh, NICER or in IMR, um, but I, I really uh, like to you know have this kind of uh, personal interaction rather than online. But nevertheless, this kind of online conferences are working by and large quite uh, good, successful, and let's hope that this conference will also bring experts from India and experts from Japan together. We'll have a lot of scientific discussions, collaborations, and for young students, particularly or young postdocs, it will be a great opportunity to interact. So for this time, we have actually taken this virtual platform frame. Uh, we have sent details where we would request all the speakers to join after their talk. And during the poster session, uh, obviously interaction will happen on the posters. And uh, then uh, also speakers are requested to be there so that interaction can happen. Now, before, <clears throat> so this is kind of preamble to the conference. Now I like to welcome you all and welcome you, uh, welcome the delegates in the inauguration ceremony. So first, uh, I'd like to introduce Professor Sudhakar Ponda, who is the director of NICER. Uh, he's a string theorist and very well known in his uh, uh, research work and very supportive, kind uh, to our activities at NICER. Thank you, Professor Ponda, for being there and uh, for helping us. Then Professor Bedandas Mohanty, uh, who is the uh, Dean of Faculty Affairs at NICER. He was actually the chairperson when we started this IJWMN at the IOP campus. And Professor Ponda was the director of IOP. 
So these two gentlemen are actually helping and supporting from the beginning. <clears throat> I just like to recall Professor V. Chandrasekhar, who was also that time director of NICER, who was also very supportive in this event. So Professor Bedandas Mohanty uh, has been very actively involved in these kind of organizations. I'm really grateful and thankful for his help, guidance, and support. Then I like to uh, welcome Professor Koki Takanasi, who was the former director of uh, Institute of Material Research of uh, Tokyo, no, in, um, at Tokyo University in Sendai in Japan. He has been a, a great friend and a very supportive col collaborator for me. Uh, since uh, 2012, I'm almost visiting every year or every second year to his lab in uh, IMR and I have been working with Professor Takeshi Seki, about whom I will take, uh, I will tell in a second. So these two are really important people in my life and I'm really grateful for the scientific collaboration and even very good relations I have enjoyed with you. Uh, Professor Koki Takanasi is moving now uh, to a new institute as a director general in much bigger institute. And I wish you all the best for your future endeavors. And thank you very much for joining this conference and being the principal investigator from the Japanese side of the, uh, Japanese side of the project. Uh, this actually conference is a kind of project between DST and JSPS. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Koki, for being there. Then I'd like to welcome Professor Takeshi Seki, uh, who is the co-PI from the Japanese side, a great friend and a very active collaborator for me, our, our group. It has been always a great pleasure to work with you. And these three conferences would not have been possible with you without you and uh, Professor Takanasi, of course. And your active involvement is much appreciated. So thank you very much, uh, Takanasi, for being there. Then with us is uh, Dr. Brajbhushan Singh. He's the co-PI from uh, the Indian side. He's an inspired faculty working at NICER, basically associated to my group. And thank you, Braj, for being there. and. Uh, uh, finally, we made this conference and I hope that we can enjoy this conference. So with this uh, little note, now I welcome Professor Ponda to give his uh, inaugural speech. So please unmute. I hope you can unmute. Uh, no, I have asked you to unmute now. So hopefully you can unmute now. Yeah, please. Yes. Uh, give <clears throat> oh, good morning, everyone from the Indian side. And as, as I understand, it is just after lunch in Japan. So. Good afternoon to my Japanese friends. <clears throat> I'm actually delighted that uh, the School of Physical Sciences in Niger, uh, Bhubaneswar, is organizing this Indo-Japan workshop on interface phenomena for splintonics. Shortly, they have named this time IJW IPS 2022. And this is being held jointly, as you heard, with Tokyo University Sendai, Japan. And um, basically, it's a program, uh, as Swankar mentioned, as a project more uh, with DST and JSPS cooperation. So I'm very happy that this bilateral Indo-Japan workshop is continuing third time this year. And uh, as you heard that it was held in 2015 in India, in Niger to be specific, and in Japan in 2016. And as you also heard that it could have continued maybe next year, but um, we all started suffering from this COVID, our new friend now for the last two years. And didn't allow, this friend didn't allow us to move around. And um, so <clears throat> finally we have come to a stage where we are forced to do this workshop again online mode this year. And I'm pretty sure if this project of JSPS and DST continues, next time it will be Japan's turn and we'll come back to again India in due time. I will be happy that to help my Japanese colleagues in this new campus of Niger, nicely built. We moved here in 2015 and we are trying to have all our infrastructure possible uh, <coughs> for having big conferences. We just had our uh, auditorium ready to have this, and Professor Shubankar Vedant was uh, giving him the charge to bring up the auditorium also. With his help, the auditorium stands now tall. And I understand that the conference aims to provide a platform to share knowledge on the current research trends on spintronics, 
but as Sri Lanka told, they have just taken a bucket of water from the sea of spintronics. And I always prefer that focused discussion is much better than giving a talk from uh, center to the circumference of a circle where we don't cover the whole circle properly. So this is a better idea. And as we all know, the research on spintronics is one of the most sought after areas in, uh, in my School of Physical Science in Niger. They are well equipped with cutting edge research on nano fabrication, photonics, multiferroics, dielectrics, solicited ionics, spectroscopy, and transport studies, superconductivity, ultrafold atoms, and quantum mechanics, statistical mechanics, nonlinear optics, semiconductor lasers, atomic physics, high energy physics, including experimental high energy physics like ALICE and CMS. And then we have string theory, quantum field theory, quantum information. These are the basically the research activities going on at Niger under the edges of the Department of Atomic Energy. And uh, the institute has grown rapidly in the past few years, 14 years to be specific, to be well organized in India as well as abroad. Shivankar has organized many conferences in past with great success. I remember the ICMA GMA 2018 conference which was held in Niger, which was an excellent conference. I met many friends there, although even a different field, but physics is physics, we can always discuss. Similarly, he's organizing the Ovenier series on spintronics since more than 20 months with 82 talks so far. And that I believe is a great success at Niger. So I'm very confident that this IJW IPS 2022 conference will also be a great success. And this will not only help to spread the research mandate of Niger, but also help young graduates, undergraduate students, young faculty members to decide their future goals. And I hope some of them will join this game also. Uh, I should say that the project investigator from Japan side, uh, Professor Takanashi-san, with the former director of Institute of Material Science uh, of Tokyo to University, and uh, as I understand it, without whom the conference would not have been possible. I also congratulate the co other co-conveners, Professor Takeshi-san and Dr. Bhushan Singh for their efforts for this nice conference. And uh, not only DAE, I personally, as the director of Niger, supports this conference wholeheartedly, and I'm confident that it will be a great success again. And with this, I welcome all the participants, all the speakers, Indian side, as well as Japan side. As I see, there are 11 speakers from Indian sides and 10 speakers from Japan sides. And I hope this two days, um, three days meeting, uh, we'll have, we will have lots of conversation, lots of exchange of ideas. And though actually this webinars or these virtual meetings can't substitute the real meetings where we meet uh, in, during the coffee break, during the lunch break, lots of discussion takes place. Uh, that we will be missing, but soon we will reach there. We hope no, no such further problem will come internationally to stop us to meet and have scientific discussion. With this, again, I welcome, enjoy the meeting, wish you all the great success. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Ponda, for your very kind words and support. Uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, now I would like to request Professor Bedang Das Mohanty, who has been very kind to, as I said, always is a support. Uh, he is now joining from Guwahati, which is maybe 1,000 more kilometers from here. Uh, he is uh, uh, now a very highly sought physicist in India after the Infosys Hour, going around with talks. I really uh, sincerely appreciate that he's there. His talk will start in 15 minutes at Guwahati University. I really uh, sincerely thank you for joining. So kindly say a few words. I yes, Suvanka. Can you hear me, Suvanka? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. A very good morning to all of you. And uh, I'm from Nicer, but currently at Gauhati. 
I join our director, uh, Professor Panda, in welcoming all the participants of this uh, Indo-Japan meeting. As Suvankar pointed out, I was there physically in the first Indo-Japan meeting when we were in the transit campus at IOP. Then, of course, it was the second one was in Japan, and third one is back to Nicer. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, many thanks to uh, the organizers uh, for continuing with this series, especially Shuvankar and Braj from Nicer side, and uh, Professor Takana Sisan and Professor uh, Takeshi San for uh, continuing to uh, hold this meeting. Uh, the topic is uh, interface and its role in spintronics, a very, very important and evolving topic. Subankar has uh, made me associate with his group by uh, looking uh, at the doctoral committees of his PhD student. And uh, this topic is uh, really, really relevant for uh, young people who are working uh, in and around uh, NICER. Uh, NICER, uh, as uh, uh, Professor Panda said, uh, uh, has a vibrant physics department. Uh, we have 32 faculties and four more are joining soon. But we also have a very strong group uh, working in areas of spintronics, uh, magnetism, and superconductivity. And uh, there is also a very nice network of NICER, IIT Bhuvaneshwar, Indian Institute of Technology Bhuvaneshwar, ICER Barampur, uh, Institute of Physics Bhuvaneshwar, and IMMT Bhuvaneshwar. Uh, so that locally, there is a very, very vibrant community who are interested in the physics that this workshop is going to discuss. So with this, uh, welcome again, and uh, I wish this meeting to have uh, all success and uh, gains for everyone. Thank you very much. So thank you, Professor Mahanti, for these very kind words. Uh, we, uh, we would seek your continuous guidance and help uh, in making future conferences, and I hope next time we can welcome the uh, Japanese colleagues at NICER in our new campus. That would be really awesome. Thank you again for joining uh, and uh, yeah. So now I would request Professor Takanasi, uh, who has been very supportive in this conference from the beginning uh, to say a few words. Uh, I think uh, you can unmute and say things, yeah. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, please. Okay, thank you for introduction, okay. So hello everyone. Uh, good morning for Indian people and good afternoon for Japanese people. So I'm Kobe Takanashi, Institute for, Institute for Material Research, IMR, Tohoku University. So it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you to, to the Indo-Japan workshop on Interface Phenomena for Spintronics, IJW IPS 2022. Okay. So I'd like to thank all the participants for joining this workshop. So as uh, Professor uh, Svankar Vedanta mentioned, uh, the first Indo-Japan workshop was held at NICER uh, in Bhuvaneshwar, India in January 2015, about seven years ago, with the support of a bilateral cooperation program by JSPS Japan and DST India. That was the first visit to India for me and all, also for, for many Japanese participants. So we had a very good time in Bhuvaneshwar with warm hospitality of Professor Svankar Vedanta and his colleagues. So we enjoyed the workshop and also the trip in India. The second workshop was held in Tohoku University, Sendai, Japan in December, 2016. At that time, the topic was focused on magnetism at nanoscale. So several Indian researchers, including Professor uh, Svankar Vedanta and Professor Anjan Barman, kindly visited Tokyo University, and we enjoyed again the exchange and the discussion on nanomagnetism. Okay, now we have the third Indo-Japan workshop here. So this time focused on interface phenomena for spintronics. It's a very uh, timely topic. Well, this workshop was initially scheduled to be held in 2020. However, because of COVID-19 pandemic, all over the world. Unfortunately, it was postponed and postponed 
And now at last, we have the workshop, but in a, in a virtual style. So frankly, I'm very sorry that we cannot meet in person, but we have to accept this situation. And I hope we'll have the active discussion about recent research activities and enjoy the exchange as much as we can. Well, uh, this workshop series originally started from the friendship between Professor Svankar Berata and myself. Uh, he has been a good friend and a good collaborator for me for a long time. So I first met him in 2005, I, I think. So when he was a PhD student in Professor Kremann's group in Duisburg, Germany, I was impressed. So he was very active and out outgoing person. And since then, so we had sometimes met at different conferences and started real research collaboration. So he had visited my lab uh, a lot of times to make experiment uh, with uh, Takeshi Seki, uh, so one of my colleagues and also one of uh, co-conveners for this workshop. So as uh, Professor Sibankar Bedanta mentions, well, uh, this April, I'm moving from Tohoku University to, to another place that is uh, Advanced Science Research Center, uh, Japan Atomic Energy Agency, JAEA, in Tokai, uh, Ibaraki Prefecture. Even after I move, however, I would like to keep the friendship and the collaboration. Okay, yeah, now let's enjoy the workshop. I will appreciate your active participation. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Yeah, thank you, Professor Takanasi, for your kind words. Really appreciate it. Uh, you have been a great uh, friendship and great support for all these uh, activities so far. And I'm really looking forward to keep it further. And I hope by, via this conference, uh, many new exchange of ideas can happen. Now I'd like to request Professor Takanasi Seki to say a few words. Thank you very much for introduction. Can you hear me, Svankal? Yes, please, go ahead. May I share a small slide for this inauguration ceremony? Yeah, please. Oh, I have one. Yeah. Can you see my slide? Yes. All right. Which one? Is this a presentation mode or? I think you have two slides set together. You need to right. just do the, yeah, single just slide. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, we yeah. see. How about? Uh, this is a big... now, now it's fine. Please go ahead. How about this? Uh, this one, okay, it's fine, but we are seeing also the second slide. Oh, all right. You need to mirror it, I think. No, on, 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 on... yes, now it is fine, please. Okay. Oh, sorry. So uh, welcome to so this uh, Indo-Japan workshop for everyone. So my name is Seki. I'm an associate professor of Professor Koki Takanashi's group. So unfortunately, so something what I want to say has been already mentioned by uh, Professor Koki Takanashi and Swankal. I have almost nothing to say, but I would like to repeat uh, some important point. And first, I would like to thank Sir uh, Professor Panda, the di director of NICER, to support this uh, important workshop. And also, I would like to thank so, Svankal and uh, Braji Busan uh, Sinha uh, for preparing this nice workshop. And on behalf of uh, so, 10 invited speakers from Japan, I would like to uh, thank you for inviting us for this workshop. And as uh, Professor Koki Takanashi mentioned, this is a sad uh, collaborative 
uh, workshop between Indo and Japan. And the first, was, uh, first workshop was held in 2015 in Nicer and India. Also for me, that, is a, that was the first time to visit India as well as uh, uh, Professor Koki Takanashi. And second one was held in uh, Tohoku University uh, in Sendai, Japan, 2016. And both workshop uh, uh, focused on the topic of magnetism at nanoscale. And so thanks to, so based on this uh, collaboration, uh, collaborative workshop, we have a strong uh, collaboration and cross correlation each other, uh, thanks to our cross correlation. So uh, we were also invited uh, spin off workshop, such as the uh, International Conference of Magnetic Materials and Application, IC Magma, that was also held in NICER. And we, are, uh, we uh, enjoyed uh, the stay in India. And after that, we are uh, keeping the cross correlation, and we have many collaborative work uh, with Professor Svankar Vedanta. And I would like to say, uh, so for me, that is a very nice uh, opportunity to make a uh, strong collaboration. And I hope uh, every participant to get the chance to have uh, communication with each other. And that uh, I hope that is a starting point for some new collaborative work. Okay, thank you very much for kind attention. Okay, thank you so much, Takisi, for this uh, nice speech and uh, memorizing the old, our past activities. I uh, really appreciate that. Uh, now, uh, uh, I'd like to present actually the uh, uh, few mementos. Uh, so, where is it? I'd like to start with our director. I hope you can see my screen. Um, like I say, do you see my screen? Yes, yes. Okay, I'll just uh, read few, uh, this, few of these mementos for all our guests of the inauguration ceremony, and then we will move to the vote of thanks by Brajbusan. So Indo-Japan Workshop on Interface Phenomena for Spindronics, jointly organized by NYSA Bhubaneswar and IMR Tokyo University, Sendai, Japan. Takes immense pleasure in presenting this plaque to Professor Sudhakar Panda, Nicer Bhubaneswar, India, in appreciation for being a guest in the inauguration ceremony. So, Professor Panda, thank you so much uh, for being there, and we really appreciate uh, that. Thank you so, very much. Yes. Thank you very much. I will send you uh, by email. Thank you so much for being there. Okay. Now, uh, Professor, uh, uh, okay, uh, sorry. Oops, I just missed it. Please excuse me for a second. Yeah. Okay. So now uh, I'd like to present this memento. Of course, uh, Professor Mohanty is not here because he's just starting his lecture. So uh, also many, many thanks to Professor Bedang Das Mohanty for being a guest in the inauguration ceremony and uh, we appreciate uh, that. Then uh, I'd like to present this memento to Professor Koki Takanasi. So uh, IJW IPS 2022 uh, organized by NICER and IMA takes, imm takes immense pleasure in presenting this plaque to Professor Koki Takanasi from Tohoku University, Japan in appreciation for being a guest in the inauguration ceremony. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank very you much. Professor Takanasi. Then uh, I'd like to present this uh, memento to Professor Seki. So IJW IPS 2022, jointly organized by NICER and IMA. Take immense pleasure in presenting this back to Professor Takeshi Seki from Tokyo University, Japan, in appreciation for being a guest in the inauguration ceremony. Uh, now I'd like to request. Uh, uh, I stop sharing. Uh, 
I request uh, my colleague uh, Braj Bhusan uh, to give the vote of thanks. Braj, please uh, unmute and say a few words. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I am Braj Bhushan Singh and uh, working as an Inspire faculty at NICE. So Namaskar, Konnichiwa, and good morning to all. I hope uh, everyone uh, was safe and uh, in this uh, pandemic. So in this context, I would like to quote one of the uh, sentence from the old scripture, Rig Veda, Samano Mantraha Samitaha Samani, means let's your deliberation be common, your assembly of common aim. Further, if we be explained, meet together, come together and work together, sit together, speak together, converse together. That's the, I think, whole idea of these conferences or workshops. So this is uh, already, we, our human being already very good about that to understanding that when you discuss more than your ideas emerges in different directions. So it is my great pleasure to propose the vote of thanks on this occasion of Indo-Japan workshop on interface phenomena for spintronics. Indeed, spintronics is growing day by day, opening various branches when it was uh, uh, in the 80s was starting. So now people have moved to topological spintronics, spin calorietronics, oxide spintronics, anti-ferromagnetic -spin, anti spintronics, and more branches are there. First of all, uh, I would like to thank to Professor Sudhakar Panda, director of NICER, who provided the conducive environment for such events and find to time to grace this occasion. We are grateful of Professor Bedangdas Mohanty, who is the dean of, dean of faculty affairs, NICER, whose presence always really inspired all of us because of his achievements. We are obliged to Professor Koki Takanasi, uh, which are from Tokyo University, Japan, for his kind encouragement and constant support. We are thankful to Professor Takeshi Seki for his active involvement in making this program to be success, successful. Further, I would like to thank Dr. Nil Kumar, who is the chairperson of the School of Physical Science in NICER. Without his support to this conference, or we could not be organized. I owe special gratitude to our non-teaching staff, which is very full from the School of Physical Science office. And furthermore, without finance section help, it is very difficult to organize such kind of uh, meetings. So I would like to thank them. My special thanks to go to the colleagues from the computer center, in particular, Mr. Deepankar Das, Mr. Jagdi Sahu, who basically helping in managing this website and all kinds of computer related things regarding this conference. And of course, funding is a very important part of this. Therefore, we would like to thank Department of Science of Technology Government of India for their financial support. In the similar context uh, from the Japanese side, JSPS help uh, in the similar way. So we would like to give our gratitude to the JSPS agency for funding. And further, we would like to thank Department of Atomic Energy for their financial support and the assistance that it is provided by through NICER. Above all, without energetic um, volunteer, any such kind of events is not possible to be get successful. Therefore, I would like to thank volunteers, especially Dr. Anupama, Mr. Abhishek, Mr. Sakti Ranjan, Mr. Bandavan, Mr. Ajar and Ms. Swang, and many others who had worked behind the curtain and for their great, great help and support. I would also thanks to the all participants who has joined this one and the invited speaker who kindly agreeing for, the, for giving the talk. Last but not least, I would like to thank Dr. Subhankar Vedanta for organizing this workshop and making it successful. Once again, I thank you all of your kind attention. Let's make this event successful. Best of luck. Thank you. Thank you, Braj, uh, for this very nice vote of thanks. Very detailed. I really appreciate it. Uh, Braj has been a sport in my group, and uh, really, I appreciate uh, all your efforts in the group. So I think with this, uh, I would like to close the session. But uh, before that, I would like to request all of you to turn on your camera so that we can make a conference virtual photo. So all the participants are requested to uh, uh, turn on the camera.
Okay, I'm just waiting a minute uh, or a few seconds. These uh, people are switching on. Okay. So we can smile. Um, okay, one more time. Cheers. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So you can uh, switch up the cameras. And uh, I would like to thank again uh, all of you for joining this inauguration ceremony. Now we'll begin with the scientific session. So many, many thanks to Professor Ponda for kindly taking some time to join this and grace this occasion. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, all of you. And thank you so much, uh, Professor Takanasi, Professor Seki, and uh, Raj, and many others. Now we have a, a scientific session, and I invite all of you to join. Uh, the first talk will be uh, given by Professor Anjan Borman, who has been, again, another big milestone in our activities. He's like a pillar in the Indian spintronics uh, community and also in this uh, Indo-Japan conference. He has been very, very supportive from the beginning. So uh, I think, uh, Anjanda, you have been always already made a co-host. You may kindly share your screen when you are in. Yeah, yeah, sure. Can so you see? Yeah, I see your screen. I request others to uh, switch off your videos. And mute Rasmi Ranjan. I'm muting you. Uh, I am, I'm requesting all of you to uh, mute. So maybe Anjanda, I will. Uh, uh, I'm muting again, and uh, because sometimes students. Uh, okay. One second. Where are you? Now you can unmute, I believe. Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, you can go to the full screen mode. Uh, sorry that we are a little bit uh, delayed uh, by seven minutes nearly. Uh, I'm, I'm apologizing for that. So uh, okay. I will not take much time to introduce Professor Anjan Barman. He's a very well-known name in the field of spintronics, uh, not in Indian context, in very much in global context. And we are very happy to welcome him. And as I said, he has been very, very actively involved from the beginning of this Indo-Japan workshop. In the first workshop, I think he was the co-PI from the Indian side. And then uh, we moved to the second one. We went also went to Japan with him. And uh, now he's there always. And he's giving the first talk. It's really a pleasure for me and many of us. So Professor Anjan Marman works in several areas, but mostly focusing on the uh, uh, spin dynamics. And, and this time he's uh, choosing the topic ultra fast spin dynamics and spin waves in 2D material ferromagnetic thin film heterostructures. So I now request you to give your talk. Your lecture will be 25 minutes. So, so that after that, we will have five minutes for discussion. During the talk, we don't take any questions. So if participants have any questions, you may kindly write in the chat box or raise your hand and uh, during the question answer, we'll try to take as many as we can. Okay, uh, Anjanda, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Suhankar, and thanks to Braj, Professor Sheki, and Professor Takanashi, and all other organizers for inviting me. And uh, thanks to all the attendees for listening to my talk. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about a topic that we have been working for maybe one last one year, one and a half year. So we are very new here, and we also want to learn something from you. So research activities in my group has various uh, topics, starting from ultrafast demagnetization, Gilbert damping, magnetic crystal, magnetic multilayers interface, various spin orbit effects, and spin wave non reciprocity, hybrid magnetics, and so on. Uh, uh, the 2D material spintronics is something that we have been working, like I said, very recently. And we have indigenously built various uh, equipment, uh, starting from time resolved mock microscope, optical pump probe spectroscopy, broadband and spin torque fMR, conventional and microfocus DLS, and so on. And in this particular talk, I'll primarily focus on time resolved MOOC and the conventional BLS micro, uh, conventional BLS spectroscopy. Uh, we all know the world of spintronics is slowly shifting towards various new effects like spin orbit effect, 
electrically controlled effect, uh, magnonics, all optical writing, atomics uh, based spin uh, logic and other devices, topological objects and so on. And here we know spin orbit effect is one of the pillars as many of you said, and uh, this paper nicely uh, show that, uh, you know, it's from a nature uh, review, uh, nicely show that, you know, various kinds of spin orbit effects like Rashba uh, effect, DMI, topological surface states, and they give rise to various new kinds of phenomena and, and applications. And these are primarily symmetry independent, uh, which are present in all type of crystal and symmetry dependent, where inversion symmetry is broken at the interface. And this gives rise to various phenomena like uh, magnetic, perpendicular magnetic anisotropy, spin hall effect and its inverse effects, spin pumping, zelusinsky moria interaction, damping and ultrafast demagnetization and so on. And a new uh, key in the block is the 2D material, uh, the graphene 2D TMDs, topological insulators, Dirac and Weil semi-metals, van der Waals heterostructures. And they are also making their mark. And today I'm going to talk about primarily graphene and some 2D TMDs in the field of uh, spintronics and magnonics. Uh, of course, they have already shown many new effects like spin hall effects, spin pumping, Rashpa effect, and promises in new devices, as you can see in this. Uh, and graphene, as you all know, is, a, is one of the wonder material for which the Nobel Prize was award, awarded in 2010. It's a zero gap semiconductor with a linear dispersion and energy bands connected at the Dirac point. It's neither metal nor insulator, and it can have various new properties due to their, you know, zigzag edge, armchair arm rays, the more material and so on. The potential advantages of graphene in spintronics is primarily due to its slow spin relaxation time. And also, you know, it can uh, show, uh, although it has low intrinsic spin orbit coupling, it can show extrinsic spin orbit coupling due to uh, various kinds of defects, add atoms, vacancies, and so on. And it is controllable. So one can do the gate tunability of KDR concentration uh, and, and it's, it has a high mobility and so on. For this, it can be very useful for spintronics as well. So the motivation behind this work is uh, to understand the spin manipulation mechanism in graphene ferromagnetic heterostructure from femtosecond to picosecond time scale. And despite having intensive studies of various spin orbit effects in graphene ferromagnet heterostructure, study of ultrafast spin dynamics for probing the spin manipulation have been uh, you know, missing in the literature. And we would like to correlate between the ultrafast demagnetization and Gilbert damping, and thereby you try to learn about, you know, the various spin orbit effects uh, and their role in the ultrafast demagnetization. And finally, we would like to investigate the interfacial zelusinsky moria interaction, which is very important for stabilizing chiral spin textures uh, in the and uh, in the you know, graphene and 2D TMD ferromagnetic interface, uh, and underpin the effects of extrinsic spin orbit coupling. So the first one is the ultrafast spin dynamics in single layer graphene, cobalt iron boron thin film. Uh, just before we go there, we just uh, take a quick look at the various phenomena at occurring at different time scale. Uh, so if a femtosecond laser is falling on a ferromagnetic material, first they had a coherent interaction between the phonon, photon charges and spin leading to ultrafast demagnetization, causing the thermalization of charge and spin is follows by the recovery, which is also known as the uh, remagnetization, which occurs in, in a fast recovery and a slow recovery. And there, this, you know, that uh, coupling between three different temperature baths, like electron spin and lattice, takes place. And uh, that is uh, finally occurs into a magnetization precession and damping. And here are different kinds of, you know, sort of phenomena and their time scales are given here. And some of these can be found in, in this book written recently by us. And uh, ultrafast demagnetization was first uh, discovered in 1996 by Barpier and Bigot in a ferromagnetic nickel. And then after that, uh, they used the three temperature model to explain it. But after that, there have been various uh, different, uh, you know, sort of phenomena which came up to explain it. And they can be classed, uh, classified into two main classes. One uh, falls under the spin flip scattering process. Other is the non-spin flip scattering where the super diffusive spin current or thermal current takes a, 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 an important role. And more recently, optical intersite spin transfer or the oyster effect is, is making a mark primarily for multi sub lattice alloys and multi layers. Uh, so all these are, you know, have been around now and we have to choose and find which one is actually playing an important role in which sample. Now the time result magneto optical car effect is, is uh, the effect which can 
prove the spin dynamics in the femtosecond time scale. It can also offer sub uh, micron spatial resolution. Uh, so it is based on optical pump proof technique based on a femtosecond leisure. And we do a two color experiment by splitting the beam and sending one part through a second harmonic generator and time delaying one part and finally meeting them together on the sample surface. Uh, so one part will excite the spin dynamics, the other part will probe it as a function of the time delay between pump and probe beam. And finally, the reflectivity and the car rotation are measured uh, in a you know, phase sensitive manner by using two optical, uh, two lock-in amplifiers. Uh, so this is the you know, uh, a view graph of one of the lasers, like it's an optical parametric amplifier and second harmonic generator, which are excited by this fundamental laser from this amplifier system. And this shows the optical path of those. So this is the pump beam and this is the probe beam. So you can see pump beams falling at an angle, whereas the probe beam is perpendicularly falling on the sample. So we are measuring the polar car geometry here by applying an outer plane magnetic field. So the, you know, the first, uh, you can see this is the typical time resolved car rotation data it shows the negative delay and then the ultra fast demagnetization, fast relaxation and then precession damped precision uh, with a slow relaxation. And uh, we, we can analyze this part to find out the precision frequency and the damping by doing all this uh, landau lipschitz gilbert equation formalism. And the, for the ultra-fast demagnetization, we have a different uh, you know, sort of mechanism. So the spin pumping uh, in graphene has been uh, you know, an important phenomenon recently, and we all know what is spin pumping. So you have a ferromagnetic material with uh, in adjacent to a non-magnet. So the difference between the chemical potential causes the spin current to carry angular momentum perpendicular to the magnetization direction. And that allows the absorption of angular momentum in the non-magnetic layer, causing a change in the damping. And in case of graphene, it's a very low intrinsic spin orbit coupling and small effective thickness of 0.3 to 0.4 nanometer. So that allows the energy dissipation parallel to the graphene surface and defect induced extrinsic spin orbit coupling plays an important role here at the interface. So uh, the theoretical background is formed uh, is a modified landau lipschitz gilbert equation with a spin current, and which can be written like that, uh, where this beta is a backflow factor, and G uh, is the intrinsic spin mixing conductance. So we can write down this modulation of damping in terms of the effective spin mixing conductance as a function of you know, the ferromagnetic layer thickness and also this intrinsic spin mixing conductance as a function of this uh, non-magnetic layer and ferromagnetic layer thickness. And we can model this uh, by also including the two magnon scattering, which can be there to affect the damping. Uh, and that has a form like that. So D, one over D squared basically. So the sample, we first uh, procured the single layer graphene, which is severely grown from graphenia. And then we deposited using UHV sputtering uh, uh, of, you know, sort of cobalt iron boron of varying thickness from 1.5 nanometer to 6 nanometer. We also prepared reference sample in order to understand the effect of the single layer graphene on this. And these are the deposition parameters. And the sample was first characterized by using the extra reflectivity and atomic force microscope. And you can see these are the typical data with the parrot feet. And from here, we see that the, you know, sort of the uh, roughness uh, is slightly higher in case of uh, SLG cobalt iron boron from 0.25 to 0.4, whereas it is a little bit smaller in the uh, cobalt iron boron reference film. And these are the electron density for coffee B, SLG, and SiO2. And AFM roughness are fairly similar to the that obtained from the, you know, in this case of uh, extra reflectivity. And here, the formation of low density and large size clusters during the initial growth state promotes this increased number of domain wall pinning center because of this low metal carbon bond energy in graphene. So uh, we further do micro Raman spectroscopy and we found perfect Lorentzian shaped 2D peaks, which uh, shows this is a single layer graphene. And you also find out the average crystallite size by using this expression. And this is plotted here and you can see the average crystallite size is actually increasing with uh, the ferromagnetic layer thickness, which means that the defect is actually decreasing. Uh, the VSM measurement gives us the magnetization, and you can see that magnetization is slightly you know, lower in the case of SLG coffee B, and that is probably because of this uh, induced magnetic moment in cobalt and uh, you know, in, the, in the carbon atoms from this cobalt and iron, which is anti-parallel uh, to the cobalt and iron, causing a reduction in the you know, overall moment in the system.
Uh, then we measure the ultrafast demagnetization, and you can see this is the negative delay, this is the zero delay, and these are the ultrafast demagnetization and the fast relaxation. And uh, this is for uh, the reference cobalt iron boron, and this is for the graphene, graphene cobalt iron boron for different uh, values of the cobalt iron boron thickness. We modeled it uh, based on expression on the phenomenological three temperature model, where delta theta k is the change in the car rotation. And here you can see tau m is the demagnetization time and tau is the relaxation time. And then these are different, uh, you know, sort of parameter of the experiment. And what we found is uh, the demagnetization time tau m is uh, independent, quite high and independent of the ferromagnetic lower layer thickness in absence of the graphene underlayer. But when you have the graphene underlayer, it reduces remarkably to a value by a factor of three. So what is happening there? We try to understand what drives this threefold increase in the or decrease in the DMAC time uh, with the graphene underlayer. So we need to understand that. So is there any role of the spin transport or spin pumping that is playing a role? For that, we uh, analyze the damping because we know spin pumping will affect the damping. So these are the beautiful time resolved, uh, you know, decayed uh, precision. And we uh, found the damping from here and we plotted the damping as a function of D. And again, the damping is constant with D for reference cobalt iron boron, but it uh, again varies linearly and significantly for graphene cobalt iron uh, you know, sample as one over D. And we uh, modeled it by using this spin pumping uh, formalism. And we found that the two magnon scattering is fairly low here. Spin pumping is dominant as you can see from this graph. And you can see that uh, you know, the value of effective spin mixing conductance is very high in case of graphene uh, ferromagnetic layer and promising a very high value of uh, interfacial spin transparency. Now uh, we try to understand the you know, correlation between ultrafast demagnetization and Gilbert damping. And there are two different dominant mechanisms. Uh, one is the spin flip scattering, like I said, the other is the spin current transport. Now, uh, the first correlation was suggested by Koopmans et al. in this paper by only uh, considering the electron spin flip scattering, and they found an inverse correlation. And but this is an oversimplified microscopic assumption. And then uh, next, uh, Funley et al. gave a better uh, sort of model. And there are two kinds, and they uh, considered that the magnetization dynamics actually generates pair of excited electron and hole, and they can either be excited uh, in the same band. Uh, like that. Uh, so this is the intraband scattering, or they can be excited in, in different band, which is the interband scattering. And uh, you can have uh, interband and intraband uh, can give rise to two different uh, sort of uh, correlation. Uh, this, in this case, the resistivity like contribution, which is inversely proportional to one of uh, tau m. And in this case, the damping is uh, directly proportional to tau m. So, uh, but even then, uh, that ignores the spin transport mechanism. So uh, more recently, Zhang et al. gave a model that incorporated the spin transport through the interface by spin pumping and hybridization. And here, uh, the spin pumping, uh, spin flip scattering uh, causes a direct relationship, whereas the spin transport gives an inverse relationship. And here you can see delta one over tau m, where delta one over tau m is the difference in the demagnetization uh, for this uh, SLG cobalt iron boron and, uh, you know, sort of, uh, only cobalt iron boron. I hope I am, am I audible? Hello? Yes, yes. Okay, <coughs> the power cut is here. So uh, it is happening from this morning, I'm sorry. So uh, yeah, so here uh, uh, you can see that we have plotted tau m as a function of one over, uh, as a function of alpha effective, and it shows uh, a drastic change and delta one over tau m versus delta alpha shows a linear relationship. And from here by modeling with that, we are able to find out the spin chemical potential, which is uh, basically shows the proportional to spin accumulation at this interface. And uh, it is about 0.56 electron volt, which is fairly high actually. Okay, so, uh, so what we found from here is the spin transport mediated that, that dominates the ultrafast demagnetization in graphene cobalt iron boron heterostructure. So next I'll uh, discuss about this uh, interfacial zalosinski moria interaction in graphene ferromagnet heterostructure. We all know that DMI is an anti-symmetric exchange of the form di dot, di dot si cross sj. 
and that gives rise to various chiral spin textures like skarmions. And in presence of that, the spin wave uh, propagating in the uh, demo Nash pack mode shows an asymmetry in the frequency, peak frequency, peak intensity, and line width uh, like that, which was shown nicely in this paper for the first time. And we use the Brillo light scattering spectroscopy, uh, which is based on this inelastic light scattering of uh, you know, uh, magnon or phonon. Uh, so here we are actually measuring only the magnon. And here the Stokes and anti-Stokes line correspond to a loss or gain in the, you know, the quasi particles. And here, um, you, know, you can see that the wave vector can be changed very easily uh, by changing this angle of incidence here. And this is the demo uh, geometry where you know that uh, K and B are in the same plane, but they are perpendicular to each other. And this is a dispersion relation. So we'll measure this, uh, but before that, uh, we just wanted to talk about that the graphene has a small intrinsic spin orbit interaction, but it shows unusual nature of the you know, graphene ferromagnet interface. It shows a certain spin orbit effect. The question is that can graphene ferromagnet interface show sizable interfacial DMI? And if so, that what would be the origin of such effect? Uh, so uh, just before uh, we published our paper, a paper came in Nature Material from Albert Firth Group, which shows a DMI in graphene ferromagnet uh, interface from the domain wall uh, you know, expansion. And this was from uh, MB grown sample. Uh, and uh, it shows that it's originating from the Rashpa effect and beyond few monolayer of FM layer, DMI actually vanishes. We wanted to measure it directly from the uh, Brillo light scattering and in a th films grown by magnetron sputtering because that is more compatible with the technology. MB is not compatible with technology. And, uh, but in, we measured in a rather thicker regime from three to 15 nanometer. So the possibility of Rashpa is almost eliminated. And we wanted to see the effect of the extreme spin uh, orbit coupling. And here uh, they are grown at different argon pressure like two, six and 10 millitor with the goal of uh, changing the defect and the ensuing extrinsic spin orbit coupling. Okay, so we did the measurement and uh, you can see all the analysis are done based on this kind of dispersion. Uh, and uh, then this shows a clear Delta F, which is uh, you know, sort of plotted as a function of K. And uh, you can fit it with an expression like that. And from here, we can find out the value of D, which is, uh, is shown here. And this D value, this, uh, you know, the Zalusinski Moria constant uh, shows a linear relationship with the, you know, Parmaloy uh, inverse of the Parmaloy layer thickness. And it shows a maximum value of 67 microjoule per meter square. So it is sizable effect. And we are trying to understand the effect. And for that, first we did the Ramon experiment and we found out the defect uh, peaks. And uh, from the ID over IG, we are find out, finding out the, you know, amount, uh, the quantity of the defect present in the sample. And we found it actually correlates with the DMI. Uh, and then in order to, you know, further uh, strengthen this, we have also done the spin uh, mixing, uh, sorry, spin pumping experiment. And we found the spin mixing conductance. And you can see the spin mixing conductance as, as this uh, was found out from the, you know, effective damping as a function of the, you know, inverse of the permaloy layer thickness at different uh, sputtering pressure. And from here, we found out the, the spin mixing conductance and you already have the DMI constant and they actually scale very nicely. And they also scale nicely with the defect density. So uh, this actually clearly proves that this is actually originating from the extrinsic spin orbit coupling from the defects. And here this sp3 distortion occurs due to uh, an impurity or defect that can lead to large increase in spin orbit coupling, which was predicted long time back in this PRL paper, uh, which can also happen by hydrogenation, fluorination, adatoms. In this case, this is because of the ion bombardment from the, you know, during the sputtering. So uh, after that, we wanted to study that uh, whether, because in this case, we studied the, you know, everything in the thicker regime, but we wanted to see if we go to slightly thinner regime, can we also have the Rashpa effect? And that was only uh, one uh, goal. The other goal was to eliminate any heavy metal layer, because in this case, we had a tantalum layer on the other side of the ferromagnetic layer. So that could have given some amount of DMI. People could question it. So in this case, we want to eliminate 
any possibility and we were having a you know graphene single layer graphene ferromagnet and an oxide so that uh, no possibility of spurious or extrinsic you know dmi can and appear in here so uh, so we again procured high quality cvd from graphenia uh, cvd grown uh, single layer graphene from graphenia and we grew uh, cobalt iron boron with 1.5 3 4 and 6 nanometer and here we actually quantified the defect density uh, from this expression and this is also the crystallite size and you can see the the raman peaks are there and of course the single layer graphene part is is nicely shown here so we again did the bls experiment here and you can see delta f is much higher in this case and you can see the dispersion frequency versus k without dmi and with dmi uh, they have clear differences and we can see the delta f as a function of k giving rise to a you know reasonably high value of dmi in this case so that the d as a function of one over cobalt iron boron thickness gives rise to a value higher than 100 microjoule per meter square which is uh, 1.5 times higher and that is to at a lower pressure so by tuning the pressure we could actually increase the dmi and the surface dmi that could be found out is to be 151 femtojoule per meter and we then uh, modeled the variation of the dmi as a function of the defect density and it shows an exponential increase and by using this empirical expression with the defect density we are able to uh, fit it and we found out that you know, at nd equals to zero that is without defect the d0 is extremely small so uh, that shows that the effect is primarily from the defect density but we also did uh, uh, you know investigation of the rashpa effect and found out the rashpa shift uh, from this expression to be only about 2.5 uh, micrometer inverse which is much smaller than the values generally reported uh, in the other case and uh, we also did the bls line width analysis from here the asymmetry in the line width also in, as a function of k also gives rise to the rashpa which gives rise to again 2.5 micrometer inverse okay so that gives rise to a very nice uh, correlation between the you know value obtained from the frequency as well as from the line width and we also did this uh, spin uh, pumping uh, measurement from the line width and we found there is a correlation so nine, uh, the last one I wanted to uh, show is the interfacial DMI in molybdenum disulfide and permalloy, uh, you know, heterostructure. And this is MOS2 was grown uh, by some other group using PLD with uh, this kind of parameters. And then permalloy and tantalum were grown on top of it by using DC magnetron sputtering. And uh, uh, sort of these are the Raman. And you can see the difference between this E2G1 and E1G peak. Uh, you know, shows uh, that this one is a two layer graph uh, MOS2 with about 22 centimeter inverse. And this one is three to four layer with about 24.6 uh, centimeter inverse. And we did the DMI experiment and we clearly see this shift, which is a signature of the DMI. And we did this uh, plot of delta F as a function of K. And from here, we found out a reasonably high DMI in this case. Of course, we are expecting some intrinsic DMI because molybdenum is slightly heavier metal than carbon. And here we found out the DS, the surface DMI, which actually, you know, sort of increases as a function of one over parmalar layer thickness. So uh, we did all these and correlated with the Raman experiment. And we found that this intrinsic spin orbit coupling in uh, molybdenum disulfide decreases with an increase in the number of layers. Hence, we expect a larger spin orbit coupling in two layer molybdenum disulfide as opposed to the three to four layer. But the XPS and Raman mapping shows the presence of high sulfur vacancies in three to four layer MOS2. And that is uh, due to the formation of the MOO3 species in case of three to four layer. And that gives rise to you know, higher extrinsic spin orbit coupling in the case of three to four layer and a higher value for the three to four layer, as you can see here. And because oxygen has a higher electronegativity than sulfur and that leads to the larger dmi and here we plot the you know the different non-magnetic layer and the surface dmi value two to two layer is giving minus 0.39 three to four layer is giving minus 0.61 graphene 0.19 platinum the best material so far is minus 1.7 tungsten and tantalum of the range of 0.25 and 0.2 so you can see 
Graphene is similar to tungsten and tantalum, whereas MOS2 is actually much better than this, uh, is, is actually reaching closer to platinum. So in summary, uh, we have studied pure screen current transport who has been pumping in uh, graphene ferromagnetic uh, heterostructure and found out the role of this spin pumping in the ultrafast demagnetization. We found a very high value of spin mixing conductance in the case of graphene uh, ferromagnetic layer interface. And our study will uh, generate new knowledge towards development of graphene based ultrafast spin devices. And finally, we found out the generation of defect induced extrinsic spin orbit coupling and the ensuing IDMI in graphene ferromagnetic layer thickness for the first time. Uh, just to show you that we have also recently obtained large DMI in case of ferromagnet WS2 heterostructure in collaboration with various uh, other you know, groups in Uppsala University, IIT Delhi and so on. Paper has just appeared. Uh, so with that, I would like to thank my group and uh, primarily these people, Shurya Narayan Panda, Avinash Chaurasia and Amrit Kumar Mandal who were involved in various works and Dr. P.K. Mudali from IIT Delhi in, in some of the work. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you so much for this excellent talk and giving overview of uh, various materials summarizing the uh, DMI in a very quantitative way. Uh, so thank you on behalf of everyone. Uh, now the uh, talk is open for discussion. So yeah, Professor Seki, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, thank you very much, Anjan. Very nice talk. Thank you. And I have a, uh, let me ask a basic question. So you defined, so surface the DMI, right. DS. Then you obtained DS from the linear fitting, right? Yes, yes. So did you, uh, do you have any uh, experience to get the bulk DMI for such a fitting? Yeah, I mean, in this case, you know, it is primarily happening at the interface. Yes. So that is why we are measuring the, you know, surface DMI or the interface DMI. Mm -hmm. But uh, we have never measured any bulk material like, you know, uh, multiferroics or anything which is showing bulk DMI. We do not have any experience of that. And I uh, don't even know whether the BLS would be a good measurement technique because we measure in the, you know, sort of, sort of demo pack geometry, which measure the surface spin waves. Uh, for that, we probably have to do another geometry, maybe forward volume or something. I'm not mm -hmm. sure about it. So right. uh, really, I don't know uh, how mm -hmm. to answer to this question because no experience at all. Okay. What I want to say is recently, so some material such as uh, cobalt gadolinium, cobalt ion gadolinium, that shows their bulk DMI due to the composition variation in their bulk. Right, if, right, right. Uh, if your technique is applicable for such a material, we may see some uh, contribution from the bulk DMI, I hope. I mean, we can definitely try and see. There is no harm in trying. Mm -hmm. to measure in the, even in the, because even if it is bulk, uh, the surface spin wave should show some, you know, uh, uh, imprint of that in the, uh, in the spin wave propagation, in the demolished back geometry. Okay. So probably we can get something, but we have to try actually. Okay. Thank you very much. Nice talk. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, is there any question from others? Yeah. Uh, Professor Moriyama, please. So I have now, you can now unmute. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I okay. can hear you. So I, I'm Takahiro from uh, uh, Kyoto University, Japan. I, I have one question. I probably missed your, uh, some of the slides, but uh, have you measured the uh, uh, magnetization of the palm alloy, the MS? Yes, yes, we did, we did uh, measure. So you don't have any uh, uh, dead layer between uh, at the interface? Um, yeah, uh, as I said, uh, if I just show you, I don't have the formula value, but here you can see it is mm -hmm. a cobalt iron value. And you can see that uh, when you have so, a singular graphene cobalt iron boron, the value of magnetization is slightly lower than when you do not have uh, the underlay, graphene underlayer. Uh, so that could be because some uh, contribution of dead layer could be there. But we uh, explained it in terms of, you know, uh, induced moment in the carbon atoms. 
in an anti parallel direction which is reducing the uh, the magnetization but uh, you are right there can be some dead layer formation we have seen it in in uh, heavy metal like tungsten or tantalum cobalt iron boron or formula mm -hmm. the dead layer formation is very much evident so see, this could be there also okay so you take into account this uh, uh, variation uh, when you estimate all the parameters like uh, absolutely EMI absolutely and, uh, we do okay. measure all this ms and everything and you know insert the correct values for estimating dmi okay okay thank you very much um yeah i just have a follow up question uh, just in case uh, you assume that the, there may be a dead layer then how the dmi will happen because it will kind of suppress the dmi isn't it it will it will somewhat suppress the dmi you are right uh, so i mean we don't know what is the intrinsic because there is no calculation actually what what should hmm. be the you know theoretical value okay uh, so there is no uh, i mean we have been talking to various theoreticians for the calculation of interfacial dmi in this case uh, but we haven't been able to find out so then only we could actually uh, you know sort of uh, find out the difference but uh, you are right if dead layer is a dominant then we would not see any dmi so dead layer is probably not that dominant and that is why we uh, yes. estimated or we explained this in terms of you know an induced moment uh, in the anti parallel yeah. direction so, as I mean, opposed induced to moment the is the yes induced moment uh, explanation sounds more reasonable because sounds more reasonable but these are all between carbon and yeah. exactly but these are all like you see we cannot really measure it there so unless and until we really mm -hmm. probe it uh, the individual layer dependent phenomena then only we should be able to you know tell it better Yes, yes. Um, there are more questions, but unfortunately, we have to move on to the next talk. We are already twelve minutes delayed, and we have just very tight schedule of lunch time. Yeah, so, yeah, Ravi yeah. and Pranab, I am sorry, I apologize to you, uh, but I would request Professor Anjan Barman to join tomorrow during poster session in the frame virtual discussion room. We have created a very dedicated discussion room. So please uh, join and uh, you can discuss and ask your questions. So now I like to just quickly share uh, my screen uh, to show the uh, memento. Uh, Professor Borman, very kind involvement in the whole Indo-Japan series of uh, activities. I don't know why it's not showing. Let me. I think my internet has also some issues. Okay, finally. So uh, I, will, I will read it. Uh, the Indo Japan WhatsApp on Interface Phenomena for Spin Tonics, IJW IPS, uh, jointly organized by NICER and IMR. Take immense pleasure in presenting this plaque to of Sanjan Mormon from SN Post National Center for Basic Sciences. Uh, in appreciation for being a valuable speaker to give a lecture on ultra fast. Spin dynamics and spin waves in 2D material ferromagnetic heterostructure. So, thank you, Professor Barman, for your excellent talk. Thank and you so much. I would request again that tomorrow you please join the uh, discussion uh, room in the frame, okay? Uh, okay because there are more you. questions and uh, people would like to definitely interact with you. Definitely. Okay, so we move on uh, to the next talk uh, by Professor Takeshi Seki. I think. Uh, he does not need any introduction after all the inauguration session, but just for people who have joined later, Professor Takeshi Seki is working as associate professor in the group of Professor Koki Takanasi at the Institute for Material Research at Tokyo University in Japan. Uh, he is working on various things and has been very, very successful in many, many interesting spin tonics topics. And today he is going to present on large anti-symmetric interlayer exchange coupling. So, uh, Takeshi, please uh, begin your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tabanka. So nice introduction. So my name is Seki from IMR Tohoku University. So today I'm going to talk about the large unsymmetric interlayer exchange coupling. And so this is a bit related to the previous Anjan's talk. So unsymmetric, unsymmetric interaction between two ferromagnetic layers uh, separated by the non-magnetic layer. And this work was done in collaboration with many researchers. And he is the main player for this study. 
Hiroto Masuda. He is our PhD course student. And we are collaborating with uh, Yon Chan Lao, Professor Yon Chan Lao. He has moved to the CAS in China and also collaborate with Koki Takanashi. And Yuta Yamane, he is a theoretician for to construct the model for this uh, anti-symmetric interlayer exchange coupling. And we are uh, collaborating with uh, NIMS researchers, uh, Raj Kumar Modak, uh, Indian postdoc, and also Ken Chuchida, he is one of the invited speaker of uh, this uh, workshop. They helped us to prepare the same film. And so Junichi Ieda, he is a theoretician to uh, so help us to understand the phenomenological uh, physics of this phenomena. And Shinsuke Fukami, he is a professor in uh, Liek of Tohoku University, and he helped us to measure the anomalous hole effect. All right, so uh, today I like to talk these contents. First, I will briefly uh, introduce the general uh, introduction of uh, interlayer exchange coupling, especially that this is a symmetric interlayer exchange coupling, as you know. And uh, after that, I will uh, introduce the new interlayer exchange coupling, that is anti symmetric interlayer exchange coupling. And I sh uh, introduce our uh, previous studies on the, our recent study. And finally, I would like to share our recent demonstration of perpendicular magnetization switching induced by the in-plane magnetic field. So this anti-symmetric anti interlayer exchange coupling. All right, so let me start from the history of spintronics. Uh, so uh, many researchers understand what is bone of spintronics. That is the discovery of giant magnet resistance, GMR in 1988, so by uh, Professor Albert Feld group and uh, Professor Peter Grunberg group uh, separately. And in this uh, giant magnetic resistance effect, by applying the magnetic field to the trilayer structure or multilayer structure consisting of ion field magnetic layers and separated by the chromium non-magnetic layer, and with increasing the magnetic field, as you can see, we can uh, get uh, a huge resistance change due to the change of the magnetization configuration. And in order to observe this giant magnetic resistance effect, we need to get, they, they needed to get the uh, anti-parallel alignment of two ion, uh, ion uh, layers. And they, in order to do so, so they need to use the interlayer action coupling that was discovered in 1986. That means interlayer exchange coupling is a basis of the discovery of giant magnetic resistance effect. This is a uh, experimental report uh, by Peter Grunberg's group by using the BLS. They observed the exchange coupling mode originating from the antiferromagnetic coupling. And this is the first report to show the existence of the interlayer exchange coupling in ion chromium uh, layer structure. And thanks to this interlayer exchange coupling, as I said, we can get the antiferromagnetic antiferromagnetically aligned two ion layers. And with increasing or decreasing the magnetic field, we can get the saturating uh, saturated uh, magnetic configuration that is a parallel alignment. And uh, simultaneously, we obtain, we observe the resistance change like this. After the discovery of uh, giant magnetic resistance effect uh, together with the interlay action coupling, so there are many, uh, many researchers have focused on the investigation of interlay action coupling by changing the uh, material systems. This is a very famous paper reported by Stuart Parking Group. They investigated the cobalt based multilayer structure and they observed the oscillation of the saturation field. Saturation field is proportional to the strength of the interlayer exchange coupling. Therefore, they observed the uh, oscillatory behavior of the interlayer exchange coupling 
by changing the, in this case, a lucidium layer thickness. And this is a, a, something like a RKK1 interaction. And so they, uh, this is a table reported by Stuart Parking. So he investigated, actively investigated the many material system. And so they, uh, he uh, found, uh, so many material, many non-magnetic layer showed the uh, interaction coupling by combination with uh, the cobalt ferromagnetic layer. And in the cobalt uh, layer, uh, cobalt ferromagnetic layer system, copper, lucenium, lithium, those are the famous materials showing the interlayer exchange coupling. Especially lithium shows a strong interlayer exchange coupling by combining with the cobalt. And the strength and energy of the interlayer exchange coupling is expressed as like this the product of the exchange coupling energy and the inner product of. Uh, two uh, magnetic uh, moment in the two ferromagnetic layer. And if we change the order of this M1 and M2, so no change in the sign. Therefore, we can say this is a symmetric interior exchange coupling. And one may uh, think uh, probably uh, this interior exchange coupling is a bit old research topic, but we don't think so. Recently, so we observed this interlay exchange coupling with the spin hole material, such as the iridium doped copper. In, in the case of the spin hole material, we can get the interlay exchange coupling. That is a very good information for the anti, anti, uh, antiferromagnetic spintronics. Therefore, still, this interlay exchange coupling is a hot topic, uh, hot research topic, I think. And so I uh, briefly introduced the uh, history and the concept of the interlay action coupling. And as I said, by utilizing this sy symmetric interlay action coupling and antiferromagnetic coupling is induced at a specific layer thickness, and we can get the uh, synthetic antiferromagnetic structure by utilizing the symmetric interlay action coupling. And this topic is different from the uh, symmetric, uh, symmetric interaction coupling. That is an anti-symmetric uh, interaction, anti-symmetric interaction coupling. In the previous talk given by the Anjan Balman, that is an interfacial DMI. That means the inversion, uh, special inversion breaking at the interface. But if we have the, uh, such a breaking, uh, in, uh, symmetry breaking along the same film, uh, along the film plane, uh, such a lack of the in-plane symmetry, uh, a lack of the in-plane spatial inversion symmetry uh, breaking, that induces the uh, anti-symmetric interaction coupling. This is a something uh, something like a cartoon explains the anti-symmetric interaction coupling. If we have the, this structure, uh, which uh, which shape or composition. A gradient along the uh, in-plane direction that breaks the uh, inversion symmetry. And we uh, can expect the existence of the D vector. This is a similar to the uh, DMI vector for the interfacial DMI. And this D vector induces a canted, stru canted magnetic structure between two magnetization of two ferromagnetic layer through the uh, interaction coupling. And so finally, we may have the chiral magnetic structure due to the, this anti-symmetric interaction coupling. That is a concept of anti-symmetric interaction coupling. And this anti-symmetric interaction coupling has firstly been reported by two research groups, uh, 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 University of Cambridge and also University of Mainz, uh, Matthias Kluai group. And the, this is a, a report uh, by so my Mainz group. They measured anomalous hole effect uh, for the platinum, cobalt, platinum, lucenium, platinum, cobalt, platinum uh, multi-layer structure, uh, which have has a perpendicular magnetization and antiferromagnetic coupling. And by applying the uh, out of plane magnetic field together with a small in plane magnetic field, 
they observe the loop shift of the anomal solar effect by applying the implement field. And the direction of the loop shift strongly depends on the implant magnetic field direction. And they uh, concluded, so this loop shift is attributable to the existence of this antisymmetric interaction coupling because this antisymmetric interaction coupling uh, leads to the canted magnet structure. And this canted magnet structure, and so this implant magnetic field, this implant magnetic field sometimes help to switch the magnetization and sometimes hinder the switching. Therefore, the loop shift appears. And uh, so in this study, they use oblique sputtering without subscribed rotation. Therefore, they considered uh, the sickness in homogeneity is induced. That is uh, one of the possible origin for the implant inversion symmetry breaking. However, the, the, as you can see, the uh, loop shift is quite small and the mechanism of this antisymmetric interaction coupling is still under debate and so has not been fully understood yet. Therefore, we consider we need to do more systematic experiment investigation that is uh, indispensable to understand the origin of antisymmetric interaction coupling. That is the motivation for this study. Uh, in this study, we uh, try to elucidate the mechanism of antisymmetric interaction coupling using the double wedged sample like this, also single wedge sample. And we prepared the double wedge sample of platinum, cobalt, iridium, cobalt, platinum. In this structure, so bottom cobalt layer and the iridium special layer have a wedge shape. And so, as I said, so together with double wedge sample, we also prepare the single wedge sample, iridium single wedge sample and cobalt, bottom cobalt single wedge sample. And by utilizing these samples, we did the systematic investigation. All right. And uh, first, I would like to show the basic magnetic property and transport property for the, this double wedge sample without applying the in plane field. We just applied the perpendicular out of plane field to check the Almar solar effect. Sorry. And uh, so these are the results of the Almar solar effect with a sample of uh, iridium layer thickness of 0.47 nanometer and 0.87 nanometer blue one. And uh, this is the Almar solar loops. That means this correspond uh, the resistance. Uh, correspond to the net magnetization of two cobalt layers. And a little red curve shows a small residual resistance at zero magnetic field. That means this corresponds to the small uh, remanent magnetization. And with increasing the magnetic field or decreasing the magnetic field, uh, so resistance gradually increases and saturated at a, a high magnetic field. Therefore, we uh, we see uh, this uh, 0.47 nanometer sample uh, shows the anti-ferromagnetic uh, anti uh, coupling between two cobalt layers. On the other hand, blue one, uh, 0.87 nanometer sample, that shows a high remanent magnetization. There are two cobalt layers in this device, uh, ferromagnetically coupled, and so this is a saturation field as a function of the layer thickness. And high saturation field corresponds to the antiferromagnetic coupling and low uh, saturation field uh, means uh, ferromagnetic coupling. Therefore, this oscillatory behavior was observed in our device. And as, uh, that means our sample shows a uh, nicely controlled uh, so interaction coupling. And then uh, we uh, tried to observe the antisymmetric interaction coupling by applying the additional implant magnetic field. In this case, we applied it the 15 millitesla implant magnetic field along the, uh, and so the field angle of this additional magnetic field is defined as uh, phi. And by changing this angle phi, we measure the anomalous solar loop. And this is a uh, 
represented result uh, measured at the uh, uh, angle phi or minus 60 degree. And by applying the magnetic field, implant magnetic field or minus 50 millijester. So and mass holes loop uh, shows a shift along the negative direction. And on the other hand, if we apply the positive plus 50 millijester, and mass hole loop shift uh, to the positive, uh, uh, positive field. And this is another so signature for the uh, existence of uh, antisymmetric interaction coupling. And we also plotted the, uh, this is a polar plot of the switching field. And uh, you can see the unidirectional behavior and the angle uh, phi where the uh, largest uh, loop shift was observed is so defined as phi AS. Also, this is a switching field as a function of the phi. And the cosine uh, phi behavior was observed and we are fitted by the cosine function. And so most important finding is very large loop shift that is about uh, 15 millitesla was observed. This is a one order of magnitude larger than the previous values. And also this uh, behavior was uh, uh, reproduced by the numerical calculation by assuming these parameters. In this case, we consider the D vector along the X direction. This means so spatial uh, inversion, uh, symmetry, uh, inversion symmetry breaking exists along the Y direction. And that leads to the X directional D vector. And finally, we got the uh, candidate structure along the Z direction. And this is a switching field as a function, a switching field shift as a function of the reason the thickness. You can see uh, oscillatory, uh, uh, oscillate, oscillation like behavior was observed. And this is very analogous to the, uh, that for the uh, saturation field. Therefore, we consider there uh, might be exist, might exist a correlation between the antisymmetric interreaction coupling and the symmetric interreaction coupling. However, at present, we have no uh, clear explanation about the uh, elysium layer sickness dependence of the phi AS. And uh, uh, phi AS changes gradually like this with changing the layer sickness. However, it is difficult to understand these tendencies and the origin of this behavior. We need to uh, carefully consider more about to explain this behavior. All right, and at present, so uh, we found the uh, double wedge sample shows a large uh, anti-symmetric interaction coupling. And what uh, is the uh, main player for uh, such a large interaction, anti-symmetric interaction coupling? We also uh, examined the loop shift for single wedge sample and non wedge sample. And uh, it is a single wedge sample and the bottom cobalt single wedge sample shows a large uh, uh, loop shift like this. And uh, however, however, so bottom cobalt single wedge sample shows a larger loop shift compared with the uh, elysium wedge single wedge sample. Therefore, uh, wedge shape in cobalt layer more, is more effective to get the large a, a anti-symmetric exchange coupling. And also we found, so in the case of the non-wage sample, the so switching field shift is quite small and hardly dependent on the illusion layer thickness. Therefore, in order to uh, achieve the uh, large uh, inter anti-symmetric interaction coupling, so wedge shape uh, structure is effective. And we also constructed the phenomenological model to understand our uh, experimental result by uh, solving the coupled LLG equation for two uh, ferromagnetic layers, which are uh, antiferromagnetic coupled. And we got the equation for the crystal field for the switching. And Z direction is out of plane direction, and Y direction is in plane direction. 
And therefore, the switching field in Z direction also contains the cross, uh, uh, cross term like this, and that uh, determined by the uh, strength of the uh, D uh, unsymmetric interaction coupling and also uh, exchange coupling through the uh, symmetric interaction coupling. Therefore, switching field is uh, determined by the parameter of uh, DAIAC over uh, anti ferromagnetic uh, interaction coupling, like this. And so these are the key parameter to uh, key parameter to determine the magnitude of the switching field shift. And also we found, so uh, from this equation, so we understand uh, by applying the, if we get the large anti-symmetric interaction coupling without applying the outer plane magnetic field, only by applying the in-plane magnetic field, we can switch the out of plane, uh, out of plane magnetization. And then we try to demonstrate that. And this is a, a demonstration of perpendicular magnetization switching induced by the in-plane magnetic field by utilizing the by a double wedge sample. And uh, so these are the loop shift observed at the uh, in-plane angle phi or 45 degree by applying the uh, minus 80 millitesla and plus 80 millitesla. So you can see it's a uh, clear loop shift. And on the other hand, in the case of the minus 45 degree, the loop shift is quite small. And at this condition, at 45 degree, if we uh, apply only in-plane magnetic field, and so positive in-plane magnetic field and minus, uh, minus 80 millitesla, we can uh, switch the uh, perpendicular magnetization like this. On the other hand, if we set so the phi at minus 45 degree, no switching occurs. Therefore, so this is a demonstration by utilizing the anti-symmetric interaction coupling. And so we uh, can switch the perpendicular magnetization by just applying the in-plane magnetic field. Okay, and so actually, so uh, in the case of the interfacial DMI, so some paper already reported, so two-dimensional color magnetic structure that is uh, useful to realize something like uh, out, of, out of plane, in plane uh, combined element like this, or since, uh, synthetic nail scamium. And so actually, so if we can control this uh, large anti-symmetric interaction coupling, that uh, might uh, become the way to manipulate the three-dimensional artificial magnetic structure, magnetic textures. That is a, uh, one of the uh, promising way for this, uh, for using uh, this large anti-symmetric interaction coupling. All right, so this is the conclusion of my today's talk. Now, thank you very much for kind attention. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Takeshi, for this excellent talk. Uh, very interesting results. Uh, so I clap uh, on behalf of everyone. I al already, Oswin has a question. Oswin, please uh, uh, unmute and ask. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, Ashwin san. Oh, yes. Hello, Seki san. Uh, thank Hi. you for the nice talk. Thank you. Uh, so, I have uh, one question that you have used a wedge shape sample to break the symmetry, inversion symmetry. Yes. Uh, yes. But if you look at the device dimension, it's only a few microns. So, yes. on the device, it must be extremely small. Yes. <laughs> so, so, how yeah, does this still work? That is a very nice talk, a nice, a nice point, nice question. Actually, so if we calculate the so how uh, uh, the gradient of the askness gradient for e one device, that is just 
uh, one less than one atomic layer for each device. That is quite small. Uh, at present, we have no clear idea. So why such a small sickness gradient is effective to break the uh, inversion symmetry? But uh, actually, so we have no clear idea. But that is a yes experimental uh, fact. Of, so we uh, actually so we increase the sickness gradient, and at that time, so we can uh, no we reduce the sickness gradient more. At that time, so we uh, observe the reduction of uh, anti-symmetry interaction coupling. That means that it uh, suggests their uh, actually the sickness gradient is uh, uh, playing the important role for uh, breaking the invasion, spatial invasion symmetry. Okay, uh, thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, uh, Pranav has a question. Pranav, please unmute. Uh, Hello. Hi, nice yes. to meet you. Hi. Hello, <laughs> Professor Seki. So I was wondering uh, when you said switching, uh, yeah. which layer it is switching uh, the, 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 in this wedge shape? The, because there are two magnetic layers. Uh, both. Both are switching. Both. Actually, so both layer uh, anti ferromagnetic couple. And so actually, this is a not uh, fully compensated set. That means a very magnetic like structure. Therefore, so we can get uh, so, uh, net magnetization, and uh, so non-zero net magnetization. Therefore, so if we apply the in-plane magnetic field, so we can switch like this, like this, or uh, this one, like this. Oh, this okay, okay. Also, yeah, one can, uh, it's like a one uh, ferromagnet, and that's why you have a G. Okay, okay, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I have one question. Uh, so mm -hmm. what is the basic difference between asymmetric uh, uh, like exchange, interlayer exchange and this uh, anti-symmetric? So asymmetric in the sense of BMI and this one. Asymmetric means, uh, yes, uh, yes, that is a structure. Structure means uh, if you have the interface, that leads to the so breaking yeah. the inversion symmetry. That structure, some someone says that is asymmetric structure. But anti-symmetric is a completely different from the asymmetric. Anti-symmetric is uh, something like a, uh, if we change the order, that also leads to the change in the sign. That is something like the mathematical form. So change the order means uh, from ferro to anti-ferro kind of thing? No. Uh, mm, what type yeah. of order? The, that means uh, if you write the, uh, okay, this is, this is good. Just a moment. All right. So this is a symmetric one. This is an inner product. Therefore, if we can change, if we change the order of M1 and M2, no change in the uh, sign. This is all inner product. This is about cross product. If you change the M1 and M2, so M1 times M2 equal minus M2 times M1. You have the minus. That is the reason why we call this is an anti-symmetric interaction couple. And this unsymmetric uh, be, uh, characteristics leads to the, uh, by changing the, uh, uh, if we switch the two magnetic layer, we can change the also uh, observe the, uh, uh, no, uh, in this case, uh, yeah. O also uh, leads to the, if we change the magnetization direction, this also change the, uh, uh, science the canted state. Therefore, we can, uh, again, we can switch the magnetization by uh, ma ma magnetic field repeatedly. 
Okay, I mean, uh, maybe we can discuss tomorrow during the poster session um, that time. Um, maybe very quick question by Professor Borman and then we move to the next talk. Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Seki, for the nice talk. A uh, quick question uh, that, uh, do you think that the spatial layer will also have a role to play here? Because for the synthetic uh, antiferromagnet, symmetric mm -hmm. interlayer exchange, we know that, uh, for example, iridium has a higher IEC than ruthenium. So you have already mm -hmm. chosen iridium to make it probably stronger. So, but can you also choose some other material to make it even stronger? Uh, yes, uh, that is a neat, good question. So actually, so we have not tried to any other material. And actually, so the magnitude of the, this anti-symmetric interaction coupling depends on the, yes, uh, strength of uh, this uh, anti-symmetric uh, D vector and also uh, exchange coupling strength uh, energy. Therefore, by changing the, this exchange coupling energy, we we have a chance to enhance the uh, this asymmetric interaction coupling more. Right. But yes, also uh, we think the strong spin of interaction is required for uh, so this time. Anyway, so the combination of this uh, D vector and the exchange coupling strings that is a key par parameters for this asymmetric interaction coupling. Okay. Okay, uh, I think the volunteers, uh, anybody has a quick question? There is a, uh, yeah. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Um, uh, hi, uh, very nice talk. Actually, I want to know um, how you calculated the um, interlayer exchange coupling. Um, that is the uh, formula, what I know is uh, MS into T into um, H exchange. But uh, in uh, in case of T, means thickness of ferromagnet, what you are multiplying, like uh, for cobalt, it is point, uh, for your case, it is 0.5. So you are multiplying 0.5 or um, total for two cobalt, one nanometer. Sorry, pardon me. Uh, hello. Uh, I think Swati, this discussion we can have tomorrow, okay? <laughs> yes, sir. Let's move on. So uh, Takeshi, could you please stop sharing your screen? I like to share my screen. Okay, so uh, I like to now present this uh, digital memento to you for your nice talk. So we take the immense pleasure in presenting this plaque to Professor Takeshi Seki from IMR uh, in appreciation for being a valuable speaker to give a lecture on large anti-symmetric interlayer exchange coupling. So thank you again so much for thank your you. very nice talk. Really appreciate it. Uh, as usual, always your talk is so nice to hear. So we move on to the next speaker, that is Professor Ashwin Tulapurkar from IIT Bombay. Ashwin, could you please uh, share your screen? Uh, and I just say a few words about uh, Professor Tulapurkar. He is a full professor in IIT Bombay in the electrical engineering department. He is working on various interesting spintronics topics. And uh, I think Oswin also has a very strong Japanese connections. He was in uh, Japan for uh, quite some time and did fantastic work. And today he is going to talk about inverse of voltage control magnetic anisotropy effect and investigation in graphene ferromagnetic structures. So looking forward to your talk, Oswin. All yours. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Shobankar. And I would like to also thank the organizers uh, of this conference, uh, both from Indian side as well as Japanese side. Uh, uh, for inviting sorry, me. I'm interrupting. Uh, your video is not on. Oh. Okay. Uh, can you see me now? Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Okay, so today I'm going to talk about the inverse of uh, VCMA effect and some investigation of uh, VCMA effect in graphene ferromagnetic uh, structures. Okay, so my slides are so not moving. Okay, 
So this is going to be the outline of my talk. I will you know, start with a brief introduction uh, to control of magnetization. I will talk about the reciprocal effects uh, in spectronics, uh, how we can measure these effects. I will talk about uh, reciprocal of VCMA effect. And then I will also talk about finally, uh, some possible VCMA effects, which we have observed in graphene ferromagnetic system. Okay, so, so this is uh, well known to you know, all of us uh, that the dynamics of magnetization is given by LLG equation. So on the left hand side, we have rate of change of magnetization. On the right hand side, uh, we have precession and uh, damping. And of course, then we also, if we have a spin current system, then we also have a spin transfer torque term. And by using this spin transfer torque term, we can either suppress the damping or can enhance the damping. And then by using this, we, uh, we can switch the magnetization. Okay, so essentially what we need is a uh, spin current uh, so that we can control the direction of magnetization. And there are various ways by which we can produce spin current. For example, if you have a magnetic tunnel junction and if you simply apply a voltage across it, uh, then the current which flows through it is spin polarized. And then this spin polarized current is incident on the free layer and then we can control the magnetization of the free layer. Now, other possibility is that we can use spin dependent CPEG effect. Uh, so, which means that if you maintain the free layer and the pin tail at different temperatures, uh, then this temperature uh, gradient uh, gives rise to spin current, which is called as spin dependent CPEG effect. And again, we can use it uh, for controlling uh, directional magnetization. Uh, now, apart from that, uh, uh, the more popular ways are using uh, spin hall effect. So this is a cartoon of how this effect can be used. For example, if we have a heavy metal like platinum, and if we fabricate a tunnel junction on top of it, uh, then what we can do is when we want to switch magnetization, we can pass current between one and two. Uh, so the charge current which flows through platinum uh, creates spin current via spin hall effect. And then this spin current is incident on the free layer. And if you want to measure the magnetization of this system, then we can pass current between let's say one and three. And by using TMR effect, we can detect the state of the memory. Now, uh, apart from that, we could also use spin nurse effect. Uh, so instead of passing a charge current through the heavy metal, we could also pass a heat current. And then this heat current could be converted into spin current by the spin nurse effect. So that's also one possibility which has been investigated. Uh, now, other methods of uh, controlling magnetizations are by strain. So in this case, uh, we can use the magnetoelastic effect. And this essentially can change the anisotropy. And by using this effect, one can switch the magnetization from uh, top to bottom and so on. Okay, but apart from uh, these effects, uh, a new effect was uh, you know, explored a few years back. And this is called as voltage control of magnetic anisotropy or in short VCMA. So this effect was shown uh, first time in this paper in 2007 by using a liquid electrolyte gate. And after that, uh, the, uh, the group of Professor Suzuki uh, showed this effect uh, in the case of magnetic tunnel junction structures. So this is a figure from this paper. Uh, so in this uh, paper, they fabricated a very thin layers of iron uh, and on the top, we have a layer of MGO, and then they applied electric field or the voltage difference across this uh, layer. And simultaneously, they also measured uh, the magnetization hysteresis loop by using uh, Kerr electricity. And <clears throat> then, as a function of this voltage, uh, they, showed, they saw that this hysteresis loop can be changed. So, this essentially means that uh, by applying uh, voltage, uh, we can change the anisotropy of the ferromagnet. And then this effect was explained in terms of uh, what happens at the interface uh, between uh, the ferromagnet and the insulator. So essentially, we could have some transfer of charges from you know, one orbital to other orbital, and such a transfer can change the anisotropy. Okay, so this is how this uh, effect was explained. Okay, so now if we have this effect, then what we also need to do is we need to include this effect in the LLG equation. So this is the LLG equation without the spin current now. And here we have an effective magnetic field. So in the effective magnetic field, typically we only include the external field and let's say the in-plane and out of pin anisotropy. And now if we apply a voltage across the insulator layer, 
then we can change uh, this factor of h perpendicular. Okay, so this is the same effect, and then we need to include this in the energy equation. Uh, so soon after, uh, the same group also showed that this effect can be used for a coherent control of magnetization. So here they applied an oscillating voltage. And by using uh, the spin top diode effect, uh, they could show that uh, this oscillating voltage induces oscillating anisotropy and which can excite a resonance uh, in this structure. Okay, so, so that was kind of an introduction. And now we know that in spintonics, we have various kinds of effects and all these effects also have reciprocal effects. And these reciprocal effects have also found uh, good applications. So for example, uh, when we talk about spin transfer torque, uh, the reciprocal of this is spin pumping. Okay, now this is shown by a cartoon here. Uh, so essentially, uh, if we have injected current, then this fan can rotate. And if the fan rotates, then it can create a uh, current. Okay? So this is the inverse of spin transfer uh, torque and spin pumping. Now, apart from that, if you look at the spin hole effect, uh, we also have inverse spin hole effect. So in the spin hole effect, we pass charge current and we generate spin currents in the perpendicular direction. Now, if you uh, take the inverse of the situation, if you have a spin current uh, coming in, then that spin current can generate charge current. Okay. So this is the inverse uh, spin hole effect. So we always have these kind of pairs of uh, inverse effects. So the forward effect and inverse effect, for example, we have spin spec effect. As inverse, we have spin pelter effect and so on. Okay, so, okay, so now the question is that we have VCM effect. So uh, what would be the inverse of this effect? Okay, so this is what we wanted to investigate. And uh, for the investigation, uh, we, we have done some experiments. Uh, so what we did was we prepared a stack, uh, which is shown here. And this stack was obtained from uh, AIST Sukupa. So you can see that in the stack, uh, there's a layer of cobalt FeB with uh, thickness of one nanometer and a small layer of COFE. And then we have an MGO layer of 2.4 nanometer thickness and then a capping there. So this is not a typical stack, which is used for MTGs. Uh, this has only a free layer, okay? So there is no fixed layer. Okay, so when we had this stack, uh, as a first step, we measured the ferromagnetic resonance in this system by using ESR spectrometer, which was operating at about 9.45 gigahertz. And then we could fit the spectrum uh, to the expected from LLG equation. And we found out that uh, the damping was about 0.03, and it had a perpendicular anisotropy of 400 rho state. So essentially, this stack was not really in plane magnetized, uh, but out of plane anisotropy was uh, very highly reduced compared to uh, what we'll have in a thin layer. Uh, now, with this stack, we uh, we fabricated pillars uh, which were quite elongated. So we made pillars of dimension 3 micron by 80 micron, typically. So this is the pillar shown here. So only I have shown here a film magnetic layer and the insulator layer. And then we made top and bottom contacts. So this is what I will now call as a port one. Then on the top of that, we deposited a SiO2 layer about 100 nanometer uh, thickness. And then on the top, we deposited a waveguide. Okay. So this is what I will call as now a port two. And then we carried out the measurements by using a network analyzer. And all the experiments uh, we carried out by applying magnetic field along uh, different directions. Okay, so which also I will describe. Okay, so before going forward, but we need to make sure that this sample shows a uh, VCM effect. So for this reason, uh, we simply use this port two and measured the, uh, the reflection coefficient uh, in this port two. And so this is one of the typical spectrum, uh, I think at four gigahertz. So you can see that at a particular value of magnetic field, this shows the resonance. Uh, this shows that we have a nice uh, ferromagnetic layer inside it. And then uh, we have this port one. So now we use the port one to apply a DC voltage uh, to this sample. So as we applied uh, different uh, DC voltages, we saw that uh, the peak position uh, shifts in magnetic field okay? and the shift is uh, linear. And from this shift, we can estimate so this shift essentially tells us that we have a VCM effect in this sample. 
And from this shift, we can estimate what would be the BCMA coefficient. We can also estimate various parameters like H perpendicular and so on. So we found out that the H perpendicular remains almost the same. Uh, there is slight increase in the damping and the VCMA coefficient was about 100 femtojoule per uh, foot meter. Okay, so now our aim was to measure the inverse effect and the way we can do it is the following. So now we, have, now we have this kind of a device which is connected to two ports and now what we can do is we can measure the scattering parameters S12 and S21. So let's look at the meaning of S21 parameter first. So when we measure S21, uh, what we are going to do is we are going to apply an oscillating voltage to port 1 and we are going to detect the response in port 2. Okay. So now if I apply oscillating voltage to port 1, uh, I am essentially uh, apply, apply, uh, I am essentially changing the anisotropy also periodically and this excites uh, FMR in this layer. And when this magnetization starts to oscillate, uh, this port 2 can pick up the signal uh, inductively. Okay, so that's what is written here, that in S21 measurement, we have a direct VCMA effect. So which means that as a step one, we have excitation of magnetization by VCMA effect. And in step two, we have inductive detection at port 2. Now, if you look at the measurement of S12, uh, what we are doing is we're applying an oscillating voltage to port 2. And then we are measuring the signal at port 1. Now this uh, measurement essentially tells us about the inverse VCMA effect. So the way it works is the following. If we apply an oscillating voltage to port 2, this creates an oscillating current in this waveguide. And then we have excitation of magnetization by the hosted magnetic field. And now this oscillating magnetic field creates a voltage uh, in port 1. Now this is what is the inverse uh, VCMA effect. Okay. So this is uh, the experimental results uh, that we obtained. So in this case, the magnetic field was applied in the ZX plane. Okay. And we saw that this S12 and S21 spectra are symmetric uh, with respect to magnetic field. And also if we measure the amplitude of, uh, of amplitude of this S parameter, uh, then they show this kind of a behavior, which is zero at zero tick and anti degree and shows a peak in between. Okay, then we switched on to the other configuration uh, where the magnetic field was applied along YZ plane. Now in the YZ plane also, uh, we found out that S12 and S21 signal are kind of anti-symmetric. Okay, so here, here I have peak, then here I have dip and so on. Uh, but whatever is the case, uh, in the both the cases, we found out that if we invert the magnetization and if we invert the magnetic field, then S12 and S21 are safe. Okay, now, so this is what is called as uh, generalized consager reciprocity. Now, in this sample, uh, we have only one magnetic layer, so there is no spin transfer torque here. Uh, now, we could have some contribution from the hosted magnetic field, uh, which is generated when we pass currents and so on, uh, but this can be ruled out from the angular dependence. So, this dependence that I have showed you here, uh, this can be explained only by assuming uh, the inverse uh, VCMA effect. And the way we can understand this effect is the following. Uh, so whenever we apply electric field to the magnetic layer, uh, we can think of a thermodynamic potential, which is given by electric field multiplied by the magnetizations and this lambda is a constant. And if you take the derivative of this potential by magnetization, okay, we get effective field. Now this is what is VCMA effect. So in our case, uh, we really don't have such a three index uh, tensor, but we have a simple number lambda. So let's assume that this potential is simply Ez into Mz square. So if I take derivative by Mz, I get uh, the VCMA effect. And if I take the derivative by electric field, uh, then I get this uh, uh, the, uh, electric uh, displacement vector D. And now if I take the derivative of this by time, I get the current density. Okay, so I have the same thermodynamic potential. I can take derivative by magnetization or I can take derivative by electric field. So if I take derivative by electric field, then what we have is an inverse VCMA effect. So now I have this charge current generated. Okay. So now this is what is shown schematically in this diagram that whenever we have magnetization, which is oscillating, uh, this creates a charge current whose amplitude is uh, given by the expression here. And apart from that, we also have internal resistance of this uh, junction, which is a combination of a resistance 
and some capacitance in parallel. Okay, so yeah, one can also do the calculation of uh, this S21. It's not very uh, difficult to do. And essentially from this, we showed that uh, this angular dependence is what is expected. Now, if you think of this uh, inverse VCM effect, uh, we can also derive it from the dissipation arguments. So, so let's assume that we have only a single port and I have uh, this kind of a tunnel junction. Uh, and then I have a input uh, voltage wave and I have a reflected voltage wave. Now this voltage wave because of the VCM effect uh, induces FMR here and this gives us to an extra damping. So I need to also include this extra resistance or the extra impedance uh, in this model. And this extra impedance changes the reflected wave. Okay, so and that essentially is a VCMA effect. So uh, in fact, we can calculate this extra impedance and get the expression for VCMA effect. So, so the idea is that this extra impedance that I have, I can represent it by a voltage source uh, in such a way that I get the same reflected wave. Okay. So, so one can think of this as uh, the source of uh, inverse VCMA effect. So now, of course, there are uh, there could be some applications of this effect. For example, we can use it as a new proof for micro dynamics. Now, this inverse VCM effect could also affect spin wave propagation and domain wall motions and so on. Uh, if we take into account uh, the back action from the inverse uh, VCM effect. Okay, so I will now somewhat change gears and talk about uh, some kind of uh, VCM effects that we have observed in uh, graphene-based devices. So what we have here is a SI SI2 wafer on which we transfer graphene, uh, CVT graphene, which was obtained from graphenia. And on the top, we deposit uh, nickel FE, and then we made devices using that. So we, uh, we made devices and we measured the STFMR spectra on this device. So this is what we have obtained. So these are the spectra at different frequencies. So you can see that the DC voltage is actually quite small. Okay, it's only a few microvolt, uh, but you can see that there's a clear shift in the peak position as we change the frequency. So essentially, this is from the magnetic origin, and then you can fit these peaks to a symmetric part, an anti-symmetric part, from which you can uh, get parameters like uh, line width and the coefficient c1, c2, and so on. Uh, so this data is uh, we still have not analyzed completely, so I don't have the entire picture right now, uh, but uh, now, if you look at this frequency as a function of magnetic field, you can fit it to a Kettle's plot. And we found out that the H perpendicular is about 0.42 into 10 raised to 4 rho state. Uh, if you look at delta H, and if you plot as a function of frequency, and you can fit a straight line, uh, that gives us a damping parameter of 0.04. Okay, so this is fine. So in the next step, what we have done is we dope this graphene by using metalloporphyrins. So, so this is a porphyrin uh, molecule, and this can be doped by various metals like zinc, palladium, platinum, and so on. Uh, so what we did was, we, once we transferred the graphene, uh, we spin-coated porphyrin, and then we uh, baked the sample for some time. And after that, we deposited the nickel filler. And again, we did the STFMR measurement. So these are the measurements on the platinum-doped uh, porphyrin. Now you can see that the sig signal has actually reduced. Okay, so we were expecting some kind of enhancement, uh, but uh, to our dismay, uh, the signal is actually gone down. And so if you plot this, uh, so I have plotted here the shifted spectra so that we can see the signal clearly. So you can again see that the resonance structure changes uh, with the frequency. And again, we could fit it to the Kettle's law and we can get uh, the perpendicular isotopy and so on. And essentially what we found was that uh, the damping is enhanced when we uh, dope the sample. So when we dope it with uh, platinum doped uh, porphyrin, uh, the damping increases from 0 0.04 to about 0 0.05. Okay, but this was still, okay, nothing spectacular. Uh, so after that, what we have done is we applied a gate voltage uh, to this sample, actually both samples, uh, graphene and also porphyrin doped graphene. And in the case of graphene, we did not see any uh, change when we apply a bias gate voltage. Uh, but when we applied the gate voltage to the porphyrin doped graphene, we saw that uh, the resonance frequency shows a clear shift. Okay? And so this is uh, very similar to what we have in the same effect that we can change uh, the perpendicular anisotropy. 
So as before, yeah, we can do, uh, we can fit this data. And what we found is that uh, if we don't apply a gate voltage, uh, then the edge perpendicular is about 0.4 here. And then this can be changed to 0.6 by applying a positive voltage and point about 0.27 by applying a negative gate voltage. Okay, so, so this is how uh, the edge perpendicular is changing as we apply a gate voltage. And uh, apart from that, we also saw that the spectra also becomes somewhat broader and the damping parameter also increases quite a lot as we apply this gate voltage. Okay, but uh, so as I said, this data is something uh, we are still analyzing and uh, we have also done a Raman study and so on, which I have not really included here. Uh, but the essential point is that uh, we have some kind of a large VCMA effect. Okay, if we uh, dope this interface with uh, platinum doped porphyrin. Okay, so with this, uh, I would like to summarize my talk. Uh, in the first talk, uh, I have in the first part I talked about the inverse VCMA effect, uh, which we have detected by using this kind of a two-port measurement. So in fact, this is a very generic method by which we can always detect. Uh, a forward and reverse effect. Okay, so in fact, we have used this kind of uh, geometry. Uh, you want to show the reciprocity between the spin transfer torque and spin pumping and so on in our previous publication. And then we have used this concept to show now the inverse VCM effect. And this we could model by a current source in parallel with the internal resistance of this junction. And in the second part, I talked about you know that uh, if we have functionalized graphene interface with fluoromagnets, we can get uh, these same effects. Okay, so with this, uh, I would like to thank you for attention. I would like to thank all my collaborators. Uh, sorry, I didn't put their pictures here, but there are a lot of people who have worked on this, including the students from IIT Bombay. And for the first part, we have many collaborators from AIST Sukuba. So I would like to thank all of them. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Aswin, for this excellent talk, summarizing your very nice, interesting results. Uh, yeah, I see a few questions already. Uh, Takisi, on mute and ask. Hi, Shizan. Thank yeah, you very hi. much. Nice. Yes. And uh, so let me confirm the definition of inverse VCMA. Inverse VCMA means if you, ex if you, if you change the PMA, you may have the voltage, right? Uh, so, so we don't need to have a PMA. We change the anisotropy. Anisotropy, all right. So, so in in VCM effect, you are uh, you are changing uh, the anisotropy. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, in your experiment, you applied its uh, air set field, right, to observe the VC, uh, inverse VCMA. Uh, so, okay, so this is the, okay. so yeah, in, in the inverse VCMA, we apply Oersted field yes, yes, and yes. that creates uh, the oscillation of magnetization here. Oscillation the why why yeah. oscillation magnetization can change the uh, magnetic anisotropy? Oh, so no, it, it doesn't change magnetic anisotropy. So this oscillation of magnetization creates a charge current. So that, that's the inverse effect. Okay, so, so when this, uh, magnetization uh, is oscillating, uh -huh. we create a voltage here. Okay, and this uh -huh. voltage is what is the inverse VCMA. You said so the change of the anisotropy leads to the voltage. That is the inverse VCMA. I'm a bit confused. No, no, change of the anisotropy by the voltage is uh, the direct VCMA. Oh, yes. So, so you can think of uh, this experiment. Uh, so uh, this experiment. Uh, no, so this also, yeah, yeah. So this also is a demonstration of VCM effect. Uh, but here, what we are doing is we don't. Uh, we essentially apply an AC uh, electric field. Mm -hmm. So we use this effect to essentially excite the resonance. Okay. So we don't think in terms of. Uh, some kind of a shift in the anisotropy. Mm -hmm. oh. So when we want to think of inverse effect, it's better to think in terms of the AC effects rather than the DC effect. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. All right, uh, Pranab, please uh, unmute and 
hello 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 uh, hello i was wondering how did you apply this gate voltage in the graphene devices is it uh, also we, uh, back we have back gate voltage yeah yeah back gate so but isn't the, the device... thickness of the wafer being very high how is it effective mm. so the thickness of the wafer is 300 nanometer uh, but we are also applying voltages of the order of 30 volts Okay, if you look at the previous experiment, uh, the voltages were like uh, 0.5 volt or even lower. So because of the higher thickness, we have to apply a higher voltage. And so for example, uh, if you take graphene, uh, you can uh, you know, make this uh, field effect transistor. And uh, you can see that by applying gate voltage, you can uh, shift the direct point and so on. Okay. So, so the gate voltage is effective. Okay, okay. So, uh, but yeah, that was my next question, whether it is due to that uh, change in the properties of graphene or it is really a VCM effect. How do you confirm that uh, it's, okay, it's... So, so in our case, we, okay, so once we deposit nickel, we cannot measure the, you know, we cannot measure it, uh, the transistor effect. Uh, but in some devices where we did not put uh, any nickel FE, uh, we can make the source drain contact and apply a gate voltage. So there we found out that the direct point was about uh, 10 volts. Okay, but in our case, we really did not find anything spectacular around 10 volts. Okay, it's kind of uh, so there is some asymmetry, uh, maybe because uh, the direct point is at some higher 10 volts, but there was nothing uh, very spectacular happening around 10 volts. Okay, okay, yeah. thank you. Very interesting work. Uh, okay, uh, yes. Uh, I think uh, just to continue whatever Takeshi was asking, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I could not follow maybe everything, but my question is, if you change the anisotropy, you are getting the voltage, isn't it? That's the inverse VCMA. So how much voltage you are able to generate by how much anisotropy? No, no. So, so one is you can think in terms of a DC VCMA effect, okay, where you apply a DC voltage, and you have changed the anisotropy of the system. Yeah. Now, other possibilities, you can think in terms of uh, AC voltage. Now, if you apply AC voltage, you are exciting the magnetization. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, this is, so that means if you have a magnetization which is excited, uh, you can create a DC voltage. Okay, so that's the inverse. Oh, okay, in terms of AC, all right, I get it now. Thank you. So, so one uh, can also, Hmm. Think in terms of a DC effect. Okay, hmm. so for example, uh, if you take this magnetization and if you change it from, let's say, up to, uh, let's say, from uh, out of plane to in plane, and if you stop there, uh, then you can show that there is a transfer of charge okay, in, in this process. So, one possibility is that uh, if by electrometer, if you can measure this charge transfer, also that can be a proof of the inverse missing. Okay, all right, thank you. So I think uh, we are on time. So we need to move to the next talk. So Aswin, could you please kindly stop sharing your screen so that we can present you the digital memento? Yeah, sure. Uh, Muspendra, Abhishek, could you share your screen? Okay. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Aswin, for this very interesting talk and always uh, being there for us in the Indian Syntonics community uh, and participating in Sindo Japan activities. So um, we take immense pleasure in presenting this plaque to Professor Aswin Tulapurkar from IIT Bombay for being a speaker and giving a talk on inverse of voltage control magnetic anisotropy effect and investigation in graphene ferromagnetic structure. So thank you very much, Oswin, for this uh, very thank nice uh, presentation. So we move uh, to the uh, last talk of the first session by uh, Dr. Ruma Mondal from Tokyo University in Japan. Uh, but unfortunately, due to some uh, family uh, responsibilities, she is not able to give a live talk. So she has shared the pre-recorded uh, talk Takeshi, would you uh, please uh, play the talk or how do we, or I should play? Just a moment. Yes, okay.
I will try it. Yes. Um, For me, this is the first time. <laughs> Just. <laughs> Okay. Uh, it's okay. Take see. I can play. I have already downloaded. Okay, you are playing already. Good, good. Yes. Okay, so Hello. my name is Ruma Mondul. I'm. Is that working? Yes, it's working. Just I like to say a few words. Okay. So okay. uh, Ruma Mondul is now working uh, at Tokyo University in Sendai. Uh, she was actually uh, a former PhD student of Professor Anjan Borma. So very nicely uh, collaboration between India and Japan, and she will present a talk on magnetization dynamic study of high PMA ultra thin magnets. Magnetic heterostructure. So I request you, Takeshi, to kindly start. Thank you. Okay, I'll start. Hello, everyone. My name is Ruma Mondul. I am from the Advanced Institute for Material Research of Tohoku University in Japan. First of all, I would like to thank the conveners of this Indo-Japan workshop, Professor Bedanto and Professor Seki, for giving me this opportunity to talk about my recent research updates. Today, I will talk about magnetization dynamic study of high PMA ultra thin magnetic heterostructures. So let me start with the motivation of my presentation. Magnetoresistive random access memory, in short, MRAM, which is a potential technology to become a leading storage technology in the era of spintronics. This is the schematic diagram of MRAM, which consists of a three layer magnetic tunnel junction. Magnetic tunnel junction is basically the backbone of this MRAM and it uh, a three layer structure where two ferromagnetic layer is sandwiched by a non-magnetic barrier layer. Such kind of technology has several advantages like uh, non-volatility, infinite writing, high speed and scalability. In the case of magnetic tunnel junction, when we choose the ferromagnetic layer for free and fixed layer, we need to take care of several criteria like high thermal stability, which can give us high perpendicular magnetic anisotropy, high Curie temperature, low spin transfer torque current, which is a source of low damping, high TMR due to the high spin polarization. So uh, in this field of spintronics, uh, there are several ferromagnetic materials which shows high PMA and used in this magnetic tunnel junction. In this uh, presentation, I will talk about three different new materials that is tetragonally distorted iron cobalt alloy, iron MU hydrostructure, and cobalt iron aluminium Hoessler alloy. So the coexistence of high PMA and low damping is really very difficult because the ultra thin high PMA material usually shows very high damping, which can be found from this literature. So the purpose of this presentation is to search for high PMA material as well as low damping material and to search for the origin of this high damping of ultra thin high PMA material. So when we will talk about uh, or when we will study the damping, we need to study the magnetization dynamics. And magnetization dynamics is basically governed by this landau lipschitz gilbert equation. The change of magnetization as a function of time is governed by two different terms. One is precisional term and another is damping term. And if we look the time scale, you can find that ultra-fast demagnetization is the fastest process, whereas the domain wall motion is the slowest process. And the precision of magnetization falls in between this fastest and slowest process. And from this precision of magnetization, we can investigate the damping constant. So let me start with the uh, start with my first material that is tetragonally distorted iron cobalt alloy. In 2004, uh, in a theoretical report, Brookert reported that tetragonally distorted iron cobalt alloy can show giant effective anisotropy, which the value he reported that is 10 megajoule per meter cube. After that, several experimental report came and. Uh, uh, sorry, this is this is another theoretical report where they found that 
if we choose uh, different uh, base material or uh, different buffer material, uh, the C over A ratio, how it changes. So uh, by choosing three different material like palladium, iridium, and rhodium, they found that in the case of rhodium, the C over A ratio is maximum. So we can predict that when the C over A ratio is maximum, we can also get high anisotropy. And in this two experimental report, they uh, choose this uh, iron cobalt rhodium bilayer sample, and they found that it really shows very high PMA. But after all of this uh, investigation, we find that there are still enough room is available uh, in order to enhance the effective anisotropy more by introducing uh, uh, more uh, <clears throat> tetragonal distortion. And for that purpose, we uh, deposited the uh, iron cobalt, uh, iron 50 cobalt 50 layer uh, on uh, rhodium uh, buffer layer. And the thickness of iron cobalt layer varies from 1 to 10 nanometer on a single crystalline MGO substrate. And we have uh, checked the epitaxial growth and the smoothness of the surface. And uh, bo both uh, were, goes really well. So uh, from this right-hand side data, now let me discuss about the C over A ratio and the effective anisotropy of this material. So if we uh, change the thickness of the material, so uh, we can find that there is a monotonically decrement of C over A ratio. That means, so when the thickness of material below two nanometer, there is a uh, increase increment of C over A ratio. So in the case of one nanometer thick sample, the C over A ratio is maximum. And if we compare the effective anisotropy value, you can find that in the case of 1.5 nanometers uh, thick sample, the C over A ratio is more than one, and we find the largest effective anisotropy. And from this uh, data, you can find that for, for one nanometer thick sample, it shows uh, perpendicular anisotropy, but for uh, when the thickness of material uh, is more than three nanometer, it shows the implant anisotropy. So large PMA energy is observed and as well as the large tetragonal distortion is observed as a function of the thickness of iron cobalt layer. So now let us uh, talk about the magnetization dynamics and we use two color pump probe setup. So in this presentation, I basically didn't describe about this two color pump probe setup because uh, time dissolved uh, PRMO microscope is uh, very common nowadays in the field of uh, this uh, spintronics uh, research. So I skip that portion and uh, just uh, here in the <clears throat> typical time resolved data was uh, uh, shown and um, as a function of uh, several uh, bias magnetic field strength for the 1.5 nanometer thick iron cobalt layer, which shows the maximum anisotropy. And uh, by fitting uh, this uh, typical time data with this uh, phenomenological uh, formula, you can extract the relaxation time. And from this relaxation time, we can extract the damping. So uh, in the next slide, I will talk about the evaluation of magnet uh, magnetic damping. So by using linearized LLG equation and from these two formula, we can extract the resonance frequency and as well as <clears throat> damping. So here uh, you know, we, sh we have shown uh, the uh, bias magnetic field strength dependence of resonance frequency and one over tau for the 1.5 nanometer thick sample. And we find that there is a, a linear increment of resonance frequency as well as one over relaxation time for both of the sample as a function of bias magnetic field strength. So we can uh, easily extract the damping by fitting this uh, resonance frequency, uh, sorry, by fitting this um, re re one over tau relaxation session time. So here in this graph, we have plotted the damping constant as a function of uh, one over T or, or one over thickness. And we can find that in the case of PMA materials, it shows really high damping. But in the case of implant material, the damping is uh, typically low. So high damping constant was found for PMA material. And um, there, and there, we we wish to know what's the origin of this high damping uh, for the high PMA material. And <clears throat> for that purpose, we first we choose the uh, first we check the structural. Uh, 
observation. So this is the hardy image of one nanometer and 10 nanometer thick iron cobalt sample. And from this uh, image, you can find that for one nanometer thick sample, the C axis is elongated uh, as, a, as uh, compared to A axis. But in the case of 10 nanometer thick sample, you can find that both A and C axis is comparable. So a huge tetragonal distortion is clearly observed in from the hard diff image in the case of one nanometer thick sample. Then we <coughs> calculate the first principle, uh, the uh, density of state from the first principle calculation using the Akai KKR method. Uh, from the first principle calculation, we also calculated the damping. And for this iron cobalt alloy, we choose two different uh, uh, order structure, uh, uh, two different structure. That is, one is fully disordered structure, and another is B2 order structure. And as at the same time, we choose another two different uh, distortion. That is, one is uh, BCT, that is tetragonally distorted, and another is BCC. So uh, when uh, that is when the C over A ratio is one and when the C over A ratio is 1.33. And this 1.33 value was taken from the experimental data. And we can find that when there is a tetragonal distortion, there is an increment of the occupation in the minority spin state, which enhances the spin conserving electron transmission between the occupied and unoccupied state. And this basically enhances the damping. And from the theoretical calculation, also you can find that in the case of uh, uh, BCC and BCT, the, in the case of tetragonally distorted sample, there is an increment of the damping. So large PMA energy around 0.573 megajoule per meter cube was observed for iron cobalt alloy. And high PMA material shows uh, typically high damping around 0.04. And from this uh, TEM and as well as the first principle calculation, we conclude that the origin of this high damping is uh, basically the tetragonal distortion. OK, let me uh, talk about one more thing. So usually for high damping, people talk about the spin pumping effect. and uh, uh, as well as the anisotropic field distribution. But in this case, the spin pumping effect is typically less because we choose uh, iron cobalt rhodium bilayer sample. And in the case of rhodium, the spin hall angle is typically low. So we can ignore the spin pumping effect for this iron cobalt rhodium bilayer sample. And if we talk about uh, the um, anisotropic field distribution, from this uh, data, you can find that there is, uh, there is no anisotropic field distribution was found. So we can also ignore that term. So as a, uh, at the end, we can say that tetragonal distortion is the main origin behind this high damping. OK, let me go to the next um, sample. So this is the iron MU heterostructure. So uh, polycrystalline and epitaxial iron MGO is very popular to uh, produce high PMA. But uh, the, there is a time to change the, iron, uh, the MGO barrier. So there is an alternative of this MGO barrier is a spinal barrier that, that known as MAO, that is uh, MGO AL204. And if we check the lattice mismatch, we can find that in the case of iron MAO, there is a perfect lattice mismatch. So uh, the uh, theoretical report and the experimental report uh, says that in the case of iron MAO, it also shows promising uh, PMA value compared to iron MGO barrier layer. So let us consider this iron MAO heterostructure. So we uh, deposited iron MAO heterostructure on single crystalline MGO substrate with some chromium buffer layer. And we vary the annealing temperature for 623 Kelvin to 723 Kelvin uh, in order to introduce uh, the PMA. Uh, so in this graph, you can find the 673, uh, we have shown the 673 Kelvin sample data. And from this loop, you can find that PMA was achieved for this sample. So usually uh, the uh, effective anisotropy was calculated from this uh, VSI magnetometry, but especially for this sample, we choose the torque magnetometry, which uh, can uh, extract the contribution of both first order and second order anisotropy term. So the, from, the, from this torque measurement data and by uh, 
fitting the stock measurement data, we can extract the first order anisotropy term and second order anisotropy term. And you can find, uh, okay, let me explain this data first. So when we change the annealing temperature of this iron MAO barrier layer, we can find that in the case of 623 Kel uh, Kelvin sample, it shows mm, uh, effective anisotropy a little bit lower, but in the case of uh, 673 Kelvin sample, uh, the effective anisotropy is much higher and then it again drop. So for 673 Kelvin sample, the effective anisotropy is the maximum. And when we extract the two different contribution, we find the first order anisotropy contribution is more dominating compared to the second order um, contribution. So uh, now let us measure the magnetization dynamics of the sample. And uh, from this uh, uh, resonance frequency, you can find uh, for all these three samples, the resonance frequency is monotonically increasing. But in the case of uh, um, relaxation time, we find that there, there is not uh, a linear uh, increment of one over tau for all these three samples. So there is some uh, anisotropic field distribution is uh, exist for all these three samples at lower uh, bias magnetic field strength. So uh, we uh, introduce this, uh, uh, anisotropy field distribution for all of these uh, three samples and extract the damping. And we check that damping shows a minimum at 623 Kelvin sample. So the, for the 623 Kelvin sample, the damping shows minimum. And with the sample which shows higher PMA, it shows the higher uh, maximum damping. So now let me uh, talk about uh, why the um, uh, higher PMA sample shows higher damping and why the 623 Kelvin sample shows low damping. So for that, we did some modeling. So uh, in this modeling, we choose uh, a clear interface and uh, a oxygen uh, vacancy or excess oxygen uh, interface. Because in this case, we thought uh, or we predict that due to the oxidation, the, the damping and the PMA energy behaves like that. So for that purpose, we choose a barrier of poor oxygen and rich oxygen. And by changing the oxygen atom at the interface, we calculated the alpha and the effective anisotropy, and we find that in the case uh, when <clears throat> there is, uh, I mean, at the zero uh, oxygen uh, interface, so when the interface is typically clear, it shows the maximum uh, damping and maximum effective anisotropy. And in the case of poor uh, ox uh, poor interface, oxygen interface, it shows the damping uh, reduces and as well as the effective anisotropy reduces. And same was found in the case of rich oxygen interface. So uh, we, we can say that you know, when the damping is lower in the case of 623 sample, so there might be either oxygen poor or oxygen rich uh, region is available. So uh, in order to uh, investigate uh, the damping term, the contribution of the damping term, we uh, decompose the damping term into two different uh, term that is non-spin -flip, uh, flip term and uh, spin flip term. And if uh, and we uh, check their uh, behavior as a function of oxygen atom in the interface, and we find that the non-spin -flip, flip term contributes is more uh, dominating compared to the spin flip term. And in the case of the PMA energy, we find that uh, the loss of PMA energy in oxygen poor and oxygen rich interface is due to the uh, reduction of the orbital moment at the interface. So uh, from this uh, 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 observation, we can find that there is some uh, change of oxidation state at the interface of iron MU due to several, uh, due to change of annealing temperature, which basically promotes to get higher damping as well as, sorry, uh, higher PMA energy as well as low damping. So if we compare this PMA versus damping with several other reported materials, uh, and we, if we put our material, we can find that till gate, the manganese gallium, uh, that is this, this one, shows the high PMA as well as the low damping. But if we compare the iron-based uh, PMA material, we can find that uh, iron platinum shows very high uh, PMA, but its damping is also very high. This, this one. But in, in our iron MAO case, it uh, also shows higher uh, anisotropy and the damping is also not very high. 
um, but still it's uh, much uh, still it's a little bit higher uh, the uh, compared to iron palladium so uh, we can say that iron mu seems to be a good choice for magnetic tunnel junction so let me go to the last material that is cobalt based Hoesler alloy that is cobalt iron aluminium so cobalt iron aluminium is very famous uh, because it shows high tmr due to high spin polarization at the same time it shows very low damping and uh, 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 very high tmr in the uh, when the uh, uh, cobalt iron thickness is uh, in the ultra thin regime but there is a problem so when the cobalt iron aluminium thickness uh, reduces, uh, people reported that the damping is typically enhances. So what's the origin of this high damping in the case of uh, ultra thin uh, cobalt iron aluminium that we will now discuss. So in this uh, case, we uh, deposited cobalt iron aluminium on ruthenium buffer layer and on top a MgO and silicon nitride layer was deposited and um, that all the deposition was done at room temperature and post tunnel at 598 Kelvin for 30 minutes. So uh, from the XRD analysis, uh, okay, so the cobalt iron aluminium thickness was varied from 1 to 20 nanometers. And from the XRD analysis, we find that the B2 ordering, that is 002 and 004 of uh, cobalt iron aluminium peak was observed when the thickness is above 10 nanometer. So B2 ordering was observed uh, at 10 nanometer, but A2, but in the uh, when the thickness is lower than 5 nanometer, there is no there no B2 ordering was found, and it's mostly disordered. That is A2 ordering, we can say. And uh, when we check the anisotropy, we find that in the case of one nanometer thick sample, it shows a uh, PMA. But when the thickness is more than five nanometer, it shows the implant anisotropy. In the case of time resolved data, we can find that uh, for, for one and 1.2 uh, nanometer thick data, we have shown here. So for 1.2 nanometer thick sample, both the resonance frequency and one over tau shows monotonical, uh, I mean, linear increment as a function of uh, bias magnetic field strength. But in the case of one nanometer sample, the uh, relaxation time shows some uh, uh, presence of anisotropic field distribution. And we in incorporated this anisotropic field distribution in order to fit this one over relaxation time to investigate or to extract the damping. And here we uh, plotted the damping constant as a function of one over uh, thickness. And we find that in the case of uh, uh, one nanometer and 1.2 nanometer thick sample, the damping is typically high, which, al uh, which also find in other reports. Uh, but in our case, case, especially we discuss about the origin of this high damping. So from the elemental map of this cobalt iron aluminium for uh, th this, this is the data for one nanometer thick sample and this is the data for 20 nanometer thick sample, we find that aluminium is diffused both in the MAO layer. Uh, sorry, MGO layer. So, uh, and the, uh, the composition of this um, CFA for one and 20 nanometer thick sample is uh, drastically changed. And the composition for one nanometer thick sample is like this, and for 20 nanometer thick sample is like this. So now uh, from the first principle calculation, we uh, calculate the damping constant as a function of uh, different composition of aluminum. And uh, this, this is the um, uh, density of states calculation as a function of different uh, uh, percentage of aluminum in this cobalt iron aluminum B2 order structure. And we find that when the uh, Aluminium concentration is 0.8%, that is, uh, which is comparable with the 20 nanometer thick sample, the damping is lower. But when the aluminium, there is a deficiency of aluminium that is comparable with the one nanometer thick sample, the damping is increases. So from this investigation, we can say that for the ultra thin PMA uh, cobalt iron aluminium, the damping is 10 times higher compared to 50 nanometer sample. And this is due to the aluminium deficiency in the CFA layer. So uh, let me, uh, sorry, let me summarize my talk. So first I uh, described, uh, we, uh, I described the tetragonally distorted iron cobalt uh, thin film, which shows 
very high PMA, around 0.6 uh, megajoule per meter cube. And high PMA sample also shows high damping. And from the TEM observation and first principle calculation, we find that high damping, uh, the origin of this high damping is basically the tetragonal distortion. And in the second case, we talk about the coexistence of high PMA and low magnetic yield bar damping by surface in uh, by interface engineering of iron MAO heterostructure. And um, the PMA contributes due to the first order anisotropy term and the interfacial oxi oxidation states, basically the interface engineering between this iron and MAO is the origin of this high uh, PMA. And at the end, the damping of ultra thin PMA iron cobalt we checked and it shows typically high. And the high damping uh, is basically coming due to the aluminium deficiency in the cobalt iron aluminium layer. But uh, the cobalt iron aluminium with PMA high spin polarization and low damping could be achieved by aluminium niche cobalt iron aluminium uh, film. So uh, thanks all of you for your kind attention. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ruma, for this uh, uh, nice talk and actually taking the trouble to pre-record it in and send it to us. I, I really appreciate on behalf of the organizer and uh, excellent uh, work. Uh, unfortunately, uh, she cannot take questions right now. So if audience have questions, uh, they can write to me and I will forward to her and then I can come back to you or you can directly write to her whatsoever. Uh, but I also like to request Uma to join tomorrow uh, this uh, poster session. Uh, we have a special virtual discussion room, very, very informal, of course. So you kindly join and uh, interact with people if they have questions. I have actually a lot of questions. So personally, I would love to talk to you tomorrow. So I hope you will manage. So um, please share the screen so that I can present the virtual memento to Uma. <clears throat> Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. So Indo-Japan workshop on interface phenomena for spintronics, jointly organized by NICER and IMR, take immense pleasure in presenting this plaque to Professor Uma Mondal from Tohoku University in appreciation for being a valuable speaker to give a lecture on magnetization dynamic study of high PMA ultra thin magnetic heterostructure. So thank you so much, uh, Puma, uh, Ruma. I really appreciate it. And uh, looking forward to some interactions tomorrow. So I think with this, we are almost done with the uh, first session. So we can move to, uh, um, I think lunch time now in India. Um, oh my God, okay. So <clears throat> yeah, I mean, thank you organizers for this. Uh, All right, so I see my photo and uh, I think it's fine. Ah, okay, I understand. Okay, so sorry. And maybe uh, this is for you. <laughs> and this is a moment. <laughs> Thank you. Chair, so Professor Stavdanka Bedanter. And so this is for you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, I like to thank all the speakers, Prof. Anjan Bergman, Prof. Takeshi Seki, Prof. Asim Tula Purkar, and Prof. Ruma Mondal for their excellent talks. It was very interactive, this session. And now we will break for lunch. Unfortunately, we are a little bit over time, <clears throat> but we'll start at 1.30 p.m. Uh, with the ses second session, uh, which will be chaired by Dr. Chandra Murapaka from IIT Hyderabad. And there are several interesting talks by Prof. Kenichi Uchida, Dr. Brajbhushan Singh, Prof. P.S. Anil Kumar and Dr. Surendra Singh. Until then, so you can log out, but this is the same June link, and we can rejoin at, uh, in 40, 45 minutes approximately. Okay, thank you. See you. Thank you. See you. See you. Thank you. See you.
Hello, Chandra. Hello. Uh, let me. You uh, can you try to unmute? Yes. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, Kenichi. Is my voice clear? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. So should I share my PowerPoint? Yes, ah. please, please do so. So now my sharing function is forbidden. So. Okay, uh, just give me, okay, let me see. Uh, okay, just give me a minute. I will make you a co-host, I think. That's not done. Just give me a second. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, can, can you see my uh, PowerPoint? Yes, yes, we can. Yes, we can see. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I start now? Okay. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's really my pleasure to welcome you all again to the second session of this interesting conference. Uh, without any further delay, I would like to request Professor Chandrasekhar Murapaka, uh, my dear friend from IIT Hyderabad, uh, who has kindly agreed to session the chair. Chandra Murapaka has uh, done PhD in Singapore and uh, moved around in France and other places for postdoc. He is also working intensely on skin tonics. So he will chair this session too, where we will have talks by Professor Kenichi Uchida, Dr. Brajbhushan Singh, Professor P.S. Anil Kumar, and Dr. Surendra Singh. So I uh, request Chandra to you know, keep the talks within half an hour, 25 minutes uh, for the talk and five minutes for discussion. So with this, I now request you to coordinate the session. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shubhaji. I really appreciate uh, this opportunity to be, uh, it's my privilege to uh, chair this session in this uh, wonderful workshop. I just feel the Japan workshop and interface in our first So I welcome back all the audience uh, for this uh, uh, interesting talks uh, after the interesting talks of session one for the session two. So I request uh, uh, Professor Ushida uh, to start his talk on uh, future directions in clinical development. So uh, Ushida, uh, now uh, floor is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction, and thank you very much for inviting me to this special workshop. Uh, my name is Kenichi Uchida uh, from National Institute for Material Science. So first of all, I appreciate Professor Svanka Obedanta for organizing this workshop and Professor Takanashi and Professor Seki and for giving me this opportunity to present our talk. So today, uh, I would like to show recent research trend in spin electronics and discuss the future direct directions in this field. So before moving uh, to the main talk, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the collaborators and group members for their support. So in particular, we, we strongly collaborate with Dr. Sakuraba's group in NIMS and Professor Takanashi and Professor Seki uh, in uh, IMR talk on the topic of the magnetothermal electric conversion. In the recent works related to the future direction in spin electronics, we collaborate with Professor Gerrit Bauer in Tohoku University and uh, Dr. Murata in AIST. I also acknowledge the JST Crest project for the financial support. This is the outline of my talk. After introducing the history and fundamentals of spin electronics, I will show recent research activities in this field. Based on the research trend, I will propose and discuss future directions in spin electronics from the viewpoints of fundamental physics and material science. 
due to the limitation of the time. Today, I do not explain the details of each topic, but present only an essence of each uh, work. But then let's start from the, the introduction. As is well known, the thermoelectric effects enable the interconversion between charge and heat current. There are various thermoelectric effects as shown later, uh, but uh, most of studies have mainly focused on the thermoelectric power generation based on the Zebeck effect and the electronic cooling uh, based on the Perge effect. Independently from thermoelectrics, you know, in the past few decades, uh, extensive research on spintronics has been carried out uh, all over the world, where electron spins are exploited as new information and energy carriers, uh, in addition to electron charge. Spintronics has led to important scientific discoveries and industrial applications, and its, its key concept is a uh, spin current. So in this stream, the interplay between spin, charge, and heat currents uh, have been actively investigated and a wide variety of physics and functionalities have been discovered. For example, in addition to the Zebeck and Perche effect, various thermoelectric effects appearing in the magnetic material, depending on its spontaneous magnetization, they are called the magnetothermoelectric effects. The interconversion between spin and the heat currents uh, enabled by the thermal spin effects, um, <clears throat> such as the spin Zebeck and the spin Perche effect. Fundamental physics and application studies on such novel phenomena are the main topics in spin color electronics. As shown here, an annual international workshop on spin color electronics has been held since 2009. However, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, the workshop in 2020 and 2021 have been canceled. The spin color electronics workshop in 2022 is organized by Professor Axel Hochman and David Cahill. Um, and will be held in May in Illinois, USA. However, I'm not sure uh, whether the Japanese researchers can participate in this face-to-face -face workshop in this difficult season. So, okay, um, here I briefly summarize the history, history of spin color electronics. The word of spin color electronics was used for the first time in the paper by Dr. Hatami and Professor Gerrit Bauer and colleagues, which was published in 2007. Here, the effect of, effect of a thermal gradient on magnetization dynamics was discussed theoretically. One of the triggers for the rapid development of spin current electronics is the spin Zebeck effect, which refers to the generation of a spin current as a result of a heat current in magnetic materials. In 2010, the spin Zebeck effect was found to appear not only in conductors, but, to, but also in insulators. This clearly showed that spin Zebeck effect is uh, conceptually different from the conventional thermoelectrics. To clarify the mechanism of the spin Zebeck effect, many researchers began studies on spin electronics. Several years later, the spin version of the Perch effect was also discovered by uh, the group of uh, Professor van, Bart van Bies in the University of Froningen, which is the generation of a heat current as a result of a spin current injection. In 2016, we established a versatile measurement method for spin electronic phenomena that output heat currents. Yeah, um, we first report the thermal imaging of the spin Perche effect, and subsequently we realized the first observation, uh, direct observation of the anisotropic magneto Perche effect, anomalous etching Southern effect, and magneto Thomson effect, as partially explained later. This activity provides a new direction in this field and provides uh, the way uh, to spintronic summer management. This slide shows only a specific aspect of spin electronics, but with these developments, the physics and material science studies on spin electronics are being uh, accelerated. The discovery of the spin electronic phenomena partially comes from the fact that the spin current carries not only by conduction electrons, but also by other carriers, uh, closed particles having uh, spin angular momentum, such as spin waves or magnums. So even if we, uh, we focused on electronic transport, the conventional two by two transport matrix for charge and heat current is extended into a three by three matrix owing to the conduction electron spin currents, resulting in the appearance of many spin electronic phenomena corresponding to 
each of the diagonal component of this matrix. Furthermore, uh, by adding the uh, magnum spin current degree of freedom, more various phenomena can appear. The important point here is that basically input and output uh, in experiments are always heat or charge current um, because of the, the absence of uh, the sp uh, direct spin current de detectors and generators. Therefore, although there are various phenomena, uh, spin electronic phenomena result in the thermoelectric conversion through various interactions and conversion phenomena. For example, the spin Zeleck effect refers to the conversion from a heat current into magnum spin current, which is main, uh, mainly investigated in the junction comprising the magnetic insulator and the conductor thin film. The generated magnum spin current is then converted into a conduction electron spin current through the spin mixing conductance at the junction interface. And the conduction electron spin current is then sub sub subsequently converted into a charge current due to the spin orbit interaction. Therefore, the spin electric effect and its reciprocal spin temperature effect are essentially the energy transport phenomena via the interface. In fact, uh, in the improvement of the thermal spin conversion properties by interfacial engineering have been reported. In 2015, we reported the enhancement of the spin Zebeck effect in ik pratcham biology pratcham structures by inserting the ultra thin ferromagnetic metal interlayer. Then, several groups reported similar experiments using different ferromagnets. And recently, Professor Sankon Lee and Professor Eiji Saito's group reported the enhancement of the spin Zebeck effect by inserting a two dimensional uh, die, uh, a transition metal die calcogenite. Such uh, two dimensional materials are interesting, and some materials are known to exhibit ferromagnetism, which is controllable by illuminating the light. Based on this knowledge, Professor Manfong Fang in the University of South Florida uh, has proposed a new branch of spin calotronics called opto-spin opto calotronics. This can be one of the future directions in, the, in this field because of its new functionalities. So uh, based on this uh, background of spin calotronics, what kind of future uh, direction can be further considered? Uh, from the viewpoint of physics, I propose two uh, directions nonlinear spin calotronics and polarization calotronics. The fundamental thermoelectric effects con consist of not only the Zebeck and Pelch effect, but also the Thomson effect, which is a representative uh, nonlinear thermoelectric conversion phenomenon proportional to both the temperature gradient and the charge current applied to the conductor. The nonlinear means that the temperature dependence of the transport coefficient plays an important role. The Zedek and Pelcher effect are related to the Onsaga reciprocal relation. The Zedek coefficient and the Thomson coefficient are related to uh, each other by the uh, so called Kelvin relation, like this. So, however, uh, the uh, conventional uh, spin calotronics focuses on only on the linear response transport phenomena here, and the effective magnet is on the Thomson effect and the spin version of the Thomson effect are yet to be investigated. So this is a, a next target to develop the physics of nonlinear spin calotronics. As the first step in the nonlinear spin calotronics, we reported the direct observation of, magno, of the magneto Thomson effect in 2020, which is the magnetic field dependence of the heat production rate due to the Thomson effect appearing in non-magnetic conductors. Its origin is a simple Lorentz force, but the magneto-Thomson effect was not observed directly previously. In this study, by means of the recently developed thermoelectric imaging techniques based on the Rockwin thermography, we realized the first direct observation of the magneto-Thomson effect and observed the um, strong fi magnetic field induced enhancement of the Thomson coefficient in the bismuth antimony alloys. So next, uh, very recently, uh, we reported the observation of the phase transition induced giant Thomson effect using the same measurement techniques. Here we used uh, nickel-doped uh, uh, iron-logium alloys, which shows the first order 
antiferromagnetic ferromagnetic phase transition around the room temperature and their transport coefficient exhibit steep change across the phase transition. In this study, we show that the Thomson coefficient of iron rhodium alloys, best alloys, which is huge values approaching uh, 1000 microvolt per Kelvin around the room temperature due to the phase transition and the thermoelectric cooling based on uh, the Thomson effect can be um, uh, larger than the joule heating in a steady state. The phase transition temperature can be tuned by the composition and the, and the applying magnetic field. Conventionally, materials with a small Z coefficient are not regarded as thermoelectric materials. Actually, the iron rhodium alloys has very small Z coefficient. However, our result indicates that such uh, uh, materials can be used for the Thomson uh, thermoelectric conversion based on the Thomson effect if the temperature dependence a nonlinear term of the Z coefficient is large. This finding will invigorate studies on nonlinear or higher order thermoelectric phenomena engineering. As shown here, Well, where the Thomson coefficient is uh, dependent on the direction of the magnetization direction and the spin um, electron driven spin dependent Thomson effect. Oh, excuse me, can you hear me now? Yes, Professor. Uh, we lost you. So now I can hear you. Okay, I'm sorry. There is uh, some trouble. In, in, so, uh, no, I will yeah. Could you kindly share, share it again? Oh. Can you see my slide now? Yes, yes, you can see your slides. Yeah, please go. Yeah, okay, Thank I'm you. sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, let me uh, continue the presentation. So, my, yeah, actually, um, my, uh, the spin bar electron driven magneto uh, spin dependent Thomson effect and the magneton driven uh, spin Thomson effect are also uh, remain to be uh, observed. So, uh, exploring, uh, investigating these phenomena will further develop the fundamental physics of spin carol electronics. So, moreover, the expansion of the physics of spin electronics to other fields and materials is also important. One of the such research directions is polarization electronics using ferroelectrics. Recently, Professor Bauer theoretically predicted uh, the non unconventional thermoelectric effect based on the dielectric polarization transport in ferroelectric materials in these theoretical papers. The experimental verification of such phenomena remains to be reported and requires the international interdisciplinary fusion of spin carotonics, um, ferroelectrics, and nanoscale uh, science. Okay, then let's go to the material science part. To realize the application of spin carotonics, it's necessary to significantly improve the thermal spin and thermoelectric conversion performance. Thus, uh, uh, th therefore, um, it's essential to develop materials with high spin charge heat interconversion properties. Okay, here I show the introduction of on one of the transfer magneto thermoelectric effects called the normal Snellens effect. This is one of the hottest topic in spin electronics recently. The normal Snellens effect is the generation of the thermoelectric voltage in the direction perpendicular to both an applied temperature gradient and the spontaneous magnetization in magnetic materials. Basic studies on anomal Snellens effect have been carried out for a long time, but in early days of spin electronics, the development of ex experimental methods for separating the spin zedek effect from anomal Snellens effect have been, uh, was promoted all over the world. Therefore, the research on the anomal Snellens effect has also been activated. 
As, um, in particular, uh, since the observation of the giant anomalous Nelson's effect in magnet magnetic topological materials, the studies on this effect has accelerated further and becomes one of the big trends in condensed matter physics. The transverse thermoelectric effects have unique symmetry and scaling law, completely different from the Zeleck effect. Therefore, the transverse uh, effect has a potential to realize simple and versatile thermoelectric applications. A typical Zeleck device has a complicated three-dimensional structure in which P-type and N-type um, semiconductors are arranged alternately and connected in series. On the other hand, in the anomalous Nelson effect, uh, heat and charge currents are perpendicular to each other. So simple sheet structure works as a thermoelectric device and its output power is proportional to the device area. So by using the thermoelectric, transverse thermoelectric effects, we do not have to construct a complicated three-dimensional structure. And also uh, for heat sensing, heat flux sensing applications, a simple planar zigzag structure is useful. Uh, although this uh, thermopile structure cannot enhance the output power, the voltage uh, can be enhanced in proportion to the uh, effective length of the wire. The heat flux sensing based on the anomalous Nelson's effect uh, is now uh, actively investigated by uh, Dr. Sakuraba's group in news and other groups all over, over the world. A thermal power can also be obtained by winding a wire around the pipe-shaped heat source by directing the magnetization in the actual direction. So these graphs show the anomalous Nelson's coefficient and transverse thermoelectric uh, conductivity for various materials at room temperature uh, reported so far. The coefficient are uh, compared in terms of saturation magnetization. As shown here, the large anomalous Nelson's coefficient was obtained in Hoysala compounds such as cobalt 2 manganese gallium CMG. As far as, as I know, the record high alpha XY transverse thermoelectric conductivity was obtained for samarium cobalt five type magnets above room temperature, which we reported in 2019. Importantly, these parameters has no correlation with saturation magnetization in many materials. So these records, um, also this is the important work. Uh, these records have just been broken by a non clean non-collinear antiferromagnet with tiny net magnetization. Also, this works only at low temperatures below 200 Kelvin. Here, the uh, groups of Professor uh, Claudia Felser and Professor uh, Jos Hermans uh, have reported the giant uh, transverse thermoelectric conductivity of around 10 in the manganese penictide at low temperature. So through these activities, the thermoelectric performance of the anomalous Nelson effect have been improved dramatically in the past few years. However, these uh, phenomena are currently far from practical applications um, because the anomalous Nelson's coefficient is still much smaller than the Zeleck coefficient of materials used nowadays. So uh, current record high value of the anomalous Nelson's coefficient at room temperature is still uh, smaller than 10 microvolt per Kelvin. Uh, while Dr. Uh, Sakuraba in NIMS um, estimated at least 20 microvolt per Kelvin is necessary for heat flux sensing applications based on the anomalous Nelson's effect. So even for materials showing the large anomalous Nelson's effect, the dimensionless figure merit is still in the order of 10 to minus three. So the uh, definition of the figure merit in the, of the anomalous Nelson's effect is similar to the, that for the Zebec effect where the Zebec coefficient is replaced with the anomalous Nelson's coefficient. Therefore, the strategy for improving the figure merit is also similar. The material should have a larger thermal power, high, higher electrical conductivity, and low, lower thermal conductivity. Many researchers are looking for new materials and principles to further enhance the transfer thermal power. The reduction of the thermal conductivity by nanostructuring and phonon engineering is also an important task, although such activity is quite limited. For example, if the uh, transfer sound power is enhanced by 10 times and thermal conductivity is reduced by half, the figure of merit can, reach, can, can be uh, greater than 0.1. This value is still small. However, owing to the uni unique functionality of the leads to various applications. 
To accelerate the material searching, we have recently developed high throughput screening method for the thermal. Oh, there is a trouble again. Yeah. yeah. Would you kindly share? Yeah, just a moment. Sure. Yes. Can you see? Uh, um, now, uh, recently, we have developed a high throughput screening method for thermal electric and thermal spin conversion phenomena by combining the rock in thermography with combinatorial material science. By visualizing the temperature modulation in composition spread films, we can obtain systematic and continuous composition dependence of the magneto thermal electric conversion or thermal spin effects from a single sample. Uh, we demonstrate the usability of this method by forming a uh, fully epitaxial Hoysera films with uh, composition gradient. As summarized here, the material science studies on the anomalous Nelson effect are still under development. So in addition to monolithic uh, materials, uh, we focused on uh, five hybrid and composite materials as a tool to enhance the thermal spin and thermal spin thermal electric conversion performance. For example, the hybrid thermal electric generation based on the spin Zebec and the anomalous Nernst effect is <clears throat> enabled by the uh, ferromagnetic metal, um, ferrimagnetic insulator junction systems, and in uh, ferromagnetic, non magnetic bulk nanocomposites. There are plenty of scope for the performance improvement because these hybrid materials are not optimized yet. And furthermore, we proposed um, in 2021, we proposed and demonstrated the unconventional transverse thermoelectric generation appearing in a thermoelectric semiconductor a magnetic material junction uh, hybrid materials in collaboration with Dr. Sakuraba's group. Please uh, consider the closed circuit comprising uh, magnetic and thermoelectric materials. This effect originates from the hybrid artificial hybridization of the Zebec effect in the uh, some electric conductor, which generates a charge current inside the closed circuit, and the anomalous hole effect in the magnetic material, which converts the charge current into transverse current voltage. So we call this phenomenon the Zebec driven uh, transverse some electric generation, STTG. So STTG exhibits the transverse some electric conversion with the symmetry similar to the anomalous Nelson effect. The large anomalous hole angle in the magnetic layer, the large Zebec coefficient in the thermoelectric layer, and optimize the size, size ratio between them are required to improve the thermoelectric performance. So, we experimentally demonstrated the large transverse sound power using the combination of an epitaxially grown CMG film and the silicon substrate with large Zebec coefficient. We show that an um, N-type silicon CMG junction structure a hybrid material exhibit the transverse sound power of more than uh, 80 microvolt per Kelvin at room temperature, which is much larger than the anomalous Nernst coefficient. And its sign can be reversed by when the N-type silicon is replaced with the P-type silicon with the opposite, opposite Zebec coefficient. The experimental results are well reproduced by the phenomenological uh, model, model calculations. So um, one of the points to be improve, uh, improved in this initial uh, STTG experiment is the complicated device structures. To solve this problem, we have recently demonstrated the STTG using uh, much simplified on-chip devices, where the polycrystalline iron gallium alloy films were directly formed on N-type silicon substrate. These devices exhibit larger sound power of more than 40 microvolt per Kelvin, Furthermore, uh, we phenomenologically uh, formulated the reciprocal process of the STTG and showed that the thermoelectric magnetic hybrid materials can exhibit the Peltier driven thermoelectric cooling. Importantly, by using this principle, we can obtain the larger coefficient of performance 
and anomalous detection source and effect in a single magnetic materials. Uh, these results confirm the usefulness of the hybrid and the composite materials, which may be a breakthrough approach for the application of spin calotronics, as the hybrid uh, composite materials are yet to be uh, optimized for spin calotronics. There are a lot of uh, possibilities to improve the spin charge and heat interconversion efficiency. So uh, finally, let me summarize my talk. So today, um, I discussed, uh, we discussed the prospect of spin calotronics based on recent research trends. As future directions uh, from fundamental physics viewpoint, I introduced uh, nonlinear spin calotronics, polarization calotronics, and optospin spin calotronics. From the viewpoint of material science, I emphasize the uh, potential of hybrid and composite materials. To develop these works, in the interdisciplinary fusion among spin calotronics and various fields, including nanoscale material science, thermal engineering, and ferroelectrics, and so on, is desired. So I hope that this uh, proposal will encourage such fusion research. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Professor uh, Shida. Yeah, thank you very much. This wonderful and uh, informative talk. Thank you. Very much. Yeah, indeed, yeah. I, I believe that uh, it will catalyze a lot of research in this interdisciplinary uh, work on spin electronics, especially the 2D materials and yeah, uh, hostile alloys. Okay, so thanks a lot. I mean, very informative talk. Uh, I really enjoyed it. So uh, I request uh, if anybody has a question, please raise your hand and then you can unmute and ask. Alternately, you may type also. So, Professor Yushida, you mentioned the, mm -hmm. that this cobalt to magnesium uh, 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 silicon, right? I mean, I think gallium. So, that yeah, one is yeah. giving the high, uh, this uh, thermoelectric, uh, the merit, right? Figure of merit, right? So, uh, the, is it related to the, the spin polarization? Uh, I'm very new to this topic. That's the reason I'm asking. Uh, actually, uh, here I discussed the figure of merit of the anomalous Nernst effect, which is completely yes, yes. different from the spin current transport phenomena and the Zedek effect. Okay, so, okay. Yeah, this is one of the magnetosamoelectric conversion appearing okay. in yeah, magnetic materials. Okay. Must be important, but uh, its origin is not directly related to, to, to the spin current. Okay. Yeah, Professor Shimanga, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, uh, Kenichi, for this wonderful summary. Uh, I have just some doubts, actually, a very similar question. Now, you have already clarified that the spin polarization is not the primary uh, factor here. But I wonder what about like manganides, you know, like LSMO, lanthanum stonesian manganide, or LCMO, those kind of materials uh, in terms of this anomalous knots uh, effect. Do you yeah. expect large uh, perfect game? Yeah, I, yeah, thank you very much for the important uh, uh, question. So actually, um, but we do not have to consider the degree of spin current when consider the anomalous Nernst effect, but the spin current can uh, exhibit the substantial contribution in this effect, because uh, when we apply a temperature gradient to magnetic materials, the spin current should be generated along the temperature gradient in the magnet inside the magnetic materials due to the spin dependence. And then Zebek effect. And this spin current can be converted into the uh, transverse voltage by the inverse spin hollow effect in the magnetic materials. So the spin current can be uh, can play some role in the anomalous Nernst the effect. But uh, yeah, it to clarify the uh, but to separate the spin current contribution from the total voltage, but yeah, it's a very uh, tough challenge. So more detailed experiments and discussions are necessary. Mm. I'm not sure whether or not I can clearly answer your question, but yeah, but uh, no at problem. least as far as Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But as far as I know, there is no clear, clear correlation between the anomalous Nernst effect and the spin polarization, for example. So yeah. Okay. But the spin current is not the only origin of the spin uh, Nernst effect. So there is a different factor. 
Okay. Uh, but this uh, metallicity or half metallicity, does it have to play any role? So I wonder why the Hostler compounds like CMG is exhibiting these higher coefficients. What is uh, the main origin behind it? Uh, um, in the case of Hoistler alloys, uh, now uh, the uh, current understanding is based on the intrinsic mechanism where the very uh, curvature due to the topological band structure exhibit the large transverse thermal electric conductivity, then um, but this leads to the uh, large and Marx Snellens effect. Yeah, it's not directly related to the half metallicity, I think. Okay, okay. So it is more of intrinsic band structure and topological nature. Okay, thank you so much. Very nice talk, I enjoyed. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Yoshida. So we clap you for this wonderful overview of this uh, uh, this pink electronics and the future direction. Thanks a lot. So I request yeah. you to uh, stop uh, presenting it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much for your- Sandra, please uh, present the memento. Uh, Abhishek, uh, uh, could uh, you kindly will share the memento. You kindly present it to uh, Professor sure. Uchida. Yeah. So it's a great privilege to me to present this uh, memento of uh, Indo-Japan workshop on interface phenomena for spintronics IGW, IPS 22, jointly organized by NICER and uh, uh, IMR at Tohoku University. So uh, along with uh, Professor uh, Shubankar, I take this immense pleasure in presenting this plaque to Professor uh, Kenishi Ushida Sansai. So he's from NIMS, Japan. So thanks a lot for uh, being a uh, valuable speaker here, Ushida Shan. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much. So I request uh, Dr. Brajbhushan Singh to start uh, his sharing his screen. Yeah, my screen is visible. Yes, yes, your uh, screen is visible, but please go to the full screen mode. Yep, yep. Okay, Brisbane, please yeah. go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chandra, for this. Uh, so, good afternoon to all. I'm Braj Bhushan Singh, working as an Inspire faculty. So Inspire faculty is basically an independent tenure track position if compared to Europe and other, funded by Department of Science and Technology, Government of India. So I would like to thank Dr. Subhankar Vedanta and Professor Seki and Professor Takanasi for organizing this uh, wonderful workshop. So today I'm going to talk on the spin to charge conversion in a polycrystalline topological insulator. So topological insulators are very fascinating materials which are showing ground state, which is insulating and the surface states which are conducting. So this cartoon can explain that and how spin to charge conversion efficiency will be affected by if we consider the polycrystalline nature of that. So these are the fun other funding sources. So the project is Indo-French project and Newton fund for polarized neutron refractivity experiments. And this is DA, which is helping the NICER. So let's look at what is the motivation behind this work. So if we understand the forecast in terms of the global energy consumption, that by 2030, there will be a surge by 30% if we consider the information and communication technology. So it will power requirement increasing not only in our household and other thing, but if we consider only information and communication technology. So we, so the most uh, power uh, is consumed by the, our search engine, for example, Google. So how much energy Google uses? So it is uses the energy, which may be uh, useful for the 2 million homes. So if we consider that, uh, in comparison to the total consumption, so it is 1.1 to 1.5% of the global electricity is consumed by the only Google. So Google uh, is based on the information communication technology. So it is consuming lots of power. So if, if we consider there are 1 billion daily Google searches, which consume about 2.5 million watt energy. So we compare with them in, in very layman language. So one Google search, or we can give 30 Google search cost, the energy which is required to boil one liter of the water. So we can understand information and communication technology require lots of power. And nowadays energy consumption is 
uh, booming in every field, but he, if we can minimize energy consumption in the field of information and communication technology by designing devices which are power efficient. So in this context, Pintronics can help us because of they are low power devices, which are faster, they are also uh, get to smaller so that in the, we can be incorporated in the futuristic company devices like neuromorphic computing. So in that on the solid state devices, spintronic devices can help in this direction. So in this direction, we have a very nice material that's called spin, this is topological insulator. So which is showing a, in the bulk insulating while on the surface, it is acting as a conducting surface state. So if you see in the energy versus wave vector diagram in the 2D, we can see these are the crossing of the surface states. They are basically time reversal symmetry protected. So it means there is a prohibition of 180 degree scattering. So in this uh, context, uh, we are uh, focusing on the bismuth cell and I because it is showing narrow band gap over 0 0.3 electron volts. So let's understand the fundamentals that people have already explored, but I will go a little bit understand. So a spin hall effect is so you have a high spin orbit coupling material and you are flowing a charge current, then it can be converted into a corresponding spin current because of the accumulation of the opposite spin on the opposite spaces. So the converse of this effect, we can understand inverse spin hall effect. If you flow a corresponding spin current, then it can also create a corresponding transfer charge current. So we define a parameter that's called a spin hall angle. So which tells about the how much conversion efficiency is happening from a particular spin current to the charge current or vice versa. So this is a ratio. So we, uh, in, uh, there is another parameter that is called a spin diffusion length that is also important. So we need to normalize it. So we have defined a length scale with the normalizing with the spin diffusion length. Point is that if you have the high spin to charge conversion efficiency, then it will be helpful to the spintronic devices. So in this direction, let's understand the basic condensed matter physics. If you have a normal metal, then there will be a spin degeneration ratio. So there is no splitting if you consider this one. But what will happen if you consider topological insulator? So they are opposite chiral T contour in the topological insulator. This here and here. And we look in the two-dimensional way. So we have the opposite spin Fermi contour. So what will happen if we inject a pure spin current in the G direction, then there will be a spin accumulation in the opposite because of the shift of the Fermi contour. So the, the corresponding charge current will be in the X direction. So that can be defined by the Fermi velocity and the time relaxation time. So this effect is called inverse address time effect. So the difference between the two is that this is a bulk effect However, this is only purely surface effect, interface or surface effect. So here also we define a quantity that is called inverse Edelstein effect characteristic length, which is also the similar, in which which tells about the how much efficiency from a spin current to charge conversion is there. So let's understand what kind of problems in spintronics we are facing in to understand. So if you have a output power, then you can, you and then you can. Uh, be defined by a resistance of your device and the corresponding spin to charge conversion efficiency. Either it is through inverse spin hall effect or inverse address time effect. So I try to compare uh, the various material, various interfaces to understand which one is the more powerful in this direction. So this is the spin to charge conversion efficiency for the various combination of the interfaces and the material. So one thing is very clear, the inverse Edelstein effect is more powerful in comparison to the inverse spin hall effect. So the spin to charge conversion efficiency can be achieved uh, manifold in comparison to the bulk effect, which is inverse spin hall effect. So what are the questions which is arising? That because if you see different interfaces are showing different value of the spin to charge conversion efficiency. So how we can tune this interfaces so that we can achieve a maximum value and also it is reproducible in that so in the in that way. So what are the people have already attempted? So people have already done work on the topological insulator, specifically bismuth selenide, but they are epitaxially grown by molecular beam epitaxy or other techniques. So the question arises that what will happen if you use a polycrystalline nature? 
So topological surface states will be prevail or not prevail. What will be the effect? I wrote this project in 2016 uh, as was Inspire. That time I was not having any theoretical inputs that what will, this was my understanding that I have worked on the epitaxial bismuth cell and I, so what will happen to the polycrystalline nature? Will it be there or not? Because theory become complex when you go to the amorphous or polycrystalline. And this is very easy when you have the epitaxial. So in 2017, I found this paper from the ISC Bangalore. And this was very interesting. They have shown that surface state may preserve in case of the MR first topological insulator. So in this direction, we have performed some work to measure spin to charge conversion on the polycrystalline bismuth cell and I. So in that way, we have fabricated the sample structure. So uh, the important thing is that here we are using silicon oxide. So that's also another advantage over epitaxial because of course, epitaxial requires expensive substrate like STO, sapphire, like that. But here it's silicon oxide. So we have uh, varied the thickness of bismuth selenide from three to 20 nanometer and the cobalt iron boron five nanometer and we cap with the tantalum oxide. So these are the interface characterized. This is X-ray reflectivity data. So you can see red one is the fitted and uh, uh, open circular experimental. So we have observed the interface roughness is quite good, 0.7 to 0.1 nanometer, 1.7 nanometer. So let's understand how to measure the spin to charge conversion efficiency. So we have a, the sample structure and then we have a coplanar wave guide. So we are injecting a, a particular radio frequency field, which is at a five to 17 gigahertz and which is creating a precession in this ferromagnetic layer. So how is the function is working in that way? Let's understand. So we know that there is exchange coupled uh, spins in the typical ferromagnet. So when you, you ap uh, apply a ferromagnetic frequency, which is microwave magnetic field, let's try to process around this one. But there is a, another uh, torque, which is scoring. This is try to damp the system. So the magnetization will be aligned align along the effective magnetic field. This is governed by landau lipschitz gilbert equation. So alpha effective, basically damping. So how fast your system is getting aligned toward the effective magnetic field. So it means if you are continuously pumping through a microwave field, then you can have a precession for a longer time. So the, this is governed by a continuity equation. So there is a term that is called effective spin mixing conductance, which is given by this equation. It means if you have a effective spin mixing conductance larger than your efficiency from the transform of the spin current from the ferromagnetic to the, your topological insulator will be high. So what kind of data we can see in that way? So this is a typical uh, measurement data. So this is FMR signal, typical FMR signal, which is the resonance. And this is the DC voltage that we have measured in um, nanovolt meter. So there are a few parameters. So symmetric and asymmetric component can, components can be deconvoluted by a Lorentzian function. So important thing is that inverse spin hall effect or inverse Edelstein effect will be having a symmetric nature. However, other which are not useful in this context and isotropic magnet resonance and anomalous hall effect, which is due to the ferromagnetic layer. So these are no more normally contributing in the asymmetric, but they are also partly con contributing in the symmetric part. So in this uh, first observation is that the symmetric part is dominating. So we can say there is a domination of the spin pumping. So let's understand how to evaluate the damping constant. So we have performed a frequency dependent resonance magnetic field. This is a typical data for uh, all the samples. And then we use a Kittel resonance conditions to find out resonance magnetic field. And then we first line width versus frequency also gives you the tip this effect alpha. So alpha is higher in, in comparison to the single layer but that I will discuss later. So that's very important uh, because your spin pumping is giving you another relaxation which increase your damping constant. So, but there is another phenomena that's called two magnon scattering, which can also enhance your line width of the uh, sample. And in that way, what will happen? You will have the higher value of the damping constant. So to check this one, we have performed a line width versus polar angle. So at the 90 degree, whenever you're applying a magnetic field, that time your, you will not have the two magnon scattering. So if you have here two magnet scattering, then damping line width should decrease. How it will be? It's like this. You see this 
data from a paper, Liu et al. So this is one nanometer cobalt iron boron. This is four nanometer cobalt iron boron. So if you have a one nanometer, you can see there is a dip at the 90 degrees. It means at the 90 degree, you will have the um, minimal contribution from the two magnet scattering. But when you go to four nanometer, so it is continuously increasing up to 90 degree. It means there is a uh, no two magnet scattering. So similar behavior is uh, uh, we are observing because our thickness is about five nanometer. So in that way, we can say that two, the, the line width is not coming uh, from the two magnon scattering. So we can still say that it is coming from the spin pumping. There are further, we have performed a frequency dependent spin, inverse spin hall effect measurement to know at what particular frequency we are getting the maximum value of the inverse spin hall effect. So here you can see seven gigahertz and 6.5 gigahertz, we are getting the maximum value. This is typical ferromagnetic resonance spectra. So for that, we, we have fixed the frequency 6.5 gigahertz. So it is noted here that the precession angle is less than one degree in our case that we have measured. So the, this is uh, not coming from the other spiritual effective. So, so 6.5 gigahertz we, we use to measure all the, so there is another thing to understand that there are other effects which is contributing symmetry as I already discussed earlier. So, the, so for that, we need to perform an angle dependent. For example, here phi is equal to zero and 80, this is reversing because your voltage corresponding will be get reverse because of the applied magnetic field and, and the spin polarization cross product. So therefore the data will be like this symmetric component will be behave like this with respect to the in-plane angle. So we use a equation, which is basically having various components, spin pumping voltage, and then in an anomalous Hall effect and the AMR uh, perpendicular. So which is basically the field direction and AMR parallel. So basically AMR parallel means planar Hall effect. Basically we can see in that way. So we use this uh, equation to fit this one. like this, this is AMR or pendular component. And this is parallel component, which is like this. So we have evaluated all these component and we have quantified true spin pumping voltage by this analysis. This is very important, but otherwise it will give you wrong value of the spin to charge conversion efficiency. <clears throat> so let's look at the damping. So this is the damping for the various thickness of the bismuth cell and I. So this uh, is the damping for the single layer. As I already discussed, this is lower than the comp in, in relative to the other sample. So it looks that there is a uh, higher value of the damping. We have also evaluated one more quantity that is called spin mixing conductance using this equation. So this is very important because this will tell you the efficiency of the interface of the topological insulator and your ferromagnetic layer. So we can see we are not we are not observing any trend. What kind of trend we can see here, which is governed by spin diffusion theory? Let us see. So this is also the work uh, we have done with the collaboration with Professor Seki and Professor Takanasi. So G effective in a uh, typical uh, heavy metal and ferromagnetic system will be like this. It will get saturated because your spin to charge conversion efficiency is fully converted in at that particular thickness that is basically twice of your spin diffusion length. But this is not the case in our in the system. So it means the spin diffusion theory is not applicable in our topological insulator. So what could be the <coughs> possibility? So in that way, we have performed a voltage measurement with the thickness you see, and we use this equation <coughs> to evaluate the spin hall angle here. So and then spin diffusion length. So 2.3 nanometer is the spin diffusion length. So it is important to notice here that uh, people have already reported the surface states only preserve only uh, uh, preserve up to 2 to 3 nanometer. So this speed, spin diffusion length is up to 2.3 nanometers. Also evidence that it is a surf, surface or interface effect rather than a bulk effect. Further, we have evaluated the spin hall angle and see how is it varying with the thickness of the bismuth cell. And here also we can see 
there is no particular trend it is first increasing and then decreasing so what kind of trend is also we are looking for if we consider a bulk effect which is governed by spin diffusion length let's look at this so this is typical platinum ferromagnetic system so you will get a saturation after a certain thickness that is basically twice of your spin diffusion length so it means spin diffusion theory is not applicable there are some other effect which may be the inverse edelstein effect so this is a big question so in that uh, way we have evaluated spin to charge conversion efficiency as inverse edelstein characteristic length so you can see here red one this is increasing with the thickness of the bismuth selenide so so it means we are observing the maximum value of the spin to charge conversion at the value of 20 nanometer of bismuth selenide but important thing is that which we have observed a new thing if we try to correlate with the perpendicular anisotropy so perpendicular anisotropy we have <coughs> plotted also we can see whenever bismuth selenide is uh, zero it means the single layer of cobalt this is showing the positive value so here it is important this is negative means it is showing the perpendicular component of the ferromagnetic so he, he, this is the perpendicular component of the cobalt iron boron me is showing the negative it's positive means it is in play <laughs> So, uh, so from where it is originating? So it is originating from the exchange in interaction. So um, uh, that is basically spin of the surface state of the topological insulator and spins of the cobalt iron boron. So that is creating basically a perpendicular anisotropy. This is the first time we try to understand the correlation between spin to charge conversion efficiency and uh, perpendicular anisotropy constant. So the important thing is that when you have a large value of the <coughs> uh, uh, perpendicular anisotropy you have the low spin to charge conversion efficiency so it means if perpendicular anisotropy of the system in the magnetic layer can help to understand the spin to charge conversion efficiency in our case so if we compare with the whatever people have reported so we can say we have observed highest value which is very close to the mahendra et al in nano letter they have also used the polycrystal and using sputtering we have used electron beam vibration so it means and this is epitaxis so it means it is very clear that polycrystalline nature or amorphous nature can enhance spin to charge conversion efficiency so we try to understand why we are getting the highest value depending on the literature whatever people have reported so for that we have performed a high resolution transmission electromicroscopy images and then we have observed that there are some kind of amorphous region there are some crystalline gray regions so it is not a fully crystalline uh, region in bismuth selenide so this may cause a <laughs> for for the high spin to charge conversion efficiency so in this direction mahendra natal which is a group from a <laughs> university of minnesota has reported that quantum confinement can be a one region to enhance the spin to charge conversion because it will modify the electronic state so they have performed simulations uh, in that direction so this is telling the spin to charge conversion efficiency this is and this is grain size so they are observing a particular grain size they are observing higher value in comparison to the other grain size so this is one possible reason that people have reported however we could not fully understand what is the possible reason but and try to look the literature so literature is saying that even amorphous uh, bismuth selenide can have the surface state because time reversal symmetry is there but only special symmetry is broken so this is the recent paper that i have seen on the archive they have uh, performed a angle resolved photo emission spectroscopy to uh, see in the amorphous bismuth selenide so this was about uh, 10 nanometer thickness and they have observed this kind of surface states so it means it is possible there are other uh, reports which are saying that their dislocations also can have the surface conducting states and how they can affect on the spin to charge conversion need to be understand there is another report from Jassim Japan that if you have a selenium deficient uh, selenium ordering then that can also create a topological uh, surface state so we need to understand what is so till now it's not fully understand uh, in terms of the dirty regime if you consider that what will happen to surface state, but it looks that uh, I would say dirty topological insulators are more efficient in terms in, in, in the spintronics rather than epitaxial because we have observed high spin to charge conversion efficiency and other people have also observed so that 
so it means this need to be understand so i can conclude my work so we have uh, successfully fabricated bismuth selenide using lactone operation so this was first unique kind and then we have observed highest spin to charge conversion via inverse Edel's time effect which is still now highest in this direction so we can go to the future aspect to make a spin orbital talk devices so that we can harness this property of high spin to charge conversion efficiency in 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 this uh, particular device so i would like to acknowledge to my collaborator especially puspanka vedanta who's uh, <coughs> with i'm working closely and thank you for your kind attention <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Brett, for a very wonderful talk. Yes, uh, yeah, it's very, really nice to see that how even polycrystalline amorphous can be useful uh, for a particular thing. And your uh, end slides are telling that how the data design is going to be useful. Thanks a lot. So there are uh, yeah some uh, questions. The first question, uh, is cobalt iron boron deposited with EB in operation? I believe it is sputtering, but you can answer. Yes, yeah, it's, it's sputtering, yeah. Yeah, uh, I know that I have read this paper. And uh, I request, uh, Professor Ashwin to ask the question. You kindly unmute and ask. Professor Ashwin, you may kindly unmute and ask the question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, Professor Ashwin, we can yeah, hear you. Yeah, uh, yes, uh, th thank you for the nice talk. Uh, so I have a question that, so this uh, higher efficiency, is it because of the extrinsic effects? Or... Uh, uh, extrinsic effects? Uh, is it's not uh, coming from the band structure effect, but rather some defects in the solid or something? Uh, for that, I cannot comment. That we also don't know. Actually, there are um, not much understanding. We try to understand because we don't have any theoretical input, but we have some literature which is showing that it can also affect, actually. If you have uh, grain boundaries or you can have dislocation, also it can give you additional electronic state, which how is it affecting to spin to charge conversion efficiency? That understanding we do not have actually till now. And other question is that uh, did you try to put something like copper between the bismuth selenide and ferromagnet? Yeah, not to copper. Separate out yeah, interface. not copper, but MGO we have done because MGO always block the spin current, right? So that I didn't show actually. So that was in uh, you can see in the, my in the paper supplementary. So that was completely blocking out. So yeah, that we have done it to separate that. So there was but if no you put copper, uh, it will allow the spin current, but it can uh, reduce the Rajba coupling and yeah, so that can reduce. Yeah, that we have not done uh, because our purpose was uh, uh, not at that time different. But we are going to do this next uh, uh, in, in the next proposal. Yeah. Because people, okay. people have done this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ashwin. Professor uh, Anil Kumar, would you kindly? Yes, thank you. When, uh, yeah. yeah, Dr. Bharat Bhushan, uh, very nice talk, very interesting work. I just wanted to give an additional information. You know, you spoke about this amorphous uh, topological insulator from the theoretical point of view from Adip's work. Yeah. And also, uh, there is an experimental work also, which says, you know, if you have nanocrystals of uh, topological insulator, BI to AC3, like you know, 10 nanometer by 2 nanometer by 2 nanometer slabs. So there also the surface states are preserved and you know, about 20 nanometer, you have even decoupled surface states. It's an experimental work that's also available. So I just wanted to point out. Oh, thank you. Thank you, sir. I will read it that. Thank you, uh, thank you Professor Anil uh, for pointing out that. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Mudli, you please go ahead. Professor Mudli, please unmute and then you can ask. Ah, hello. Yeah, I was, uh, Braj, I was wondering about this uh, one data you showed about the spin diffusion length of platinum. Uh, that uh, is also from your work, right? Uh, yep. Yeah. But 7.5 nanometer looks very large for platinum. Uh, um, don't you think? I I huh? think, sir, you already know there is scattered result, right? Up to people have shown 10 nanometer also. So, uh, I mean, it, there is a lot of scattered result. Uh, 1.5 nanometer to 10 nanometer, you will find lots of results. But we are observing 7.5 nanometer. 
so uh, okay yeah. um, but uh, I, i think the, the thickness range your starts from 5 nanometer you know no 3 uh, nanometer huh? what is the lowest thickness you have 3 3 nanometer 3 okay because there are reports of even less than 3 you know so <laughs> if the okay. diffusion length is because you don't have data points in that region right so uh, uh, so the yeah but our trend is uh, showing that okay yeah that you you are right on that point but if you can see trend then uh, yeah that would be good that we would have a lower data point there so no. okay yeah thank you uh, professor madli yeah, i think uh, due to time constraint we have to move on So uh, I request uh, Professor Vedanta to present the block. So yeah, I take uh, pleasure to present this block to my brother, <laughs> Brazway. So this uh, Indo-Japan workshop on interface phenomena for spintronics, jointly organized by NICER and uh, IMR. Tohoku University takes immense pleasure in uh, presenting this plug to Dr. Brazbhushan Singh for his uh, nice talk on the spin to charge thank conversion you. in polycrystalline top length insulator. Thank you. Your talk has. Uh, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chandra. Okay. Very good. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye. So could you kindly stop? Yeah, I think. Yeah, already, yeah. Thank you, Braj. Very nice talk. Thank you, Braj. Very nice talk. So, yeah moving on uh, the next uh, talk uh, in this uh, session 2 will be delivered by professor uh, p s anilkumar on the asymmetric magnetic domain wall motion under lateral and normal space inversion symmetry asymmetry with interfacial dmi jelensky mori interaction so uh, i request uh, professor uh, anilkumar to yeah so kindly uh, present Uh, professor anil kumar you kindly unmute yeah, yeah. Uh, can you hear me now yeah. yes yes so uh, thank you professor chandrashekhar let me thank uh, professor shubhangar and other co organizers for this uh, indo japan workshop on interface phenomena for spintronics so i'll be talking about uh, the, the perpendicularly magnetized uh, systems and uh, uh, excuse me some some part of this work i have presented earlier so for some people it will be part repetition so this work is uh, mainly carried carried out by uh, mr shaubik uh, kail and uh, some of the work which i am showing about uh, dr vinith mohan who is a faculty now at uh, kochi university uh, he initiated this work earlier in my research group just to give an introduction to so just to give an introduction to this area you know all of us know that we have hard disk media where magnetic medium is uh, used to hold the information for example if i have a magnet with the north pole upward so this can be stated as a zero state and when the north pole is downwards you can say it's a one state so zero and one so that's how we store information to store information you need to write information on your hard disk media so you have a writing head where if you pass current through this uh, this yoke you know that creates a local magnetic field and then you move this uh, media just below it this yoke and you write zeros and ones and it is known that this needs enormously large amount of current to write this information that means uh, more energy is needed to uh, keep information or write information onto the hard disks so then uh, later on people came up with an idea of uh, spin transfer talk uh, material that means uh, a magnetic a uh, domain wall can be moved by passing a spin polarized current through this so this is the basic principle of spin transfer torque ram and people say that look you can again create zeros and one in a magnetic random access memory and this uh, magnetization states can be switched by using electrical current so that is the uh, principle of stt ram and also we know about the race track memory uh, where you know by applying an electrical current you can switch uh, move the magnetic domains and with a read head at the bottom you can read this zeros and ones so these are all active areas of research but it was found that and i mean to give some more examples you know there are it is proven that you know if you have two ferromagnetic layers separated by a non ferromagnetic metallic layer 
you can achieve uh, you know uh, magnetization reversal by applying electrical current so then now people are looking for alternative means of switching magnetization uh, earlier it was by applying a magnetic field then by electrical current now this electrical current is very high so that's why people started thinking about you know alternate ways of reducing this uh, electrical current required for the magnetization reversal one such effect is uh, the spin orbit interaction that can be used and uh, using the spin hall effect you can see that you know you can have the one which uh, mr uh, dr brejbushan was talking about so for example in a no normal hall effect you apply a magnetic field and you pass electrical current you get a charge accumulation later on it was shown that in a ferromagnetic material by passing current if it is magnetized in one particular direction you have again charge accumulation and if you reverse the magnetization the charge accumulation flips so now in 2004 it was shown that there is some, something called spin hall effect where if you take a heavy metal and if you pass electrical current through it there is going to be charge separation as uh, i mean a spin separation as was pointed out in the previous lecture so now what happens is that you know if you take this uh, uh, a material like platinum and you see that if you pass electrical current through it the spins of one type will get accumulated on to the top surface another type on the bottom surface and similarly one type of spins on the left surface and another type of spin on the right surface so then people thought that okay let us reduce the thickness so that uh, you have you know you only worry about the top and bottom surface so at the top surface spins of one type will get accumulated and the bottom surface the spin of the other type will get accumulated now people thought that you know if I, if they use this accumulated spin to exert a torque onto a ferromagnetic layer which is kept on top of it then you should be in a position to switch the magnetization by uh, applying electrical current so with that re uh, reason sometime back we also started this work where we have an heavy metal uh, layer like a platinum and then a cobalt layer which is with a very thin a uh, cobalt layer which is perpendicularly magnetized you you see that after passing a current through this uh, structure you are in a position to reverse the magnetization of this cobalt perpendicularly magnetized cobalt layer so it's it's not that uh, straightforward to do it but you know there are a lot of tricks are involved here so now let us come back and do a review and if you look at the spin transfer torque you you see that you know the current density that is needed to switch the magnetization is 10 to the power 12 ampere per meter square so then you know from there if you move to spin orbit torque you know the the current density was first reduced by an order of magnitude then two orders of magnitude so that is a, a thing that is happening in the uh, in the research arena where people are trying to reduce this critical current that is required to switch the magnetization as low as possible so if you if you can reduce this current required to switch the magnetization by an order of magnitude what you what you what you save is you know two orders of magnitude in terms of energy because the joule heating is i squared r there so there is a considerable effort to reduce this uh, switching current in this way. so uh, the 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 main quest in this kind of area is, is to design a heavy metal ferromagnet heavy metal based electrode structures to make low power consuming electrical devices now let me just get into the uh, experimental aspects we do all these experiments which i am going to show here in a ultra high vacuum sputter deposition system which is home made home made in the sense that we assemble the system with uh, our own design so we have multiple targets in you know couple of uh, chambers so you can move samples from one chamber to the other chamber etc so in this particular system we are you know for example we have platinum tantalum cobalt copper or sometimes we use uh, cofb some of the work which i'm going to show is about cobalt iron borrowed so this is all done by sputter deposition and in a ultra high vacuum chamber now suppose now if i consider a a, a trilayer system like you know platinum cobalt platinum this is just to show that you know 0.44 nanometers of cobalt sandwiched between two platinum layers uh, this bottom platinum layer is 4 nanometer and the top platinum layer is 1 nanometer here you know we are creating a sort of asymmetry because even though the uh, bottom and top layers are platinum but the thickness of the platinum is uh, made such a way that the top platinum will not contribute 
to uh, the spin accumulation at this interface because it is much lower than the, uh, the length that is needed to separate the spins to uh, either surfaces. So in that sense, there is already an asymmetry as far as in the vertical direction is concerned. If I look at the curve rotation here as a function of applied magnetic field, you see beautiful square hysteresis loop. This tells me that you know I can switch the magnetization from the up magnetized state to the down magnetized state in a very uh, controlled manner. And another system that uh, you know we are using all in all of our experiments is uh, a curve imaging setup. So it's a uh, curve imaging system with the possibility of applying a vertical magnetic field and a horizontal uh, in-plane magnetic field. And the sample is kept here. And uh, this is also backed with Hall sensors to make sure that you know, when you talk about in-plane magnetic field, there is no perpendicular magnetic field in the system. And also we have a stage where we can tilt the sample the way we want to align the sample in such a way that there is no outer plane magnetic field if you apply in-plane uh, magnetic field. And so this is a special system. This is, um, uh, this is a commercial system. The microscope is a commercial system, which have been modified by us in, uh, in terms of introducing our own designed magnets so that this is a specially designed magnets to make sure that we have homogeneity as well as the control as well as the direction of magnetic field is concerned. And this curve microscopy we use, oh, I missed the animation, yeah. This curve microscopy I, uh, we use to you know, image these magnetic domains. See, for example, this was a continuous film to begin with, and then you remove materials by lithographic techniques here, and then you create a pad like this. And now if you apply a, a magnetic field, you see the magnetization is switched. And at any pixel, any small area, if you look at, and then you start collecting this information in terms of uh, you know, the curve rotation versus the magnetic field, you see this square hysteresis loop. At the same structure, if I pass electrical current, so it's a pulsed electric current, you see now my x-axis is changed to ampere per centimeter square and the y-axis is the magnetization. And here you see that the current density in this region is sufficient to switch the magnetization. So light color means it's magnetized towards me, black color means it's magnetized towards you. So, so now we have all the techniques to look at the magnetic domains, domain walls, and also this uh, uh, system. And now let me just show you some you know, interesting results, what I talk about this asymmetric magnetic domain wall motion. So if I deposit platinum, say we, we always use a tantalum buffer layer just uh, on top of silicon, silicon dioxide substrate, and we vary the platinum thickness, and we deposit a very thin layer of cobalt and boron, which is 0.4 nanometer and capped with again one nanometers of platinum. And we do X-ray reflectivity analysis to get you know, the interfacial reference thickness of individual films, et cetera. So with that, you know, I just wanted to tell you here, uh, we have made a, a, a very, very uh, slight variation as far as the thickness is concerned. There's a thickness gradient. So the, this figure is an over-exaggeration of the thickness gradient. If, you, if I really want to quantify if I take a one centimeter square wafer, and if I deposit say 50 nanometers of COFEB from left end to the right end, uh, hardly you will have five to six nanometers of thickness variation. Say 46 nanometer here and 50 nanometer there. Now, if you imagine that, you know, if I start reducing this thickness down to 0.4 nanometer, you will see between the left and right, you won't even see an atomic step difference. But what I can confidently say that the number of COFEB atoms in this corner, in this side will be much higher than in this side, not much higher than this side. So that leads to a slight thickness gradient in this direction. So that thickness gradient, you will see introduces a tilt in the magnetization. And by careful experimentation, we can also find out what is the amount of tilt of this magnetization. Actually for a deterministic switching, if it is perpendicularly magnetized, you need an in-plane magnetic field to you know, break the symmetry. So for a deterministic switching, you need an in-plane magnetic field. But if your magnetization is intrinsically tilted, then with that tilt itself, even in the absence of an in-plane magnetic field, you can do a deterministic magnetic switching. So what we do, we do this, uh, you know, the magnetization reversal as a function of various in-plane applied magnetic fields and then see the shift in the hysteresis loop. 
that the shift in the hill hysteresis slope we plot for different angles of the applied field with respect to the sample for different different angles you vary this in plane magnetic field and you measure this delta hc which is the shift in the hysteresis slope so then for different applied in plane fields you get you know with a straight lines so you find out the slope of these straight lines and then plot as a function of this angle phi then you get curves like this and finally you fit it to this equation and you can estimate the thickness uh, the, the the tilt in the magnetization in the samples that we are working on see for example here you get c0.54 plus minus 0.02 so we have a fairly good control over uh, the calculation or the estimation of the tilt in this uh, samples now comes uh, another interesting thing suppose if i am going to you know nucleate a bubble domain okay let it be i should have brought it after this so now uh, all of us know that you know since it's a, a symposium on spintronics i don't have to spend more time on this javorshinsky moria interaction so people have found that this javorshinsky moria interaction can be thought of an in plane magnetic field in the system so that means if i nucleate a bubble domain in my system now this bubble domain if i try to expand because of this in plane magnetic field that is present there this expansion of this magnetic domain wall will be asymmetric and also i am in a position to calculate the velocity of this domain wall motion uh, by applying pulsed magnetic field so for example if i have nucleated a bubble domain like this now if i apply a pulsed magnetic field of say 5.2 milli tesla with a time scale uh, uh, time stamp of 10 millisecond so this magnetic domain wall expands so i mean uh, the, the magnetic domain expands so that there, there's a domain wall motion so for each pulse we know the distance traveled by this uh, domain wall so from that we can calculate the velocity of this domain wall so that is another way uh, you know that we get whether it's a symmetric expansion or an asymmetric expansion now you apply an in plane magnetic field as well so now what happens this in plane magnetic field is superimposed by the dmi field that is present in the system because of that there is an asymmetric expansion of the magnetic domain wall from these expansions we can really find out many parameters as far as the system is concerned for example if i'm looking at the creep regime you can see that the velocity of this domain wall takes this particular form or if you look at the domain wall energy it takes this particular form for you know for different conditions and that means if i plot the domain wall energy as a function of the longitude and field you apply suppose if there was no dmi field then what happens this will take this particular form and it, it gives a maximum at zero field now depending upon the amount of or the strength of the dmi field this can sh shift away from this origin and then that maximum will tell me about the dmi field for example i can uh, you know calculate the domain wall velocity as a function of applied in plane field and from the shift in this uh, curve i can estimate the uh, dmi field in this kind of systems for example if i just plot this hx as a function of domain wall velocity you see the minima from this minima we can estimate uh, the shift of this thing from the origin we can estimate the uh, dmi field for example if for different sample we are in a position to estimate the dmi field in the system and also if i just wanted to tell you some more interesting results if you look at the platinum thickness variation so it is tantalum platinum cofb platinum layer you can see that you know the effective uh, uh, dm interaction if you find out as a function of platinum thickness that you know it varies like that and also we get a small sign towards and also here so these are all interesting results and now we are getting some more results where we are putting platinum uh, cobalt or cofb with a gold interfacial layer we see drastic effects as far as the dm interaction is concerned and and also we looked at the various uh, films uh, for looking at the current induced magnetization reversal so our aim is to make sure that you know we have minimum current that is required to do the magnetization reversal so here this is a system where if you have there is no thickness gradient in cofeb layer 
you will see that with a zero applied magnetic field, you don't have a zero applied in plane magnetic field, you don't have any deterministic switching. Whereas if you apply an in plane magnetic field of four millitesla, you see that very sharp hysteresis loop with a current density of, of the order of 10 power 11 ampere per meter square. So, and then we do a lot of interface engineering here. And we can also calculate the spin out orbit torque efficiency as a function of this applied in plane field. And of late, what we have found is that the saturation field, which we are getting in this spin orbit torque efficiency, is matching exactly with the DMI field that we are calculating from uh, other method. So now we, we slowly understand that you know this saturation field also can be used as one of the method to measure the DMI interaction or the, the, the field uh, uh, in DMI in this kind of a system. Here you see that without any in-plane applied magnetic field, you don't get a determinic switching because you have a symmetric or you have a uniform cobalt ion borrowed system. But on the other hand, if you start introducing a tilt in the system, uh, you see that if it is in along this direction, again at zero field, you don't get a deterministic switching. But whereas if you look at the 90 degree uh, uh, side, you will see that even at a zero millitesla magnetic in plane magnetic field, you get deterministic magnetic switching. So now in this kind of systems with the help of the microscopy, we are in a position to, and also you see here, you see a deterministic switching here. So there's no uh, gray area like what I have plotted there. So this all tells you that, you know, with this curve microscopy and you can start manipulating the DM, DM interaction in this kind of systems. And also you can play with the current in, or you play with the system and then reduce the current density uh, further down. So, and also sometimes we use um, a thick cobalt ion boron, for example, 2.46 nanometers of thick cobalt ion boron system to get an in-plane magnetic field and that in-plane, uh, that in-plane magnetic field sometimes act as a field that is required, uh, which is compensating for the in-plane magnetic field. And you see in this particular system, because of that layer, even at zero millitesla, we are able to switch the magnetization. And also we do you know, much more optimizations in, in, in different systems. And also let me just uh, come to another system where we now start playing with the spin hole angle. See, for example, in this particular case, if I have this cobalt ion boron, which is now brought to the bottom layer, and this gives you a stray magnetic field, and then you have tantalum platinum layer and a thin COFEB layer with, with, with a gradient, and you put a very thin layer of platinum, and then you deposit tantalum. So if I deposit tantalum directly on COFEB, the COFEB perpendicular magnetization gets completely affected. So we do a very thin layer of 0.4 nanometer. This is not even giving you a full atomic coverage, but uh, this is enhancing, I mean, this is protecting the COFEB from this tantalum uh, deposition. So now the advantage is that platinum has an opposite spin, out, spin hole angle compared to tantalum. So the effect is that the effective spin accumulation from both the sides will be helping us to switch the magnetization. And indeed that is happening. So all this transparency will have a lot of parameters. These are all the interface reference because there are multi-layer stacks. So you deposit different, different layers and then do the analysis. And very often our estimated thickness, I mean, the intended thickness and the estimated thickness is uh, almost same because we do very periodic calibration of thickness in our systems. And interestingly here, what you see that, you know, you see, Without an in-plane magnetic field, you are able to switch the magnetization. Now the current density has come down drastically. Now you know it is an order of magnitude low, which is 10 power 10 ampere per meter square now. And if I if I proceed further, you see that a particular sample, you know, we have made a series of samples. A particular sample has got current density as low as 1.9 into 10 power 10 ampere per meter square. So we are in a constant drive to improve this uh, current density that is um, achievable in the system. So our aim is to you know, go this down further by looking at novel um, combination of materials. See, this is one structure that we have designed uh, very recently to get 
this data and we are now further tuning this system with other kind of materials as well so with this let me just uh, conclude i was just showing you that look you know the magnetic domain wall can have an asymmetric expansion because of the in plane uh, dmi field that is there in the system and you can also estimate the dmi field from uh, these measurements you can also measure the tilt in the magnetization with uh, with an accuracy of you know less than 0.1 degree and also we achieved a very good uh, you know magnetization reversal at very low uh, critical currents with this let me just stop my talk thank you thank you professor anil kumar a very wonderful talk and then uh, i really enjoyed the <laughs> that so we are going to feel free uh, spin out with torque switching that, that is what i understand from your talk <laughs> that we are moving to what's that uh, using this jelinski mori interaction now the talk is open for uh, uh, discussion people may raise their hand and ask questions um can i ask a question yeah please please go ahead yes so uh, very nice talk anil uh, i really enjoyed uh, towards end i think you just saw that the current density became like 10 to the power 10 order uh, for the uh, platinum cobalt platinum where you, yes this one so what is the key physics happening that the jesse value was reduced um, the the key is that you have platinum and tantalum don't consider this platinum which is extremely thin these two have opposite spin okay. holding so in that sense earlier i could not increase the thickness of this platinum because if i increase the thickness of this platinum to say 3 nanometer then it is a symmetric structure and there won't be any switching because the spin accumulation from the top and the bottom cancels out now what is happening is that you are increasing the thickness of this tantalum so the spin accumulation that is coming from this tantalum is opposite to this platinum so that there is an enhanced if you calculate the spin hole angle the effective spin hole angle it is going about 0.24 ashwin uh, no no just uh, just one more clarification thank you for that uh now in this talk you have shown like this wedge shape uh, cobalt iron boron you explained in the beginning that there is a little bit of non uniformity but in this case it was like desired i mean you you wanted to have this kind or this just comes see actually i wanted see the thing is that if i if i show you earlier i can get uh, without the gradient also see okay, so then what is the advantage gradient. of having this gradient see see the point is like this we are depositing at an angle and when you do a deposition at an angle you have a thickness gradient if you don't want thickness gradient you rotate your substrate so that it's a uniform flow and if you want a gradient you don't rotate the film for that particular layer see here when you deposit platinum tantalum you rotate the substrate and for depositing platinum you rotate the substrate but when you deposit cofeb don't rotate the substrate so there is a very very small thickness gradient no. that that i understand on we also yeah. do that but i want actually my question was what is the advantage of having this uh, kind of gradient in the ferromagnetic yeah the point is that then you have a tilt see suppose if i don't do this uh, rotation i don't have a tilt in magnetization it is perfectly perpendicular magnetization when you have a perpendicular magnetization it can switch that way and then back and forth so you don't get a deterministic switching so you need to break the symmetry how do you break the symmetry by applying an in plane magnetic field right so now if i have a tilt intrinsically in the system without applying a magnetic field you are able to do deterministic switching that's the advantage for example okay let me just you know i was going bit fast here so look at here i'm oh, sorry not this structure uh look at this structure here you see without even applying a ma in plane magnetic field zero milli tesla is my in plane magnetic field i am able to switch the magnetization by some current let us forget about the magnitude whereas if i don't have this thickness gradient at zero milli tesla i won't be able to switch the magnetization that is because of this tilted anisotropy
Okay, so but I think people have shown that uh, if your uh, anisotropy is completely perpendicular to the film plane, you can still uh, make a deterministic switching. Right? You can do a deterministic switching, but you need an in-plane magnetic field, assistance of an in-plane magnetic field. Yes, that's true. Yeah. So here so, you don't need I, an assistance of an in-plane magnetic field. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Shimandi. Uh, uh, Professor Ashwin, please go ahead. You make kindly unmute him. Yeah, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, Andhya, very nice talk. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so my question is that, uh, so if you have this perfectly perpendicular anisotropy, and when you pass current, can you use the magnetic field generated by current to break that symmetry in some way? Yeah, it is possible, but you know, then you may need extremely high current. Uh, that's what I'm guessing at this point of time. You know, we have to see here itself, we are using pulsed current to reduce the dual heating in the system. So if you want to generate an oversted field, and then you'll have to worry about the direction of the field. Uh, Correct. I, I mean, think, so use the same current. Uh, yeah, I understood. Use the same current, but in order to generate a realistic magnetic field, you need higher currents. Right, right. So, yeah, I don't know. So, essentially, we need to estimate and clearly check it. Yeah, we need to estimate that. Yeah. So, and we have done something on that. So, I can just uh, clarify. So, yes, we need 10 over 12 uh, ampere per meter square to generate 200 or state of field. Recently, Okay. okay. We have done some uh, simulation and also we have done experimentally. So you need extremely high current to generate such a small or state field. And usually the implant uh, fields that we need is uh, around 600 or state as you can see. No, no. So we don't need 600 so, uh, state. Uh, sorry, we just need to break the symmetry. Symmetry. But yeah, but for that also the amount of uh, current that we need to apply to create this or state field is going to uh, kind of... Uh, uh, Cross the current that that is required for switching. I mean, this, this is from my from my small understanding. Maybe yeah, I, I can, can I can. We have to do that. some more uh, simulation. We have done some console simulation and also we did some experiment during my PhD. So from there I'm telling. You. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thanks. Thanks both of you. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Ashwin. And uh, um, Chandra, there is one question quickly. Actually, I can there are yeah. questions uh, in the chat box. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah. there was a question to Braj in the past talk. Uh, from Anjana, she wrote is okay. cobalt iron. No, I, I, I read it and then clarified. I read it and clarified that. Yeah. Okay, I missed that. that. Time. Uh, please, yeah. there is a question for only lighting this time. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, I think someone, uh, Yashmin. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you, sir. Question. Uh, the, the question is that what is the advantage of the tantalum underlayer in this stack? See, what happens is that when you have a tantalum underlayer, the quality of the platinum layer can be controlled. For example, the orientation of the platinum uh, layer also determines the quality of the further structure. So if I grow platinum directly on silicon, silicon dioxide, the, there's a mixture of 111 and 100 orientation and all sorts of things. Whereas the good thing about tantalum is that there's a nice buffer layer. So you put tantalum and then the tantalum will decide what should be the growth direction of uh, platinum on top of it. If you look at one of our paper last year, I think uh, on, in BRB, where we estimated the induced magnetization by XRMR measurement on the bottom platinum cobalt interface and the top platinum cobalt interface. And we find that the, the extent of induced magnetization in platinum depends on the thickness of the tantalum layer. And then we investigated why that is happening. And we found that the growth direction of the platinum is getting affected by the tantalum underlayer. But we don't want to put a very large tantalum underlayer as well, very thick tantalum underlayer, because then the current will shunt through that layer as well. Then the current density that is required is much more. So we keep a bare minimum tantalum layer that will help you to grow platinum better. So that's why this particular tantalum layer. Yeah, thank you, sir. So one last so question. What is the role of COFE B composition on switching. Uh, I sh I'm not aware of this because we only did one composition. So unless we do a different composition, and I don't know whether there's any literature available on this, we'll have to look at it, but we have not done it. I mean, unless we do a different composition, I won't be able to comment on the switching. Thank you, sir. 
So maybe uh, we can take one last question from uh, uh, Professor Mudli. Hi, Pranav. You are muted. Sorry, you kindly unmute. Professor Mudli, you have to unmute. Pranava, you are muted. You are muted, sir. Yeah, yeah, now I can. Yeah, please go ahead. I was not able to unmute. Yeah, I was wondering, uh, have you done, uh, got the switching when the tantalum is in direct contact with cold iron bone without that uh, platinum uh, layer? Uh, the, the point is that I think we have some issues with the perpendicular magnetization there because you need a perpendicular magnetization as well. Okay, okay, okay. So the PMA doesn't uh, yeah. happen. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you will have an opportunity to hear from the horse's mouth very soon because you did the evaluation of PhD thesis. <laughs> yeah, this is evaluation. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Anil, uh, for a wonderful talk. And then, uh, yeah, it has raised a lot of interesting questions. So, could you kindly stop the presentation? Yeah, thank you. Where is it? Stop share. And I would request Anil to join tomorrow the uh, poster session because there we will have more discussions in the uh, virtual discussion room, you know. Sure, all, sure, all the speakers, sure. I mean, and definitely Anil. Sure. Okay, so uh, yeah, on behalf of uh, the organizing committee and Professor Shivankar Vedanta, uh, it, it is my immense pleasure to present this uh, plaque to, to Professor Anil Kumar. So, Indo Japan workshop on interface phenomena for uh, spintronics. AJW IPS 2022, jointly organized by NICER and IMR Tohoku University, it takes immense pleasure in pre presenting this plaque to Professor uh, Pia Sanil Kumar in appreciation for being a valuable speaker to give a lecture on asymmetric magnetic domain wall motion under lateral and normal space inversion asymmetry with interfacial Jelansky Mori interaction. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very nice talk. So we have one more interesting talk. Uh, uh, that is the last talk for this uh, today's session. So I request uh, Dr. Uh, Surendra Singh from BARC. So he's going to present on uh, investigation of emerging phenomena at the interface of heterostructure using polarized neutron reflectivity. So I request uh, Dr. Surendra Singh to present his uh, talk. Sir, kindly uh, share your screen. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, is it uh, visible? Yeah, I think it's coming, sir. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah, now it is visible. Okay, uh, the, let me thank uh, first the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share my uh, research work in this forum. And uh, good afternoon to all of you. So, uh, uh, am I am I audible also? Yes, sir. You are very, very much ready. Please go ahead. So I'm going to uh, talk about. Uh, actually, uh, I, I, I also thank uh, Professor Anil Kumar uh, because he has given a nice overview uh, about uh, this uh, phenomenon in the synchronics where we are talking about the reduction in energy. Uh, sorry, uh, current source uh, required for uh, uh, this kind of devices. So. Uh, but the important part of uh, such kind of heterostructures is, uh, is the investigation of the interface phenomena. And uh, polarized neutral reflectivity is one such technique which gives you both uh, structure as well as uh, magnetic uh, depth profiling with a depth resolution of some nanometer uh, length scale. And in this talk, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, two such systems. Uh, first one is uh, uh, cobalt. Uh, uh, gadolinium hydrostructures and uh, these are listed here and, and um, this work is mostly done by my PhD student uh, Dr. Basa and I will be talking about uh, uh, these systems uh, uh, mostly from this paper and I acknowledge here the all the uh, authors listed over here uh, who has uh, contributed in all these publications and uh, and you know this uh, cobalt uh, GD these are the rare earth uh, transfer metal systems. 
which are uh, i mean wide application for spintronics as uh, because they source all this kind of phenomena uh, interfacial phenomena of uh, uh, rasva uh, interactions and also this uh, spin orbit coupling interactions uh, for uh, one side and another side which i'll also talk about is the for uh, all uh, all uh, spin based uh, optical switching uh, components uh, which i'll be talking about also about this system and another system uh, which is uh, i mean very old uh, some where uh, the spintronics uh, was started uh, discussing the ferromagnetic and semiconductor multi layers and uh, what are the difficulties people have faced where uh, people could not achieve that kind of spin accumulation at the interfaces as well as spin transport across these interfaces for possible application of spintronics and i will i will and these are the authors who has contributed in this i acknowledge their contribution so this is the outline of my talk i will little bit since i am talking about this technique so i will also introduce this technique little bit about this and then i am talking about these two techniques these two uh, systems a little bit detail so as you know uh, in the uh, device applications uh, uh, people have pass uh, on uh, this kind of uh, 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 magnetic memories where uh, uh, people thought of making a, a, a first uh, to high density magnetic system and then thought of other application like uh, first uh, people made this kind of magnetic uh, structure recording layers then they switched to the pma which uh, finally they could achieve but recently people are talking about their dynamics i mean the, the kind of uh, uh, how fast uh, you can uh, read and write and what is the power consumption so these two aspect was mostly dealt with uh, when the spintronics uh, subject came to the play and uh, this deals with the uh, kind of uh, all those uh, techniques what deals with the uh, uh, gmr interlayer exchange coupling but in case of spintronics when we talk about so our our magnetic component basically is a spin wall magnetic tunnel junction where there are two magnetically separated by insulator and there was nice uh, overview uh, given by professor anil kumar so uh, this uh, i will just uh, add on to that so uh, as he said the spin uh, uh, stt uh, based uh, systems uh, were introduced and, and actually for application if you see if, if magnetization between these two magnetic layers are anti parallel that gives you the high resistance uh, 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 system and which gives a, a memory of a reading of one and when they are uh, they are parallelly coupled then this gives a low resistance system so it becomes one and zero so as as i said uh, the, this stt system needs a very high uh, electric current density to switch these magnetizations but people are now controlling these switching of magnetization across these uh, devices by using a spin orbit torque where uh, they uh, generate the spin current and then uh, uh, i mean they can switch uh, the uh, corresponding magnetizations of this kind of magnetic devices but recently uh, and uh, this this uh, gt cobalt system has uh, shown contribution a lot in this uh, kind of uh, studies but recently people are talking about uh, uh, all optical uh, magnetic switching because nowadays you know the uh, for propagation of this information technology people are talking about the optical fibers and other things so they are the complete switching from uh, electrical signal uh, or this is spin based signal to the optical signal which has uh, i mean you know the velocity and other things but we need a compatible uh, electronics for that like if we don't have any kind of magnetic uh, magnetic uh, memory device which can switch by optical then uh, there's uh, uh, i mean we'll always have a loss of uh, uh, achieving the high density uh, high uh, 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 high speed uh, 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 this kind of uh, devices so we need so so these optical uh, switching uh, base uh, system this uh, rare earth be, rare earth transfer metal base alloy as well as heterostructure has shown enormous potential because they are what we can do a magnetizer revulsor can be achieved by just putting a optical pulse over there and, and in fact in this uh, in this uh, article people have shown lot of uh, number of uh, systems where they have both alloy as well as the heterostructures where they have shown that this uh, uh, optical uh, signal is switching the uh, magnetic domains and that way one can use that as a uh, memory device for possible applications 
so what 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 uh, is done there is uh, because these rare earth and transient uh, metal based uh, hydrostructure what they so if you see the m versus t uh, plot for these structure so at room temperature for gd cobalt so what happens at room temperature only cobalt is magnetic gd is non magnetic because gd has a magnetic uh, transient temperature of 293k and only cobalt magnetize and it is along the field direction but when you decrease the temperature so gd uh, magnetization develops there and it is because of a strong exchange interaction which is anti ferromagnetic at the interfaces we get this kind of magnetization uh, behavior and at a particular temperature where there is a, 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 a complete uh, mismatch a complete uh, cancellation of magnetic moment of cobalt layer uh, with the gd layer then we get a called something called uh, compensation temperature and then uh, after compensation temperature we go further to low temperature then the cobalt field goes opposite to the applied field and gd because gd moments are uh, uh, higher in this region so gd follow the applied field so this kind of decompensation is very important for this optical based switching uh, uh, type of devices where you have to uh, little bit change in temperature by optical pulse you can change the magnetic phases and that can be used as a magnetic device used for uh, for any applications so uh, first i will uh, talk about the polarized neutral reflectivity so polarized neutral reflectivity is uh, uh, a technique as i said it gives a depth profiling of both magnetics and in fact magnetic structure so here i am showing a picture we have a heterostructure and this incoming neutron is coming and it is reflecting and this is the outgoing neutron so neutron has a you know the spin part so so you have if if you have all the polarizations so 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 what what we are doing this is the in plane of the heterostructure and uh, uh, one of the thing uh, which is desired advantage of any neutron scattering technique is we cannot talk about the magnetization along the perpendicular directions so whatever we are seeing it, it is the in plane magnetic structure so you can you can think of suppose your magnetizer in your layer is sub, at some angle with respect to your applied field so what will happen this neutron spin will go there but because of this component because this magnetizer will have both parallel and perpendicular component with and the perpendicular component will give larmer precision because the spin will precess around that and it will give you the uh, change in polarization on a neutron so if you do uh, if you have a magnetic sample and all the magnetizers are aligned to the field direction then you get the magnetic uh, uh, magnetization depth profile without information of this angle alpha but if you have the system which has this magnetizations in the magnetic layer uh, making a, an angle with applied field then you can get that kind of information also i will show how you can get those kind of things because neutron is seeing both nuclear and the magnetic potential and that helps to uh, study to to get simultaneous the structure as well as the magnetic uh, depth profiling of the magnetic hydrostructure so you can see when you have a magnetic layer where uh, all the uh, all the magnetization of the magnetic suppose this is cobalt copper multilayer i'm showing here so uh, the cobalt multilayer is aligned uh, along the applied field so what i am saying here if you have alpha equal to 0 so in this case you will have two kind of reflectivity one is a spin up reflectivity spin down reflectivity. so here we are not doing analysis neutron analysis after reflection because there won't be any precision because all the magnetization is along the field direction so neutron spin flip is won't be there so we are getting in addition to structure so this is nice uh, scattering line density profile which shows the uh, cobalt copper multilayer we get both nuclear structure as well as the magnetic structure from this but when we have this alpha when we have a uh, 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 there is a definite angle so we can get uh, and we do polarization spin analysis we get all kind of reflectivity like uh, non spin flip where there is no spin flip that like this black uh, curve is shown here and as well as uh, this uh, uh, spin uh, down spin down uh, reflectivity but in addition to do we get Uh, spin flip component and then we can talk about the what is the detailed magnetic structure and that is not in a single layer but in the multi layer structure we can talk about the a different uh, different layer how the magnetization is behaving and that as i said the resolution is sub nanometer length scale so this technique we have used 
and study the uh, different systems. So this is our reflectometer over here, polarized neutron reflectometer, which we use. But right now we don't have this uh, spin analysis as well as we uh, since we have low uh, uh, neutron reflect uh, intensity over here. So we do room temperature measurements only. And uh, the study which I am showing here, uh, the first system GT cobalt multilayer. Uh, these measurements are done at uh, uh, ISIS uh, RAL UK. Okay. So here, what what we have done, we have done a number of study, but I will I will show uh, the data from one particular sample. So here uh, we have drawn a GD cobalt multilayer on a silicon substrate, and we have characterized by different technique. And I will show you uh, uh, the results from this uh, sample. So if you see uh, the XRD and as well as the X-ray reflectivity, XRD is showing nice uh, polymer uh, films of both GD and cobalt. And this shows X-ray reflectivity, so nice multi-layer structure of GD cobalt multi-layer grown on silicon substrate. Whereas uh, the speed data, temperature dependent speed data, if you see, so at room temperature, we have uh, almost uh, the cobalt moment over there. But when we decrease the temperature, so we are getting a kind of shift in the hysteresis loop. And that shift is coming after uh, this compensation temperature which is around 125k in these systems and if you see at low temperature we are getting a shift in uh, 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 this resistor which is showing the exchange bias system uh, happening in this system gt cobalt material and this is also confirmed uh, when we uh, done this uh, squid measurements by flipping the magnetic field it is clearly indicates the exchange bias at 5k so what we, we found is so this, this is the empty data, as I said, this is 125K where we are getting compensation temperature. But if you see, we are getting change in uh, this corrosive field as a function of temperature, as well as the exchange bias. And you can see exchange biases we are getting. So uh, uh, this field actually, uh, this is exchange bias. So, so we are getting negative exchange bias uh, below this temperature, which is compensation temperature and also our uh, HC is divergent or near to this uh, uh, compensation, which is uh, well known uh, for these kind of systems. And the, this actually uh, confirms uh, the measurements on the rare earth transmitters multi-layer system. But when we do the transport measurements, so you can see that these are the uh, temperature dependent transport measurements. So at 300K is like, like a normal uh, um, magnetic multi-layer system. We have uh, near HC, we have these kind of uh, resistivity peak, but when we go to near to this compensation temperature, you can see we are observing a, a, a symmetry in the uh, these peak positions. So, so you can see this is uh, a red one is uh, when we shift from negative field to positive field, and this blue is when the positive field to negative. So we are getting a kind of a symmetry in the resistivity. Uh, this transport data, and uh, again uh, when we cool down further then this uh, there is a uh, kind of a, a, a symmetry but it's not uh, that there is a flip but there is a lot of uh, mismatch around these values so so a lot of uh, things are coming so, so to, to see these uh, characteristics we did polarized neutral reflectivity experiments and we did this uh, because we wanted to see uh, what is happening uh, for the magnetic structure as a depth profiling and uh, these are the polarized neutral reflectivity data from uh, these systems at 300k, 200k, and this is at around a uh, compensation temperature. This is very low temperature. And you can see these are the non spin flip R plus plus, R minus plus signal, where there is no spin flip. And a spin flip coming due to mainly due to the magnetic contribution. Okay. And where, whereas uh, below uh, uh, this uh, compensation temperature, we got a strong uh, spin flip signal also. Okay. So as I said earlier, that uh, from this, what we find out is the uh, what is the magnetizer and what is this angle which is which uh, this magnetic moment in the layer is making with the applied field so this information we can get from these kind of measurements and you can see uh, when we so what what we have done around 300k we don't have any spin uh, uh, flip signal so it says all the magnetic moments are aligned along the applied field, uh, which is uh, reasonable because only cobalt is the magnetic. So we have only the cobalt magnetic moment is aligned. But when we 
reduce the temperature, we could not fit this data, assuming uh, like a single entity of a cobalt layer or GD layer. What we have to do is, if you see here, next uh, figure. So we have we have considered different kind of magnetic uh, structure in this multilayer. So one of the bilayer, we have actually eight bilayers, such eight bilayer. One of the bilayer we are showing, and we have shown around 120. 5k where we have this compensation temperature and we have assumed different kind of magnetic structure see uh, this cobalt is uh, showing uh, along the applied field gd is opposite which we call cobalt aligned but we couldn't get this uh, fit uh, for the experimental data then we as uh, consider gd aligned where gd moment is aligned along the field direction cobalt is opposite still we didn't couldn't fit this data uh, pnr data at 125k then we we, uh, we we consider other kind of structures like helical structures. So in this case, we consider for cobalt helical structure a ZD all aligned along the field direction, but still we couldn't get uh, this kind of uh, best fit for uh, the VNR data. Uh, when we consider the helical structure in the ZD layer and opposite field at uh, opposite magnetic moment in the cobalt layer, uh, there is uh, starting to get uh, good fit, but still there is. Uh, uh, the, this fit is not the one we have uh, got the best fit for this kind of system which is listed over here. So from this best fit what we found is around 300k only cobalt moments are aligned at 200k there is a little bit tilting of the magnetic moment in both cobalt and ZD but almost they are parallel to the applied field but uh, you, there is a uh, exchange uh, uh, interaction which is showing anti-ferromagnetic in this cobalt and ZD binding. But what at 125k we could see a helical magnetic structure like a domain wall, two pi uh, domain wall structure in this case. So 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 we have considered uh, choked different GD uh, sub layers, a single uh, GD layer is choked into different layer and consider different magnetic moment where magnetic moment is rotating in the field. So this is kind of uh, uh, kind of uh, structure we have assumed for analysis of this. Polar internal reflectivity, and we found that at 125k, where there was a compensation, both GD and cobalt soy and the helical magnetic structure with the two pi domain wall kind of things. So, so you have a complete rotation of magnetic moment in the plane, uh, not out of plane, but in the plane. Okay, uh, while at low temperature, cobalt moments is aligned opposite to the applied field, but GD is still showing the. Uh, this helical structure uh, this these measurements are done at 500 or a step so even up to that field we could see there is a realization of helical magnetic magnetic structure in this system and in addition to that we have also done the op specular reflectivity and the nice feature over here is shown here this is a 300k data this is 125 data this is 5k data and these are the non spin ch flip channel this is spin flip channel so spin flip signal coming only because of magnetic signature and you can see here in the spin flip only we could absorb in case of spin flip there is a uh, kind of intensity uh, in the qx direction whereas in case of non spin flip there is no intensity which what we call these are the break positions where we are getting the break peaks because of this multi layer structure and this is called break c so break seat is coming only in the, the non spin uh, this spin flip condition so something is happening vertically in the magnetic structure which is contributing which is contributing to the spin flip and we did the analysis of this this is the experiment data and if you see here these are simulated one so at different temperature these are simulated and we could find out that the break seats in this case the spin flip and there is no break seat in the and what does it say it says It says that there is a this GD layer which we have split in many layer in the middle part of GD, all not whole GD layer, middle part of GD, the which is showing a magnetization perpendicular to the applied field, 90 degree perpendicular applied field. If you see the uh, previous year, so here, here you can see in the bit in the middle part we are seeing the magnetization is per, making a perpendicular and which is 90 degree with respect to applied field. So this these domains in the middle of the GD layer are highly, uh, these are highly correlated, vertically correlated. I mean, what is happening uh, at the middle of the GD layer is repeating in the, all the GD layer and 
there is a domain structure which is of the length of around 1.7 micron domain magnetic domain and which are vertically correlated that's why we are getting this kind and this this also explains the kind of asymmetry we are getting in the transport data so it says that there is a magnetic domain which is making a perpendicular direction with respect to applied field in the gd only not in the cobalt uh, you can see from this so only on the gd and that may be giving you the this kind of asymmetric in the magnetic so summary for this part is uh, we observe uh, uh, negative exchange bias below compensation temperature and that is uh, i mean the literature if you see so this kind of helical magnetic structure can give you the exchange bias we got this asymmetric mr at peak compensation this is mutually perpendicular direction of current magnetic domain and the magnetic field which i just explained because of the this gt name and we found there is a helical magnetic structure are a strong anti ferromagnetic exchange coupling at the interfaces in these systems and as i said this this system has a wide uh, applications so i will i will quickly go to the next system now so this is again an interesting system which is iron germanium based as i said these systems are i mean long back started when spectronics was uh, talked about because uh, we needed a compatibility with the silicon uh, Uh, this uh, uh, the silicon industry i mean with this kind of uh, 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 devices uh, how whether these are compatible or not so this is the one of the system where people have find out uh, uh, kind of uh, this spin or spin orbit in uh, uh, orbit uh, uh, interaction also in this case and find out uh, the whether uh, what is happening uh, whether we can change whether, whether we can transport the spin uh, part of the magnetic moment to the this uh, semiconductor but uh, there was a lot of discussion that uh, people are getting the formation of uh, non magnetic or magnetic dead layer at the interfaces so uh, we also started uh, in this uh, uh, we have done many studies but i will just mention one of them so the related issue was whether there is a magnetic dead layer formation at the interfaces and if alloy form what is the alloy composition so because these alloy which were forming at the interfaces were a magnetic dead layer which were uh, i mean completely suppressing the uh, spintronics application for these materials and if 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 these alloy are magnetic what is the magnetic order temperature for this and for using for uh, i mean using x ray neutron reflectivity which is best technique non destructive technique we could uh, uh, answer few of uh, these questions in this system so our system was uh, we have silicon buffer uh, silicon substrate and then germanium uh, buffer layer was there and then five bi layers of iron germanium and then we did uh, x ray uh, scattering uh, measurements and what we did we did annealing and we found, found that uh, uh, on annealing we there is a alloy formation and then we uh, could analyze what uh, happening with the alloy composition whether that alloy is magnetic or non magnetic all those things we have studied so quickly i will explain over here so uh, uh, around 530 uh, 573k when we annealed the systems so pristine saying nice iron uh, this iron structures and uh, this is iron uh, uh, peak and germanium was the amorphous but when we anneal at 573k and above that we got a alloy phase over here and this the complete miss miss uh, missing of iron uh, black peak only iron 3 germanium uh, peak was obtained and from x ray reflectivity you can see at uh, pristine uh, uh, multi layer we have nice uh, uh, layer structures but when we anneal it we got this kind of single layer which is alloy forming in this system and you see the squid data also so when we anneal it uh, beyond uh, i mean around uh, uh, about 573k we have this kind of uh, 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 field cool and jet field uh, uh, zero field cool data uh, which is showing a kind of uh, uh, asymmetry over here and uh, above that uh, because uh, there was complete uh, multi layer structure so there was no mixing so this is giving a kind of disorder over here and if you see the mx curve also it is showing as a kind of super paramagnetic behavior over there and we did polarized neutral reflectivity at drua uh, because this is room temperature data so we can do over here and we could see the kind of magnetization and and, and we we could see that uh, this uh, on anneling which is making a alloy layer at the interfaces which is ferromagnetic at room temperature 
So this alloy films, and I'm sure that this kind of alloy layer, which is uh, giving the ferromagnetic nature, will give uh, some kind of boost for uh, this uh, particular application of spectroscopy. And we also did uh, FR, uh, FMR measurements uh, 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 on this system, but uh, we, uh, within the, that uh, particular, within the on this uh, frequency range, we could not get any signal for the annual sample. But only for S depositor we could uh, get, and the kind of damping and other constant we uh, could uh, get from this, and we found that uh, uh, on any link there is a reduction in magnetic moment. Also, there is a super uh, paramagnetic behavior which is uh, uh, not giving proper uh, uh, FMR signal within this frequency range. And uh, so, so uh, what we found from this study is alloy is a paramagnetic. Which will have uh, uh, very compatible with the semiconductor technology, I uh, would may uh, have the application in this particular. And this, uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, sir. Thank you, Dr. Uh, for this nice talk on uh, timely uh, thing that currently the whole, a lot of interest is going on this anti ferromagnetic uh, spectrum. Thanks for this uh, nice talk. If uh, people have any questions, sir, could you kindly keep your slides on? Actually, we Professor, have. Uh, yeah, yeah this, this slides are there only. I I think you can see these slides, isn't it? Because I no, I see myself. Yeah, yeah. Now, now it's yeah. yeah. Okay. Professor, yeah, thank you, Surendra, for, for very this uh, for very nice talk. Um, regarding this obstacular scattering which you showed, so what the analysis yeah. actually revealed, you have small domains or big domains? Yeah, actually what is happening, as, as I said uh, from the specular, uh, whatever uh, information we have got, we use those information to feed the office specular reflectivity data. But in addition, what we get is the kind of uh, in-plane in -plane magnetic domains and other so 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 uh, in this case we could uh, get the magnetic domain a different layer also so like like in gd cobalt uh, uh, gd uh, we have chopped uh, that gd layer into different uh, sub layers and within the middle layers we what we found is the domain size was around uh, a fraction of micro which which where the magnetization was perpendicular to the applied field and in other other uh, the uh, domain size were uh, kind of i mean because what uh, what i'm saying the domain size is, is just i'm correlating the correlation length because what office specular reflective gives the in plane correlation length at that time trans i mean this is yeah. one way of, of saying uh, the domain structure but it is not directly the domain structure what i'm saying the correlation length is of that which i am uh, saying this is the domain structure along the tracks yeah and uh, towards end, you mentioned about this dead layer possibility, um, yeah. but the PNR is capable of actually evaluating the dead layer. So if you have not yeah. observed, then what makes you believe that there could be a dead layer? Actually, yes. So, so we have done uh, many other studies on this uh, uh, um, uh, paramagnet semiconductor materials. There we actually observe that the magnetic dead layer, but in, not in this system we have observed. Because uh, in those cases, like we have also observed uh, metallic and uh, non-metallic uh, base system also. There also we observe the alloy formation, but mm -hmm. they were non-magnetic. But here we, we found this uh, iron germanium system. In fact, in iron silicon also, we found uh, the, uh, the alloy formation at the interface, which were non-magnetic. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Any other audience have any questions? Yes, Anjana. Within, uh, sir, I'm reading. With annealing, generally uh, move to bigger particle or grains. So, what is the mechanism behind the SPM in your second system? Huh. Yes, so this uh, kind of, if you see, uh, uh, super paramagnetic uh, nature uh, is coming because. We don't have a complete uh, alloying uh, happening in the system, but we have a still, still uh, uh, there is a uh, phases of germanium and iron on that. 
so a part of that we are getting uh, uh, so, uh, this kind of uh, uh, alloy layer which is giving the uh, that behavior but but we have uh, not uh, fully uh, uh, those kind of particles but we have a stresses of those particles which is which we believe the alloy phase is contributing to the super uh, super paramagnetic behavior in the system so fully we are not getting a single layer of uh, that but but there are uh, interfaces where we are getting maximum super paramagnetic uh, phases uh, of uh, this alloy phase any other questions i have a small question so uh, you mentioned yeah. that uh, this, uh, the compensation temperature no but i mean we can also play with the mm -hmm. composition so in your case i think it is multi layer is there any way that we can bring in uh, compensation by varying the thickness of this uh, multi layer system uh, yes so uh, this is a, a, a nice question actually compensation can be varied by uh, if you make a alloy also so in that case you can vary the compositions and then you can change the uh, this compensation temperature but in this case when you have a multi layer structure you can play with the thicknesses and then you can vary the compensation temperature all the way from 125k actually we have seen uh, when we uh, actually annul this system so we found there is a compensation temperature going from 125k to 150k and that is uh, uh, in the same system when we did the annuls uh, multi layer but yes thickness wise also you can vary the compensation Yeah, if no more questions, uh, I would like. Yeah, Shubankar, Professor Shubankar, you have anything? Yeah, just a quick uh, remark on Anjana's question. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, do you have uh, Surendra any cross-sectional PM which will show what kind of grain size you have? Actually, in this system, we uh, didn't perform any. Um, I mean, not uh, TM as well as not uh, cross section uh, as uh, SEM also. We don't have uh, those kind of study. But okay. yes, we could. We could uh, see that. Yeah, I mean, uh, even if you have uh, the particles and with annealing, they will become bigger. But if the size is yeah. or the diameter is still below the so-called threshold radius or diameter of the Super paramagnetic limit, then uh, the particles will show super paramagnetic. There has been many papers where people have done annealing, but still the system shows super paramagnetic. But probably you need a little bit more structural analysis to you know confirm that hypothesis uh, in your case. Uh, so yeah. just a remark. So we were doing CXRD also, so uh, like uh, depth okay. profiling uh, structure, but uh, we we couldn't get any signature of that. Uh, from that study also but uh, yeah we didn't uh, do any this uh, cross sectional transmission tm and other measures okay we can discuss about that later all right i'm done yeah. so we can proceed for the um, felicitation thank you sir dr surender could you kindly stop sharing so... i guess my system is a bit slow no it's so yeah, it is my pleasure to present this blog to uh, Dr. Surendra Singh from BRC. So Indo-Japan Workshop on Interface uh, Phenomena for Spintronics, IJW IPS 2022, jointly organized by NICER Bhuneshwar and IMR uh, Tohoku University, Japan. It takes immense pleasure in presenting this blog to Dr. Surendra Singh in appreciation for being a valuable speaker to give a lecture on investigation of emerging phenomena at the inter interface of structures using polarized neutron reflectivity. So I would like to thank you for your uh, wonderful presentation. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank so with this, uh, so we the uh, uh, conclusion of uh, for wonderful talks. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, I would like to thank all the. Yeah, people. thank you, Chandra. Please stay there. Okay, Chandra, thank you. <laughs> so I would like to thank you for this. Uh, Abhishek, could you do uh, privilege to be a session today? So I yes, please take over. It is our pleasure. Abhishek, could you please uh, share the screen? For the memento for Chandra, we have also a small token of appreciation for you for your kind efforts to chair the session. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, Abhishek is there or is not made? <laughs> so, uh, no, 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 no. Chandra? Okay. so we are sharing this. Thank you. Okay.
So you did a wonderful job. So uh, I think we are just at the end of the uh, first day. Yes. And uh, tomorrow morning we will start at 10 a.m. Um, yeah, so a lot of interesting talks and most importantly, the poster session is there. Okay, so let me read it for you, Chandra. Thank you very much for chairing the session. So the IJW IPS 2022 organized by NICER and IMR take immense pleasure in presenting this plaque to Professor Chandra Sekhar Murapaka from IIT Hyderabad in appreciation for chairing the session too. So thank you so much, Chandra. Thank you so much for your thank help. You, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yes. So you did a wonderful job. Uh, almost finishing in time, little bit delay. That's okay. So tomorrow we will start Indian Standard Time 10 a.m. like today. And we will have two sessions, a uh, few talks in the morning. And then uh, just after lunch, we will have two talks. And then we'll have a poster session. And I would request all the speakers who have uh, given talks today if possible to also join the poster session at least. Uh, other talks are also, you are welcome to join. But the poster session you should join so that uh, we can meet in the virtual discussion room and we can discuss. Uh, SPS, you have raised uh, uh, hand. Abhishek, you want to say something? Okay. Um, Takeshi, you want to say something? No, everything's fine. Okay, so then thank you so much all. It was really wonderful today. And I wish you a nice evening or afternoon ahead and see you tomorrow morning. Thank you so much. We stay and we stop now for today. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye-bye.